Go on, man, have another throw. Just because you can't eat the damn stuff, you shouldn't let that keep you from joining in the fun. A harpoon, thrown from the far side of the table, sailed over the pit towards Five Tide's trencher. The affronter intercepted it deftly and threw it back, laughing uproariously. The harpoon's owner ducked just in time, and a passing drinks waiter got it in the sack with a yelp and a hiss of escaping gas. Gaynar Hofoan looked at the lumps of flesh lying on Five Tide's trencher. Why can't I just harpoon stuff off your plate? he asked. Five Tide jerked upright. Your neighbour's plate? he bellowed. That's cheating, Gaynor Hoffern. What a particularly insulting invitation to a duel. Bugger me. What sort of manners do they teach you in that culture? I do beg your pardon, Gaynor Hoffern said. Given, Five Tide said, nodding his eye stalks, rewinding his harpoon cable, lifting a piece of meat from his own plate to his beak, reaching for a drink, and drumming one tentacle on the table with everybody else, as one of the scratch hounds got another on its back and bit its neck out. Good play! Good play! Seven! That's my dog! Mine! I bet on that! I did! Me! You see? Gastries! I told you! <laughs> Gaynar Hafoen shook his head slightly, grinning to himself. In all his life, he had never been anywhere as unequivocally alien as here. Inside a giant torus of cold, compressed gas orbiting a black hole, itself in orbit around a brown dwarf body light years from the nearest star, its exterior studded with ships, most of them the jaggedly bulbous shapes of a front craft, and full, in the main, of happy, space-faring affronters and their collection of associated victim species. Still, he had never felt so thoroughly at home. Gaynar Hafoen, it's me, Scopel Afranqui, said another voice in Gaynar Hafoen's head. It was the module, speaking through the suit. I've an urgent message. Can't it wait? Gaynor Hafoen thought. I'm kind of busy here with matters of excruciatingly correct dining etiquette. No, it can't. Can you get back here, please, immediately? What? No, I'm not leaving. Good grief, are you mad? I only just got here. No, you didn't. You left me eighty minutes ago, and you're already on the main course of that animal circus dressed up as a meal. I can see what's going on relayed through that stupid suit. Typical, the suit interjected. Shut up said the module. Go now, Hoffoen, are you coming back here now or not? Not. Well, then, let me check out the communication priorities here. Okay. Now, the current state of the... Vet, human friend, Five Tide said, slapping a tentacle on the table in front of Gaynor Hoffoen. Eh? A, a bet, Gaynor Hoffoen said, quickly replaying in his head what the affronter had been saying. Fifty socks on the next from the red door, Five Tide roared glancing at his fellow officers on both sides. Gaynor Hafoen slapped the table with his hand. Not enough, he shouted, and felt the suit amplify his translated voice accordingly. Several eye stalks turned in his direction. Two hundred on the blue hound. Five Tide, who was from a family of the sort that would describe itself as comfortably off rather than rich, and whom fifty suckers was half a month's disposable income, flinched microscopically, then slapped another tentacle down on top of the first one. Scumpout alien, he shouted theatrically. You imply that a measly two hundred is a fit bet for an officer of my standing? Two fifty. Five hundred, Gaynor Hafoen yelled, slapping down his other arm. Six hundred, Five Tide hollered, thumping down a third limb. He looked at the others, exchanging knowing looks and sharing in the general laughter. The human had been outlimbed. Gaynor Hafoen, twisted in his seat and brought his left leg up to stamp its booted heel onto the table surface. A thousand damn your cheap hide! Five Tide flicked a fourth tentacle onto the limbs already on the table in front of Gaynor Hafoen, which was starting to look crowded. Done! the affronter roared. And think yourself lucky. I took pity on you to the extent of not upping the bet again and having you unseat yourself into the debris pit, you microscopic cripple! Five Tide laughed louder and looked round the other officers nearby. They laughed, too, some of the juniors dutifully, some of the others, friends and close colleagues of Five Tides, over loudly, with a sort of vicarious desperation. The bet was of a size that could get the average fellow into terrible trouble with his mess, his bank, his parents, or all three. Others again looked on with the sort of expression Gaynor Hoffoen had learned to recognise as a smirk. Five Tide enthusiastically refilled every nearby drinking bulb and started the whole table singing the 
Let's bake the pitmaster over a slow fire if he doesn't get a move on song. Right, Gainer Hoffoen thought. Module, you were saying. That was a rather intemperate bet, if I may say so, Gainer Hoffoen. A thousand? Five Tide can't afford that sort of money if he loses, and we don't want to be seen to be too profligate with our funds if he wins. Gainer Hoffoen permitted himself a small grin. What a perfect way of annoying everybody. Tough, he thought. So, the message? I think I can squirt it through to what passes as a brain in your suit. I heard that, said the suit. Without our friends picking it up, Gainer Hoffoen, the module told him. Ramp up on some quicken and... Excuse me, said the suit. I think Bayer Gainer Hoffoen may want to think twice before glanding a drag as strong as quicken in the present circumstances. He is my responsibility when he's out of your immediate locality after all, Scopola Franqui. I mean, be fair. It's all very well, you sitting up there. Keep out of this, you vacuous membrane, the module told the suit. What? How dare you? Will you two shut up? Gaynor Hoffoen told them, having to stop himself from shouting out loud. Five Tide was saying something about the culture to him, and he'd already missed the first part of it, while the two machines were filling his head with their squabble. Can be as exciting as this, eh, Gaynor Hoffoen? Indeed not, he shouted over the noise of the song. He lowered the gel-filled utensil into one of the food containers and raised the food to his lips. He smiled and made a show of bulging his cheeks out while he ate. Five Tide belched, shoved a piece of meat half the size of a human head into his beak, and turned back to the fun in the animal pit, where the fresh pair of scratch hands were still circling warily, sizing each other up. They looked pretty evenly matched, Gaynor Hoffoen thought. May I speak now? said the module. Yes, Gaynor Hoffoen thought. Now, what is it? As I said, an urgent message. From the GSV Death and Gravity. Oh? Gaynor Hoffoen was mildly impressed. I thought the old scoundrel wasn't talking to me. As did we all. Apparently it is. Look, do you want this message or not? All right, but why do I have to gland quicken? Because it's a long message, of course. In fact, it's an interactive message. An entire semantic context signal set with attached mind-state abstract capable of replying to your questions. And if you listened to the whole thing in real time, you'd still be sitting there with a vacant expression on your face by the time your jovial hosts got to the Hunt the Waiter course. And I did say it was urgent. Gaynor Hoffoen, are you paying attention here? I'm paying fucking attention. But come on, can't you just tell me what the message is? Pray see it. The message is for you, not me, Gaynor Hoffoen. I haven't looked at it. It'll be stream deciphered as I transmit it. OK, OK, I'm glunded up. Shoot. I still say it's a bad idea, muttered the Gelfield suit. Shut up, the module said. Sorry, Gaynor Hoffoen. Here is the text of the message. From GSV Death and Gravity to Sedin Braisa Bayer Fruel Gaynor Hoffoen Dam Ois. Message begins, the module said in its official voice. Then another voice took over. Gainer Hoffoen, I won't pretend I'm happy to be communicating with you again. However, I have been asked to do so by certain of those whose opinions and judgment I respect and admire, and hence deem the situation be such that I would be derelict in my duties if I did not oblige to the utmost of my abilities. Gainer Hoffoen performed the mental equivalent of sighing and putting his chin in his hands, while, thanks to the quicken now coursing through his central nervous system, everything around him seemed to happen in slow motion. The general system's vehicle Death and Gravity had been a long-winded old bore when he'd known it, and it sounded like nothing had happened in the interim to alter its conversational style. Even its voice still sounded the same, pompous and monotonous at the same time. Accordingly, and with due recognition of your habitually contrary, argumentative, and willfully perverse nature, I am communicating with you by sending this message in the form of an interactive signal. I see you are currently one of our ambassadors to that childishly cruel band of upstart ruffians known as the Affront. I have the unhappy feeling that while this may have been envisaged as a kind of subtle punishment for you, you will in fact have adapted with some relish to the environment, if not the task, which I assume you will dispatch with your usual mixture of off-handed carelessness and casual self-interest. If this signal is interactive, interrupted Gaynor Hoffoen, can I ask you to get to the fucking point? 
He watched the two scratch hounds tense together in slow mo on either side of the pit. The point is that your hosts will have to be asked to deprive themselves of your company for a while. What? Why? Gaynor Hafoen thought, immediately suspicious. The decision has been made, and I hasten to establish that I had no part in this, that your services are required elsewhere. Where? For how long? I can't tell you where exactly, or for how long. Make a stab at it. I cannot and will not. Module end this message. Are you sure? asked Scopola Franqui. Wait, said the voice of the GSV. Will it satisfy you if I say that we may need about eighty days of your time? No, it won't. I'm quite happy here. I've been bounced into all sorts of special circumstances shit in the past, on the strength of a, hey, come and do one little job for us, come on, line. This was not in fact perfectly true. Gaynor Hafoen had only ever acted for SC once before, but he'd known, or at least heard of, plenty of people who'd got more than they'd expected when they'd worked for what was in effect the contact section's espionage and dirty tricks department. I did not, plus, I've got a job to do here, Gaynor Hafoen interrupted. I've got another audience with the Grand Council in a month to tell them to be nicer to their neighbours, or we're going to think about slapping their paddles. I want details of this exciting new opportunity, or you can shove it. I did not say that I am speaking on behalf of special circumstances. Are you denying that you are? Not as such, but so stop fucking around. Who the hell else is going to start hauling a gifted and highly effective ambassador of Gaynor Hathorn? We are wasting time here. We? Gaynor Hathorn thought, watching the two scratch hounds launch themselves at each other slowly. Never mind, go on. The task required of you is apparently a delicate one, which is why I personally regard you as being utterly unsuited to it. And as such, it would be foolish to entrust the full details either to myself, to your module, your suit, or indeed to you, until all these details are acquired. There you are. That's exactly what you can shove. All that SC need to know crap. I don't care how fucking delicate the task is. I'm not even going to consider it until I know what's involved. The scratch hounds were in mid-pants now, both of them twisting as they leapt. Shit, thought Gaynor Hafoen. This might be one of those scratch hound bouts where the whole thing was decided on the initial lunge, depending entirely on which beast got its teeth into the neck of the other first. What is required? said the message, with a fair approximation of the way the death and gravity had always sounded when it was exasperated, is eighty days of your time, ninety-nine to ninety-nine point nine plus percent of which you will spend doing nothing more onerous or demanding than being carried from point A to point B. The first part of your journey will be spent travelling, in considerable comfort, I imagine, aboard the affront ship which we will ask, or rather pay, probably, them to put at your disposal. The second part will be spent in guaranteed comfort aboard a culture DCU, and will be followed by a short visit aboard another culture vessel, whereupon the task we would ask of you will actually be accomplished. And when I say a short visit, I mean that it may be possible for you to carry out what is required of you within an hour, and that certainly the assignment should take no longer than a day. Then you will make the return journey to take up wherever you left off with our dear friends and allies the affront. I take it all that doesn't sound too much like hard work, does it? The scratch hounds were meeting in the air, a metre above the centre of the bait pit, their jaws aimed as best they could at each other's throats. It was still a little hard to tell, but Gaynor Hafoen didn't think it was looking too good for Five Tide's animal. Yeah, 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 well, I I've heard all this sort of thing before, D&G. What's in it for me? Why the hell should I? Oh, fuck. What? said the Death and Gravity's message. But Gaynor Hafoen's attention was elsewhere. The two scratch hands met and locked, falling to the floor of the bait pit in a tangle of slowly thrashing limbs. The blue-collared animal had its jaws clamped around the throat of the red-collared one. Most of the affronters were starting to a cheer. Five Tide and his supporters were screaming. Shit! Suit, Gaynor Hafoen thought. What is it? said the gelfield. I thought you were talking to... Never mind that now. See that blue scratch hound? Can't take my or your eyes off the damn thing. Effectorize the fucker. Get it off the other one. I can't do that. That would be cheating. Five Tides' arse is hanging way out the merry-go-round on this suit. 
Do it now or take personal responsibility for a major diplomatic incident. Up to you. What? But effectorize it now, suit. Come on. I know that last upgrade let you sneak it under their monitors. Oh, look at that. Ow. Can't you just feel those prosthetics around your neck? Five Tide must be kissing his diplomatic career goodbye right now, probably already working out a way to challenge me to a duel. After that, it doesn't really matter if I kill him or he kills me. Probably come to war between... All right, all right. There. There was a buzzing sensation on top of Gaynor Hafoen's right shoulder. The red scratchhound jerked. The blue one doubled up around its midriff and loosened its grip. The red-collared beast wriggled out from underneath the other and, twisting, turned on the other beast and immediately reversed the situation, fastening its prosthetic jaws around the throat of the blue-collared animal. At Gaynor Hafoen's side, still in slow motion, Five Tide was starting to rise into the air. Right, D&G, what were you saying? What was the delay? What were you doing? Uh, never mind. Like you said, time's a-wasting. Get on with it. I assume it is reward you seek. What do you want? Golly, let me think. Can I have my own ship? I understand that to be negotiable. I'll bet. You may have whatever you want. There. Will that do? Oh, of course. Gain on her phone, please. I beg you, say you will do this thing. <laughs> D&G, you're begging me, Gaynor Hoffoen asked with a laugh in his thought, as the blue-collared scratchhound writhed hopelessly in the other beast's jaws, and Five Tide started to turn to him. Yes, I am. Now, will you agree, time is of the essence? From the corner of one eye, Gaynor Hoffoen watched one of Five Tide's limbs begin to flip towards him, he readied his slow-reacting body for the blow. I'll think about it. But quit that signal suit. Tell the module not to wait up. Now, suit, command instruction. Take yourself offline until I call on you. Gaynar Hafoen halted the effects of the quicken. He smiled and sighed a happy sigh as Five Tide's celebratory blow landed with a teeth-rattling thud on his back, and the culture lost a thousand suckers. Could be a fun evening. Chapter 4 The horror came for the Commandant again that night, in the grey area that was the half-light from a full moon. It was worse this time. In the dream, he rose from his camp bed in the pale light of dawn. Down the valley, the chimneys above the charnel wagons belched dark smoke. Nothing else in the camp was moving. He walked between the silent tents and under the guard towers to the funicular, which took him up through the forests to the glaciers. The light was blinding, white, and the cold, thin air rasped the back of his throat. The wind buffeted him, raising veils of snow and ice that shifted across the fractured surface of the great river of ice, contained between the jagged banks of the rock-black and snow-white mountains. The Commandant looked around. They were quarrying the deep western face now. It was the first time he had seen this latest sight. The face itself lay inside a great bowl they had blasted in the glacier. Men, machines and drag lines moved like insects in the bottom of the vast cup of shining ice. The face was pure white, except for a speckling of black dots, which from this distance appeared just like boulders. It looked dangerously steep, he thought, but cutting it at a shallower angle would have taken longer, and they were forever being hurried along by headquarters. At the top of the inclined ramp where the drag lines released their hooked cargoes, a train waited, smoke drifting blackly across the blindingly white landscape. Guards stamped their feet. Engineers stood in animated discussion by the winch engine, and a caravan shack disgorged another shift of stackers fresh from a break. A sledge full of face workers was being lowered down the huge gash in the ice. He could make out the sullen, pinched faces of the men bundled in uniforms and clothes that were little better than rags. There was a rumble and a vibration beneath his feet. He looked round to the ice face again to see the entire eastern half of it crumbling away, collapsing and falling with majestic slowness in billowing clouds of whiteness onto the tiny black dots of the workers and guards below. He watched the little figures turn and run from the rushing avalanche of ice as it pressed down through the air and along the surface towards them. A few made it. Most did not, disappearing under the huge white wave rubbed out amongst that chalky, glittering turmoil. 
The noise was a roar so deep he felt it in his chest. He ran along the lip of the face cut to the top of the inclined plane. Everybody was shouting and running around. The entire bottom of the bowl was filling with the white mist of the kicked-up snow and pulverized ice, obscuring the still-running survivors, just as the ice fall itself had those it had buried. The winch engine labored, making a high, screeching noise. The drag lines had stopped. He ran on to the knot of people gathering near the inclined plane. I know what happens here, he thought. I know what happens to me. I remember the pain. I see the girl. I know this bit. I know what happens. I must stop running. Why don't I stop running? Why can't I stop? Why can't I wake up? As he got to the others, the strain on the trapped drag line, still being pulled by the winch engine, proved too much. The steel hawser parted somewhere down inside the bowl of mist with a noise like a shot. The steel cable came hissing and sizzing up through the air, snaking and wriggling as it ripped up the slope towards the lip, loosing most of its grisly cargo from its hooks as it came, like drops of ice off a whip. He screamed to the men at the top of the inclined plane and tripped, falling onto his face in the snow. Only one of the engineers dropped in time. Most of the rest were cut neatly in half by the scything hawser, falling slowly to the snow in bloody sprays. Loops of the hawser smacked off the railway engine with a thunderous clanging noise and wrapped themselves around the winch housing, as though with relief. Other coils thumped heavily to the snow. Something hit his upper leg with the force of a fully swung sledgehammer, breaking his bones in a cataclysm of pain. The impact rolled him over and over in the snow while the bones ground and dug and pierced. It went on for what felt like half a day. He came to rest in the snow, screaming. He was face to face with the thing that had hit him. It was one of the bodies the dragline had flicked off as it tore up the slope, another corpse they had hacked and loosened and pulled like a rotten tooth from the new face of the glacier that morning. A dead witness that it was their duty to discover and remove with all dispatch and secrecy to the charnel wagons in the valley below, to be turned from an accusatory body to innocent smoke and ash. What had hit him and shattered his leg was one of the bodies which had been dumped in the glacier half a generation ago, when the enemies of the race had been expunged from the newly conquered territories. The scream forced its way out of his lungs like something desperate to be born to the freezing air, like something aching to join the screams he could hear spread around him near the lip of the inclined plain. The commandant's breath was gone. He stared into the rock-hard face of the body that had hit him, and he sobbed for breath to scream again. It was a child's face. A girl's. The snow burnt his face. His breath would not come back. His leg was a burning brand of pain, lighting up his whole body. But not his eyes. The view began to dim. Why is this happening to me? Why won't it stop? Why can't I stop it? Why can't I wake up? What makes me relive these terrible memories? Then the pain and the cold went away, seemed to be taken away, and another kind of coldness came upon him, and he found himself thinking, thinking about all that had happened, reviewing, judging. In the desert we burned them immediately, none of this sloppiness. Was it some attempt at poetry to bury them in the glacier? Interred where they were so far up the ice sheet their bodies would stay in the ice for centuries, buried too deep for anyone to find without the killing effort we had to put into it? Did our leaders begin to believe their own propaganda, that their rule would last a hundred lifetimes, and so started to think that far ahead? Could they see the melt lakes below the glacier's ragged, dirty skirt all those centuries from now, covered with the floating bodies released from the ice's grip. Did it start to worry them what people would think of them then? Having conquered all the present with such ruthlessness, did they embark on a campaign to defeat the future too? Make it love them as we all pretend to? In the desert we burned them immediately. They came out in the long trains, through the burning heat and the choking dust, and the ones that hadn't died in the black trucks, we offered the copious water. No will could resist the thirst those baking days spent amongst death had built up in them. 
they drank the poisoned water and died within hours. We incinerated the plundered bodies in solar furnaces, our offering to the insatiable sky gods of race and purity. And there seemed to be something pure about the way they were disposed of, as though their deaths gave them a nobility they could never have achieved in their mean, degraded lives. Their ashes fell like a light of dust on the powderous emptiness of the desert, to be blown away together in the first storm. The last furnace loads were the camp workers, gassed in their dormitories mostly, and all the paperwork, every letter, every order. Every requisition pad, stores sheet, file, note, and memo. We were all searched, even I. Those the special police found hiding diaries were shot on the spot. Most of our effects went up in smoke, too. What we were allowed to keep had been searched so thoroughly we joked they had managed to remove each grain of sand from our uniforms, something the laundry had never been able to do. We were split up and moved to different posts throughout the conquered territories. Reunions were not encouraged. I thought of writing down what had happened, not to confess, but to explain. And we suffered, too. Not just in the physical conditions, though those were bad enough, but in our minds, in our consciences. There may have been a few brutes, a few monsters, who gloried in it all. Perhaps we kept a few murderers off the street of our cities for all that time. But most of us went through intermittent agonies, wondering in moments of crisis if what we were doing was really right, even though in our hearts we knew it was. So many of us had nightmares. The things we saw each day, the scenes we witnessed, the pain and terror, these things could not help but affect us. Those we disposed of, their torment lasted a few days, maybe a month or two. Then it was over as quickly and efficiently as we could make the process. Our suffering has gone on for a generation. I am proud of what I did. I wish it had not fallen to me to do what had to be done. But I am glad that I did it to the best of my capabilities, and I would do it again. That was why I wanted to write down what had happened, to witness our belief and our dedication and our suffering. I never did. I am proud of that, too. He awoke, and there was something inside his head. He was back in reality, back in the present, back in the bedroom of his house in the retirement complex near the sea. He could see the sunlight hitting the tiles of the balcony outside the room. His twinned hearts thumped. The scales had risen on his back, prickling him. His leg ached, echoing with the pain of that ancient injury on the glacier. The dream had been the most vivid yet, and the longest, finally taking him to the icefall in the western face and the accident with the dragline, deep buried, that had been in his memory, submerged beneath all the dread white weight of his remembered pain. As well as that, whatever he had experienced had gone beyond the normal course, the usual environment of dreams, propelled there by the reliving of the accident and the image of fighting for breath while he stared transfixed into the face of the dead girl. He had found himself thinking, explaining, even justifying what he had done in his army career in the most definitive part of his life. And now he could feel something inside his head. Whatever it was inside his head got him to close his eyes. At last, it said. It was a deep, deliberately authoritative voice, its pronunciation almost too perfect. At last, he thought. What was this? I have the truth. What truth? Who was this? Of what you did. Your people. What? The evidence was everywhere. Across the desert. Caked in loam. 
lodged in plants, sunk to the bottom of lakes, and there in the cultural record too. The sudden vanishings of artworks, changes in architecture and agriculture. There were a few hidden records, books, photographs, sound recordings, indices which contradicted the rewritten histories. But they still didn't directly explain why so many people, so many peoples, seemed to vanish so suddenly without any sign of assimilation. What are you talking about? What was this in his head? You would not believe what I am, Commandant. But what I am talking about is a thing called genocide, and the proof thereof. We did what had to be done. Thank you. We've just been through all that. Your self-justifications have been noted. I believed in what I did. I know. You had the residual decency to question it occasionally. But in the end, you did indeed believe in what you were doing. That is not an excuse, but it is a point. Who are you? What gives you the right to crawl inside my brains? My name would be something like Grey Area in your language. What gives me the right to crawl inside your brains, as you put it, is the same thing that gave you the right to do what you did to those you murdered. Power. Superior power. Vastly superior power in my case. However, I have been called away, and I have to leave you now. But I shall return in a few months, and I'll be continuing my investigations then. There are still enough of you left to construct a more triangulated case. What? he thought, trying to open his eyes. Commandant, there is nothing worse I can wish upon you than to be what you already are. But you might care to reflect upon this while I'm gone. Instantly, he was back in the dream. He fell through the bed. The single ice-white sheet tore beneath him and tumbled him into a bottomless tank of blood. He fell down through it to light and the desert, and the rail line through the sands. He fell into one of the trains, into one of the trucks, and was there with his broken leg amongst the stinking dead and the moaning living, jammed in between the excrement-covered bodies with the weeping sores and the buzz of the flies and the white-hot rage of the thirst inside him. He died in the cattle truck after an infinity of agony. There was time for the briefest of glimpses of his room in the retirement complex. Even in his still shocked, pain-maddened state, he had the time and the presence of mind to think that, while it felt as though a day at least must have passed while he'd been submerged in the torture dream, nevertheless, everything in the bedroom looked just as it had earlier. Then he was dragged under again. He awoke, entombed inside the glacier, dying of cold. He had been shot in the head, but it had only paralyzed him. Another endless agony. He had a second impression of the retirement home. Still, the sunlight was at the same angle. He had not imagined it was possible to feel so much pain, not in such a time, not in a lifetime, not in a hundred lifetimes. He found there was just time to flex his body and move a finger's width across the bed before the dream resumed. Then he was in the hold of a ship, crammed in with thousands of other people in the darkness, surrounded again by stink and filth and screams and pain. He was already half dead two days later when the sea valves opened and those still left alive began to drown. The cleaner found the old retired commandant twisted into a ball a little way short of the apartment's door the next morning. His heart had given out. The expression on his face was such that the retirement home warden almost fainted and had to sit down quickly. But the doctor declared the end had probably been quick. Chapter 5 Tight Beam, M16.4, TRA, at N4.28.858.8893 From GCU Grey Area to GSV Honest Mistake There, I am on my way. From GSV Honest Mistake to GCU Grey Area. Not before time. There was work to be done. More animal brains to be delved into. History to be unearthed. Truth to be discovered. I would have thought that one of the last places one would have expected to find on any itinerary concerning the search for truth would be inside the minds of mere animals. 
When the mere animals concerned have orchestrated one of the most successful and total expungings of both a significant part of their own species and every physical record regarding that act of genocide, one has remarkably little choice. I am sure no one would deny your application does you credit. Gosh, thanks. That must be why the other ships call me Meatfucker. Absolutely. Well, let me wish you all the best with whatever it is our friends might require of you. Thank you. My aim is to please. End signal file. Chapter 6 He left a trail of weaponry and the liquefied remains of gambling chips. The two heavy micro-rifles clattered to the absorber mat just outside the airlock door, and the cloak fell just beyond them. The guns glinted in the soft light reflecting off gleaming wooden panels. The mercury gambling chips in his jacket pocket, exposed to the human ambient heat of the module's interior, promptly melted. He felt the change happen, and stopped, mystified, to stare into his pockets. He shrugged, then turned his pockets inside out, and let the mercury splash onto the mat. He yawned and walked on. Funny the module hadn't greeted him. The pistols bounced on the carpeted floor of the hall and lay beading with frost. He left the short jacket hanging on a piece of sculpture in the hall. He yawned again. It was not far off the time of habitat dawn. Very much time for bed. He rolled down the tops of the knee boots and kicked them both down the corridor leading to the swimming pool. He was pulling down his trousers as he entered the module's main social area, shuffling forward bent over and holding onto the wall as he cursed the garments and tried to kick them off without falling over. There was somebody there. He stopped and stared. It looked very much like his favourite uncle was sitting in one of the lounge's best seats. Gaina Hafoen stood upright and swayed, staring through numerous blinks. Uncle Tishlin? he said, squinting at the apparition. He leant on an antique cabinet and finally hauled his trousers off. The figure, tall, white-maned, and with a light smile playing on its craggily severe face, stood up and adjusted its long formal jacket. Just a pretend version, Bayer, the voice rumbled. The hologram put its head back and fixed him with a measuring, questioning look. They really do want you to do this thing for them, boy. Gaynar Hafoen scratched his head and muttered something to the suit. It began to peel off around him. Will you tell me what the hell it actually is, Uncle? he asked, stepping out of the gel field and taking a deep breath of module air, more to annoy the suit than because the air tasted better. The suit gathered itself up into a head-sized ball and floated wordlessly away to clean itself. The hologram of his uncle breathed out slowly and crossed its arms in a way Gaynor Hafoen remembered from his early childhood. Put simply, Bayer, the image said, they want you to steal the soul of a dead woman. Gaynor Hafoen stood there, quite naked, still swaying, still blinking. Oh, he said after a while. Part 2. Not Invented Here Chapter 1 Hup. And here we are waking up. Quick scan around, nothing immediately threatening it would seem. Hmm. Floating in space. Odd. Nobody else around? That's funny. Views a bit degraded. Uh-oh, that's a bad sign. Don't feel quite right, either. Stuff missing here. Clock running way slow like it's down amongst the electronics crap. Run full system check. Oh, good grief! The drone drifted through the darkness of interstellar space. It really was alone. Profoundly, even frighteningly alone. It picked through the debris that had been its power, sensory and weapon systems, appalled at the wasteland it was discovering within itself. The drone felt weird. It knew who it was. It was Cicela Yethalus, one of two, a type D4 military drone of the explorer ship Peace Makes Plenty, a vessel of the Stargazer clan, part of the fifth fleet of the Zetetica Lench. But its real-time memories only began from the instant it had woken up here. A zillion clicks from anywhere, slap, bang, in the middle of nothing, with the shit kicked out of it. What a mess! Who had done this? 
What had happened to it? Where were its memories? Where was its mind state? Actually, it suspected it knew. It was functioning on the middle level of its five-stepped mind modes, the electronic. Below lay an atomechanical complex, and beneath that a biochemical brain. In theory, the routes to both lay open. In practice, both were compromised. The atomechanical mind wasn't responding correctly to the system state signals it was receiving, and the biochemical brain was simply a mush. Either the drone had been doing some hard manoeuvring recently, or it had been clobbered by something. It felt like dumping the whole biochemical unit into space now, but it knew the cellular soup its final backup mind substrate had turned into might come in handy for something. Above where it ought to be right now, there were a couple of enormously wide conduits leading to the photonic nucleus, and beyond that, the true AI core. Both completely blocked off and metaphorically plastered with warning signals. The equivalent of a single lit telltale adjacent to the photonic pipe indicated there was activity of some sort in there. The AI core was either dead, empty, or just not saying. The drone ran another systems control check. It seemed to be in charge of the whole outfit, what was left of it. It wondered if the sensor and weaponry systems degradation was real. Perhaps it was an illusion. Perhaps those units were in fact in perfect working order and under the control of one or both of the higher mind components. It dug deeper into the unit's programming. No, it didn't look possible. Unless the whole situation was a simulation, that was possible. A test. What would you do if you suddenly found yourself drifting alone in interstellar space, almost every system severely damaged, reduced to a level 3 mind state with no sign of help anywhere and no recollection how you got here or what happened to you? It sounded like a particularly nasty simulation problem, a nearly worst-case scenario dreamt up by a drone training and selection board. Well, there was no way of telling, and it had to act as though it was all real. It kept looking around inside its own mind state. Aha! There were a couple of closed subcores, intact within its electronic mind, sealed and labelled as potentially, though not probably, dangerous. There was a similar warning attached to the self-repair control routine matrices. The drone let those be for the moment. It would check out everything else that it could before it started opening packages with what might prove to be nasty surprises inside. Where the hell was it? It scanned the stars. A matrix of figures flashed into its consciousness. Definitely the middle of nowhere. The general volume was called the upper leaf swirl by most people, 45 kilolites from galactic centre. The nearest star, 14 standard light months away, was called Esperi, an old red giant which had long since swallowed up its complement of inner planets and whose insubstantial orb of gases now glowed dully upon a couple of distant, icy worlds and a remote cloud of comet nuclei. No life anywhere, just another boring, barren system like a hundred million others. The general volume was one of the less well-visited and relatively uninhabited regions of the galaxy. Nearest major civilization point, the Sagreath system, forty light-years away, with the Stage Three Lizardoid civilization first contacted by the culture a decade ago. Nothing special there. Voluminal influences, interests, rated Krehisil 15%, Affront 10%, Culture 5%, the normal claimed minimum, the culture's influence, interest equivalent of background radiation, and a smattering of investigations and flybys by 20 other civilizations, making up a nominal 2%. Otherwise, not a place anybody was really interested in, a two-thirds forgotten, disregarded region of space, never before directly investigated by the Alench, though there had been the usual deep space remote scans from afar, showing nothing special. No clues there. Date. N4.28.803, by the chronology the Alench still shared with the culture. The drone's service log abstract recorded that it had been built as part of a matched pair by the Peace Makes Plenty in N4.13, shortly after the ship's own construction had been completed. Most recent entry, 28.725.500, ship leaving Tier Habitat for a standard sweep search of the outer reaches of the upper leaf swirl. The detailed service log was missing. The last flagged event the drone could find in its library dated from 
a daily current affairs archive update. So had that been just yesterday? Or could something have happened to its clock? It scrutinized its damage reports and searched its memories. The damage profile equated to that caused by plasma fire, and, from the lack of obvious patterning, either an enormous plasma event very far away, or plasma fire, possibly fusion-sourced, much closer, but buffered in some way. A nearby plasma implosion was the most obvious example, not something it could do itself. The ship could, though. Its X-ray laser had been fired recently, and its field shields projectors had soaked up some leak-through damage, consistent with what would have happened if something just like itself had attacked it. Hmm. One of a matched pair. It thought. It searched. It could find no further mention of its twin. It looked about itself, gauging its drift and searching. It was drifting at about 280 clicks a second, almost directly away from the Asperi system. In front of it, it focused all its damaged sensory capacity to peer ahead. Nothing. It didn't appear to be aimed at anything. 280 clicks a second. That was somewhere just underneath the theoretical limit beyond which something of its mass would start to produce a relativistic trace on the surface of space-time, if one had perfect instrumentation. Now, was that a coincidence or not? If not, it might have been slung out of the ship for some reason. Displaced, perhaps. It concentrated its senses backwards. No obvious point of origin, and nothing coming after it either. A hint of something, though. The drone refocused, cursing its hopelessly degraded senses. Behind it, it found gas, plasma, carbon. It widened the cone of its focus. What it had discovered was an inflating shell of debris drifting after it at a tenth of its speed. It ran a rewind of the debris shell's expansion. It originated at a point forty clicks behind the position where it had first woken up, 1853 milliseconds ago, which implied it had been drifting totally unconscious for nearly half a second. Scary. It scanned the distant shell of expanding particles. They'd been hot. Messy. That was wreckage. Battle wreckage, even. The carbon and the ions could originally have been part of itself, or part of the ship, or even part of a human. A few molecules of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, no oxygen. But all of it doing just ten percent of its own velocity. Oh, that. As though it had somehow been prioritized out of a sudden appearance of matter. Again, as though it had been displaced, perhaps. The drone flicked part of its attention back inside to the sealed cores in its mind substrate with their warning notices. Can't put this off any longer, I suppose, it thought. It interrogated the two cores. Past, the first was labelled. The other one was simply called Two of Two. Uh-huh, it thought. It opened the first core and found its memories. Chapter 2 Gaynar Hofoen floated within the shower, buffeted from all sides by the streams of water. The fans sucking the water back out of the AG shower chamber sounded awfully loud this morning. Part of his brain told him he was running short of oxygen. He'd either have to leave the shower or grope for the air hose, which was probably in the last place he'd feel for it. It was either that or open his eyes. It all seemed too much bother. He was quite comfortable where he was. He waited to see what would give first. It was his brain's indifference to the fact he was suffocating. Suddenly, he was wide awake and flailing around like some drowning basic human. Desperate for breath, but afraid to breathe in the constellation of water globules he was floating within. His eyes were wide open. He saw the air hose and grabbed it. He breathed in. Shit, it was bright. His eyes dimmed the view. That was better. He felt he'd showered enough. He mumbled, Off, off, into the air hose mask a few times, but the water kept on coming. Then he remembered that the module wasn't talking to him right now, because he'd told the suit to accept no more communications last night. Obviously, such irresponsibility had to be punished by the module being childish. He sighed. Luckily, the shower had an off button. The water jets cut off. 
Gravity was fed gently back into the chamber, and he floated slowly down with the settling blobs of water. A reverser field clicked on, and he looked at himself in it while the last of the water drained away. Sucking in his belly and sticking out his chin while he turned his face to the best angle and smoothed down a few upstart locks of his blonde curls. Well, I may feel like shit, but I still look great, he announced to nobody in particular. For once, probably even the module wasn't listening. Sorry to force the pace, the representation of his Uncle Tishlin said. It's all right, he said through a mouthful of fail steak. He washed it down with some warmed-over infusion the module had always assured him was beneficial when you hadn't had enough sleep. It tasted disgusting enough to be either genuinely good for you or just one of the module's little jokes. Sleep okay? His uncle's image asked. He was, apparently, sitting across the table from Gaynor Hafoen in the module's dining room, a pleasantly airy space filled with porcelain and flowers, and boasting a seemingly real-time view on three sides of a sunlit mountain valley, which in reality was half a galaxy away. A small serving drone hovered near the wall behind the man. Good to ours, Gaynor Hafoen said. He supposed he could have stayed awake the night before when he'd first discovered his uncle's hologram waiting for him. He could have glanded something to keep him bright and awake and receptive and got all this over with then. But he'd known he'd end up paying for it eventually. And besides, he wanted to show them that just because they'd gone to the trouble of persuading his favourite uncle to record a semantic signal mind abstract state, or whatever the hell the module had called it, he still wasn't going to jump just because they said so. The only concession he'd made to all the urgency was deliberately not to dream. He had a whole suite of pretty splendid dream-accessible scenarios going at the moment, several of them incorporating some powerfully good and satisfying sex, and it was a positive sacrifice to miss out on any of them. So, he'd gone to bed and had a pretty good, of maybe still not quite long enough sleep, and Uncle Tishlin's message had just had to sit twiddling its abstract semantics in the module's AI core, waiting till he got up. So far, all they'd done was exchange a few pleasantries and talk a little about old times, Partly, of course, so that Gaynor Fowen could satisfy himself that this apparition had genuinely been sent by his uncle, and S.C. had paid him the enormous compliment of sending not one, but two personality states to him, in order to argue him round to doing whatever it was they wanted from him. That the hologram might be a brilliantly researched forgery created by S.C. would be even more of a compliment. But that way lay paranoia. I take it you had a good evening, Tishlin Simulation said. Enormous fun. Tishlin looked puzzled. Gaynor Hafoen watched the expression form on his uncle's face and wondered how comprehensive was the duplication of his uncle's personality now encoded, living, if you wanted to look at it that way, in the module's AI core. Did whatever was in there, sent here in Cyphered with the specific task of persuading him to cooperate with special circumstances, actually feel, or did it just appear to? Shit, I must be feeling bad, Gaynor Hafoen thought. I haven't bothered about that sort of shit since university. How can you have enormous fun with aliens? The hologram asked, eyebrows gathering. Attitude, Gaynor Hafoen said cryptically, slicing off more steak. But you can't drink with them, eat with them, can't really touch them or want the same things, Tishlin said, still frowning. Gaynor Hafoen shrugged. It's a kind of translation, he said. You get used to it. He munched away for a moment while his uncle's program, or whatever it was, digested this. He pointed his knife at the image. That's something I'd want in the unlikely event I agreed to do whatever it is they want me to do. What? Tishlin said, leaning back, arms crossed. I want to become an affronter. Tishlin's eyebrows elevated. You want what, boy? He said. Well, some of the time, Gaynor Hafoen said, half turning his head to the drone behind him. The machine came quickly forward and refilled his glass with the infusion. I mean, all I want is an affront of body, one that I can just sort of zap into and, well, just be an affronter. You know, socialise. I don't see what the problem is, really. In fact, I keep telling them it'll be a great thing for culture affront relations. I'd really be able to relate to these guys. I could really be one of them. Hell, isn't that what this ambassador shit is supposed to be all about? He belched. I'm sure it could be done. The module says it could, but it shouldn't, as it's asked elsewhere, and I know all the standard objections, but I think it'd be a great idea. I'm damn sure I'd enjoy it. I mean, I could always sort of zap back into my own body any time. This is really shocking you, isn't it, Uncle? 
The image shook its head. You always were the oddest child, Bayer. I suppose I should have known what to expect from you. Anybody who'd go out there to live with the affront in the first place has to be slightly strange. Gaynar Hafoan held his arms out wide. But I'm just doing what you did, he protested. I only wanted to meet weird aliens, Bayer. I didn't want to become one of them. Heck, and I thought you'd be proud of me. Proud, but worried. Bayer, are you seriously suggesting that becoming an affronter would be part of your price for doing what SC asks? Certainly, Gaynor Hafoen said, and squinted up at the hammer bean ceiling. I vaguely recall asking for a ship as well last night, and the death and gravity saying yes. He shook his head and laughed. Must have imagined it. He finished the last of the steak. They've told me what they're prepared to offer, Bayer, Tishlin said. You didn't imagine it. Gaynar Hafoen looked up. Really? he asked. Really? Tishlin said. Gaynar Hafoen nodded slowly. And how did they persuade you to act as go-between, uncle? he asked. They only had to ask, Bayer. I may not be in contact any more, but I'm happy to help out when I can, when they have a problem. This isn't contact, uncle. This is special circumstances, Bayer said quietly. They tend to play by slightly different rules. Tishlin looked serious. The image sounded defensive. I know that boy. I asked round some of my contacts before I agreed to do this. Everything checks out. Everything seems to be reliable. I suggest you do the same, obviously. But from what I can see, what I've been told is the truth. Gaynar Hafoen was silent for a moment. Okay. So what have they told you, uncle? He asked, draining the last of the infusion. He frowned, wiped his lips, and inspected the napkin. He looked at the sediment in the bottom of the glass, then glared at the servant drone. It wobbled in the drone equivalent of a shrug and took the glass from his hand. Tishlin's representation sat forward, putting its arms on the table. Let me tell you a story, Maya. By all means, Gaynor Hafoen said, picking something from his lips and wiping it on the napkin. The serving drone started to remove the last of the breakfast things. Long ago and far away, two and a half thousand years ago, Tishlin said, in a wispy tendril of suns outside the galactic plane nearest to a city or cluster, but not really near to that or anywhere else, the problem child, an early general contact unit, troubadour class, chanced upon the ember of a very old star. The GCU started to investigate, and it found not one, but two unusual things. Gaynar Hafoen drew his gown about him and settled back in his seat, a small smile on his lips. Uncle Tish had always liked telling stories. Some of Gaynar Hafoen's earliest memories were of the long, sunlit kitchen of the house at Ois, back on Sadun Orbital. His mother, the other adults of the house, and his various cousins would all be milling around, chattering and laughing, while he sat on his uncle's knee being told tales. Some of them were ordinary children's stories, which he'd heard before, often, but which always sounded better when Uncle Tish told them and some of them his uncle's own stories, from when he'd been in contact, travelling the galaxy in a succession of ships, exploring strange new worlds and meeting all sorts of odd folk, and finding any number of weird and wonderful things amongst the stars. Firstly, the hologram image said, the dead sun gave every sign of being absurdly ancient. The techniques used to date it indicated it was getting on for a trillion years old. <laughs> what? Gaynor Hafoen snorted. Uncle Tishlin spread his hands. The ship couldn't believe it either. To come up with this unlikely figure it used... The apparition glanced away to one side, the way Tishlin always had when he was thinking, and Gaynar Hafoen found himself smiling. Isotopic analysis and flux-pitting essay. Technical terms, Gaynar Hafoen said, nodding. He and the hologram both smiled. Technical terms, the image of Tishlin agreed. But... No matter what it was they used or how they did their sums, it always came out that the dead star was at least fifty times older than the universe. I never heard that one before, Gaynor Hafoen said, shaking his head and looking thoughtful. Me neither, Tishlin agreed, though as it turns out it was released publicly just not until long after it had all happened. One reason there was no big fuss at the time was that the ship was so embarrassed about what it was coming up with it never filed a full report. 
just kept the results to itself in its own mind. Did they have proper minds back then? Tishlin's image shrugged. A mind with a small M. AI core, we'd probably call it these days. But it was certainly sentient, and the point is that the information remained in the ship's head, as it were. Where, of course, it would remain the ship's. Practically the only form of private property the culture recognized was thought and memory. Any publicly filed report or analysis was theoretically available to anybody. But your own thoughts, your own recollections, whether you are a human, a drone, or a ship mind, were regarded as private. It was considered the ultimate in bad manners even to think about trying to read somebody else's, or something else's, mind. Personally, Gaynor Hafoen had always thought it was a reasonable enough rule, although, along with a lot of people over the years, he'd long suspected that one of the main reasons for its existence was that it suited the purposes of the culture's minds in general, and those in special circumstances in particular. Thanks to that taboo, everybody in the culture could keep secrets to themselves and hatch little schemes and plots to their heart's content. The trouble was that while in humans this sort of behaviour tended to manifest itself in practical jokes, petty jealousies, silly misunderstandings and instances of tragically unrequited love, with minds it occasionally meant they forgot to tell everybody else about finding entire stellar civilizations, or took it upon themselves to try to alter the course of a developed culture everybody already did know about with the almost unspeakable implication that one day they might do just that, not with a culture, but with THE culture, always assuming they hadn't done so already, of course. What about the people on board the culture ship? Gaynor Hafone asked. They knew as well, of course, but they kept quiet, too. Apart from anything else, they had two weirdnesses on their hands. They assumed they had to be linked in some way, but they couldn't work out how, so they decided to wait and see before they told everybody else. Tishlin shrugged. Understandable, I suppose. It was all so outlandish. I suppose anybody would think twice about shouting it to the rooftops. You couldn't get away with such reticence these days. But this was then. The guidelines were looser. What was the other unusual thing they found? An artifact, Tishlin said, sitting back in the seat. A perfect black body sphere, fifty clicks across, in orbit around the unfeasibly ancient star. The ship was completely unable to penetrate the artifact with its sensors, or with anything else, for that matter, and the thing itself showed no signs of life. Shortly thereafter, the problem child had developed an engine fault, something almost unheard of even back then, and had to leave the star and the artifact. Naturally, it left a load of satellites and sensor platforms behind it to monitor the artifact, all it had arrived with, in fact, plus a load more it had made while it was there. However... When a follow-up expedition arrived three years later, remember, this all happened on the galactic outskirts and speeds were much lower then, it found nothing. No star, no artifact, and none of the sensors and remote packages the problem child had left behind. The outgoing signals apparently coming from the sentry units stopped just before the follow-up expedition arrived within monitoring range. Ripples in the gravity field nearby implied the star, and presumably everything else, had vanished utterly the moment the problem child had been safely out of sensor range. Just vanished. Just vanished. Disappeared without trace, Tishlin confirmed. Most damnable thing, too. Nobody's ever just lost a son before, even if it was a dead one. In the meantime, the General Systems vehicle, which the problem child had rendezvoused with for repairs, had reported that the GCU had effectively been attacked. Its engine problem wasn't the result of chance or some manufacturing flaw. It was the result of offensive action. Apart from that, and the still unexplained disappearance of an entire star, everything was normal for nearly two decades. Tishlin's hand flapped once on the table. Oh, there were various investigations and boards of inquiry and committees and so on. But the best they could come up with was that the whole thing had been some sort of high-tech projection, maybe produced by some previously unknown elder civilization with a quirky sense of humor. Or, even less likely, that the sun and all the rest had popped into hyperspace and just sped off, though they should have been able to observe that and hadn't. But basically, the whole thing remained a mystery. And, after everybody had chewed it over and over till there was nothing but spit left, it just kind of died a natural death. Then, over the following seven decades, the problem child decided it didn't want to be part of contact anymore. It left contact, 
Then it left the culture proper and joined the Alteria, again very unusual for its class. And meanwhile, every single human who'd been on board at the time exercised what are apparently termed unusual life choices. Tishlin's dubious look indicated he wasn't totally convinced this phrase contributed enormously to the information-carrying capacity of the language. The image made a throat-clearing noise and went on. Roughly half of the humans opted for immortality, the other half auto-euthanized. The few remaining humans underwent subtle but exhaustive investigation, though nothing unusual was ever discovered. Then there were the ship's drones. They all joined the same group mind, again in the Alteria, and have been incommunicado ever since. Apparently, that was even more unusual. Within a century, almost all of those humans who'd opted for immortality were also dead due to further, semi-contradictory, unusual life choices. Then the Alteria and special circumstances, who'd taken an interest by this time, not surprisingly, lost touch with the problem child entirely. It just seemed to disappear, too. The apparition shrugged. That was fifteen hundred years ago, Byer. To this day, nobody has seen or heard of the ship. Subsequent investigations of the remains of a few of the humans concerned using improved technology has thrown up possible discrepancies in the nanostructure of the subject's brains, but no further investigation has been deemed possible. The story was made public eventually, nearly a century and a half after it all happened. There was even a bit of a media fuss about it at the time, but by then it was a portrait with nobody in it. The ship, the drones, the people, they'd all gone. There was nobody to talk to. Nobody to interview, nothing to do profiles of. Everybody was off stage, and, of course, the principal celebrities, the star and the artifact, were the most off stage of all. Well, Gaynor Hoffoen said, all very... Hold on, Tishlin said, holding up one finger. There is one loose end. A single traceable survivor from the problem child, who turned up five centuries ago. Somebody it might be possible to talk to despite the fact they spent the last twenty-four millennia trying to avoid talking. Human? Human, Tishlin confirmed, nodding. The woman who was the vessel's formal captain. They still had that sort of thing back then, Gaynor Hafoen said. He smiled. How quaint, he thought. It was pretty nominal even back then, Tishlin conceded. More captain of the crew than of the boat. Anyway, she's still around in a sort of abbreviated form. Tishlin's image paused, watching Gaynor Hafoen closely. She's in storage, aboard the General Systems Vehicle Sleeper Service. The representation paused to let Gaynor Hafoen react to the name of the ship. He didn't, not on the outside anyway. Just her personality is in there, unfortunately, Tishlin continued. Her stored body was destroyed in an Idiran attack on the orbital concerned half a millennium ago. I suppose, for our purposes, that counts as a lucky break. She'd managed to cover her tracks so well, probably with the help of some sympathetic mind, that if the attack hadn't occurred, she'd have remained incognito to this day. It was only when the records were scrutinized carefully after her body's destruction that it was realized who she really was. But the point is that special circumstances think she might know something about the artifact. In fact, they're sure she does, although it's almost equally certain that she doesn't know what she knows. Gaynor Hafoen was silent for a while, playing with the cord of his dressing gown. The sleeper service. He hadn't heard that name for a while. Hadn't had to think about that old machine for a long time. He'd dreamt about it a few times, had had a nightmare or two about it even, but he tried to forget about those, tried to shove those echoes of memories to some distant corner of his mind, and been pretty successful at it, too, because it felt very strange to be turning over that name in his mind now. So why has this all suddenly become important after two and a half millennia? He asked the hologram. Because something with similar characteristics to that artifact has turned up near a star called Esperi in the upper leaf swirl, and S.C. needs all the help it can get to deal with it. There's no trillion-year-old sun cinder this time, but an apparently identical artifact is just sitting there. And what am I supposed to do? 
go aboard the sleeper service and talk to this woman's mimage? That's the mind-stored construct of her personality, apparently. The image looked puzzled. New one on me. Anyway, you're supposed to try to persuade her to be reborn, talk her into a rebirth so she can be quizzed. The sleeper service won't just release her, and it certainly won't cooperate with SC. But if she asks to be reborn, it'll let her. But why? Gaynor Hoffoen started to ask. There's more, Tishlin said, holding up one hand. Even if she won't play, even if she refuses to come back, you're to be equipped with a method of retrieving her through the link you'll forge when you talk to the Mimage without the GSV knowing. Don't ask me how that's supposed to be accomplished, but I think it's got something to do with the ship they're going to give you to get you to the sleeper service, after the affronter ship they're going to hire for you has rendezvoused with it at Tyr. Gaynor Hofoen did his best to look sceptical. Is that possible? he asked. Retrieving her like that, I mean, against the wishes of the sleeper? Apparently, Tishlin said, shrugging. S.C. thinks they've got a way of doing it. But you see what I mean when I said they want you to steal the soul of a dead woman. Gaynor Hafoen thought for a moment. Do you know what ship this might be? The one to get me to the sleeper? They haven't, began the image, then paused and looked amused. They just told me. It's a GCU called the Grey Area. The image smiled. Ah, I see you've heard of it too. Yeah, I've heard of it, the man said. The grey area. The ship that did what the other ships both deplored and despised actually looked into the minds of other people using its electromagnetic effectors. In a sense, the very, very distant descendants of electronic countermeasures equipment from your average stage three civilization and the most sophisticated, powerful, but also precisely controllable weaponry the average culture ship possessed to burrow into the grisly cellular substrate of an animal consciousness and try to make sense of what it found there for its own, usually vengeful, purposes. A pariah craft, the one the other minds called Meat Fucker, because of its revolting hobby, though not as it were to its face. A ship that still wanted to be part of the culture proper, and nominally still was, but which was shunned by almost all its peers, a virtual outcast amongst the great inclusionary meta-fleet that was contact. Gaynor Hafoen had heard about the grey area all right. It was starting to make sense now. If there was one vessel that might be capable of plundering, and, more importantly, that might be willing to plunder a stored soul from under the nose of the sleeper, the grey area was probably it. Assuming what he'd heard about the ship was true, it had spent the last decade perfecting its techniques of teasing dreams and memories out of a variety of animal species— while the sleeper service had, by all accounts, been technologically stagnant for the last forty years, its time taken up with the indulgence of its own scarcely less eccentric pastime. The image of Uncle Tishlin bore a distant expression for a moment, then said, Apparently that's part of the beauty of it. Just because the sleeper service is another oddball doesn't mean that it's any more likely than any other GSV to have the grey area aboard. The GCU will have to lie off and that'll make this memage stealing trick easier. If the grey area was actually inside the GSV at the time, it probably couldn't carry it off undetected. Gaynor Hafoen was looking thoughtful again. This artifact thing, he said, could almost be a, what do you call it, couldn't it? An outside context paradox? Problem, Tishlin said. Outside context problem. Hmm, yes, one of those. Almost. An outside context problem was the sort of thing most civilizations encounter just once, and which they tended to encounter rather in the same way a sentence encountered a full stop. The usual example given to illustrate an outside context problem was imagining you were a tribe on a largish, fertile island. You'd tamed the land, invented the wheel or writing or whatever, the neighbors were cooperative or enslaved, but at any rate peaceful, and you were busy raising temples to yourself with all the excess productive capacity you had. You were in a position of near absolute power and control, which your hallowed ancestors could hardly have dreamed of, and the whole situation was just running along nicely, like a canoe on wet grass, 
when suddenly this bristling lump of iron appears, sailless and trailing steam in the bay, and these guys carrying long, funny-looking sticks come ashore and announce you've just been discovered. You're all subjects of the emperor now. He's keen on presents called tax, and these bright-eyed holy men would like a word with your priests. That was an outside context problem. So was the suitably uptecked version that happened to whole planetary civilizations when somebody like the affront chanced upon them first, rather than say the culture. The culture had had lots of minor OCPs, problems that could have proved to be terminal if they'd been handled badly, but so far it had survived them all. The culture's ultimate OCP was popularly supposed to be likely to take the shape of a galaxy-consuming hegemonizing swarm, an angered elder civilization, or a sudden, indeed instant visit by neighbors from Andromeda once the expedition finally got there. In a sense. The culture lived with genuine OCPs all around it all the time, in the shape of those sublimed elder civilizations. But so far, it didn't appear to have been significantly checked or controlled by any of them. However, waiting for the first real OCP was the intellectual depressant of choice for those people and minds in the culture determined to find the threat of catastrophe even in Utopia. Almost, maybe, agreed the apparition. Perhaps it's a little less likely to be so with your help. Gaynor Hafoen nodded, staring at the surface of the table. So, who's in charge of this? He asked, grinning. There's usually a mind which acts as incident controller, or whatever they call it, in something like this. The incident controller is a GSV called the Not Invented Here. Tish told him, "It wants you to know you can ask whatever you want of it." Uh huh. Gaynor Hafoen couldn't recall having heard of the ship. And why me particularly? He asked. He suspected he already had the answer to that one. The sleeper service has been behaving even more oddly than usual, Tishlin said, looking suitably pained. It's altered its course schedule. It's no longer accepting people for storage, and it's almost completely stopped communicating. But it says it will allow you on board. For a brow beating, no doubt, Gaynor Hafoen said, glancing to one side and watching a cloud pass over the meadows of the valley shown on the dining room's projector walls. Probably wants to give me a lecture," he sighed, still looking round the room. He fastened his gaze on Tishlin's simulation again. "She still there?" he asked. The image nodded slowly. "Shit," Gaynor Hafoen said. Chapter Three. But it makes my brain hot. Nevertheless, Major, this is of inestimable importance. I only looked at the first bit there; it's already given me a thumping case ache. Still, it has to be done. Kindly read it all carefully, and then I'll explain its significance. Not my stalks! This is a terrible thing to ask of a chap after a regimental dinner. Five Tide wondered if humans suffered so for their self-indulgence. He doubted it. No matter what they claimed. With the possibly honourable, possibly demented exception of Gaynor Hafoen, they seemed a bit too stuffy and sensible, willingly to submit to such self-punishment in the cause of fun. Besides, they were so insecure in their physical inheritance, they had meddled with themselves in all sorts of ways. Probably they thought hangovers were just annoying rather than character-forming, and so had short-sightedly dispensed with them. I realise it's early, and it is the morning after the night before, Major. But please. The emissary, which Five Tide had met once before, and which possessed the irritating trait of looking somewhat like a better-built version of Five Tide's dear departed father, had just appeared in the nest house without notice or warning. If he hadn't known the way these things worked, Five Tide would right now be thinking of ways to torture the head of nest security. Tentacles had rolled, beaks had been separated for less. Lucky he'd been able to whip the bed covers round his deputy wife and both vice courtesans before the blighter had announced his its presence by just floating into the nest. Five Tide clapped his forebeak together a couple of times. Tastes like I've had my beak up my ass, he thought. Can't you just tell me what the damn signal means now? He asked. You won't know what I'm referring to. Come now. The sooner you read it, the sooner I'll be able to tell you what it means, and the sooner I'll be able to demonstrate how it is just possible that this information will, at the very least, enable you to remove the harness of culture interference forever.
Hmm, I'm sure. And what'll it do at most? The emissary of the ship let its eye stalks dip to either side, the affronter equivalent of a smile. At most, the information in this signal will lead you to being able to dominate the culture as completely as it, if it chose to, could dominate you. The creature paused. This signal could conceivably presage the start of a process which will deliver the entire galaxy into your hands and subsequently open up territories for expansion and exploitation beyond that which you cannot even begin to guess at. And I do not exaggerate. Have I your attention now, Major? Five Tide snorted sceptically. I suppose you have, he said, shaking his limbs and rubbing his eyes. He returned his gaze to the note screen and read the signal. From GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient, and strictly as SC cleared. Accession notice at C18519938.52314 point constitutes formal all ships warning level zero. In temporary sequestration, textual note added by GSV Wisdom Like Silence at N4.28.855.0150.6503.0001 Accession Confirmed precedent breach Type K7 True class, non-estimal Its status, active, aware, contactophile Uninvasive SF, Lokestatra, Esperi, Star First com at it's following shear by contact via my primary scanner at N4.28.855.0065.593132. At N4.28.855.0065.594872. In M1A16 and Galin, 2 by tight beam, type 4A. PTA and handshake burst as appended. Times at 0.7Y. Suspect signal gleaned from ZE Lalser Conbeam Spread, Second Era. X contact call signed I. No other signals registered. My subsequent actions. Maintained course and speed, skimmed a clutched primary scanner to mimic 50% closer approach. Began directed full passive HS scan. Sync start of signal sequence as above. Sent buffed Gallon 2 pro forma message reception confirmation signal to contact location. Dedicated track scanner at 90% power and 300% beam spread to contact at minus 5% primary scanner roll-off point. Instigated, squared exponential slow to stop line maneuver synchronized to scan local stop point at 12% of track scanner range limit. Ran full systems check as detailed, executed slow four swing around, then retraced course to previous closest approach point and stop at standard square X curve. Holding there. Accessions physical characteristics. Exclamation, AM, exclamation. Sphere rad, 53.34 kilometers. Mass, non-estimal by space-time fabric influence. Locality, ambiently planar. Estimated by pan-polarity material density norms at 1.45 times 81 to the power of 13 T. Black body surface, stipple, granular, fractal within 0 0.0012 to 1344 mm range. Open to field-filtered vacuum. Anomalous field presence inferred from 8 to the power 21 kilohertz leakage. Affirm K7 category by HS topology and EG links, inf and alt. EG link details non-estimal. Diaglyph files attached. Associated anomalous materials presence. Several highly dispersed detritus clouds, all within 28 minutes. Three consistent with staged destruction of one meter cubed near Equivtech entity. Another, ditto approximately 3 to the power of 8, partially exhausted M doors. One Cal rounds, another consisting of general high soft level, O2 atmosphered, ship internal combat debris. Latter drifting directly away from accession's current position. Retracts of debris clouds expansion profiles indicates mutual age of 52.5 days. Combat debris cloud implicitly originating at a point 948 milliseconds from accession's current position. Diaglyph files attached. No other presence is apparent to within 30 years. My status. H&H &H untouched. L8 secure post-system scour, 100%. ATDPSs engaged. CRTTDPSs engaged. Repeat. Accession. EG, INF and ALT. Linked confirmed. E-grid link details non-estimal. True class, non-estimal. Awaiting. 
at N4.28.855.0073.64529.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.0073.
made the task easier. The GSV had studied the real-time recordings, contact craft and their emissaries had taken over the years of battles fought by humanoid societies with similar technology to get a feel for the way such events really looked and felt without the possibly prejudiced and partial eyes and memories of the participants or spectators getting in the way. And it had, eventually, got the smoke right. It had taken a while, and eventually it had had to resort to a rather higher tech solution than it would have preferred, but it had done it. The smoke was real. Each particle held and isolated in the grip of a localised anti-gravity field produced by projectors hidden underneath the landscape. The ship was quietly proud of the smoke. Even the fact that the scene still wasn't perfect. Many of the soldiers looked female and or foreign, or indeed alien when you looked closely at them. And even the males of the appropriate and not too meddled with genetic stock were too big and too generally healthy to be right for the time, didn't really disturb the ship. The people hadn't been the most difficult thing to get right, but they were the most important component of the scene. They were the reason it was all here. It had all started eighty years ago, on a very small scale. Every culture habitat, whether it was an orbital or other large structure, a ship, a rock or a planet, possessed storage facilities. Storage was where some people went when they'd reached a certain age, or if they'd just grown tired of living. It was one of the choices that culture humans faced towards the end of their artificially extended three and a half to four centuries of life. They could opt for rejuvenation and or complete immortality. They could become part of a group mind. They could simply die when the time came. They could transfer out of the culture altogether, bravely accepting one of the open but essentially inscrutable invitations left by certain elder civilizations. Or they could go into storage, with whatever revival criterion they desired. Some people slept for, say, a hundred years at a time, then lived a single day before returning to their undreaming, unaging slumbers. Some wanted simply to be woken after a set time had passed, to see what had changed while they'd been gone. Some desired to come back when something especially interesting was happening, content to leave that judgment to others. And some only wanted to be brought back if and when the culture finally became one of the elders itself. That was a decision the culture had been putting off for many millennia. In theory, it could have sublimed anything up to 8,000 years ago. But while individuals and small groups of people and minds did sublime all the time, and other parts of the society had hived off and spit away to make their own decisions on the matter, the bulk of the culture had chosen not to, determining instead to surf a line across the ever-breaking wave of galactic life continuation. Partly, it was a kind of curiosity that no doubt seemed childish to any sublimed species, a feeling that there was still more to discover in base reality, even if its laws and rules were all perfectly known. And besides, what of other galaxies? What of other universes? Did the elders have access to these, but none of them had ever seen fit to communicate the truth to the unsublimed? Or did all such considerations simply cease to matter post-sublimation? Partly, it was an expression of the culture's extrovertly concerned morality. The sublimed elders, become as gods to all intents and purposes, seemed to be derelict in the duties which the more naive and less developed societies they left behind ascribed to such entities. With certain very limited exceptions, the elder species subsequently took almost nothing to do with the rest of life in the galaxy whose physical trappings they invariably left behind. Tyrants went unchecked, hegemonies went unchallenged, Genocides went unstopped, and whole nascent civilizations were snuffed out just because their planet suffered a comet strike or happened to be too near a supernova, even though these events occurred under the metaphorical noses of the sublimed ones. The implication was that the very ideas, the actual concepts of good, of fairness and of justice, just ceased to matter once one had gone for sublimation, no matter how creditable, progressive and unselfish one's behaviour had been as a species pre-sublimation. In a curiously puritanical way for a society seemingly so hell-bent on the ruthless pursuit of pleasure, the culture thought this was itself wrong, and so decided to attempt to accomplish what the gods, it seemed, could not be bothered with, discovering, judging and encouraging or discouraging the behaviour of those to whom its own powers were scarcely less than those of a deity. Its own elderhood would come eventually, it had no doubt, but it would be damned if it would let that happen until it had grown tired of doing what it hoped was good. 
For those who wished to await that judgment day, without having to live through every other day in between, storage was the answer, as it was for others for all those other reasons. The rate of technological change in the culture, at least at the level which directly affected the humans within it, was fairly modest. For millennia, the accepted and normal method of storing a human was to place each in a coffin-like box, a little over two metres long, just under one across, and half a metre deep. Such units were easy to make and suitably reliable. However, even such unglamorous staples of culture existence couldn't escape improvement and refinement forever. Eventually, along with the development of the gel field suit, it became possible to put people into the stasis of long-term storage within a covering that was even more reliable than the old coffin boxes, and yet scarcely thicker than a second skin or a layer of clothing. The sleeper service, which was not called that then, had simply been the first ship fully to take advantage of this development. When it stored people, it usually did so in small tableau, after the manner of famous paintings at first, or humorous poses. The storage suits allowed their occupants to be posed in any way that would have been natural for a human, and it was a simple matter to add a pigmentation layer to the surface which did such a good job of impersonating skin that a human would have to look very closely indeed to spot the difference. Of course, the ship had always asked the permission of the storees in question before it used their sleeping forms in this way, and respected the wishes of the few people who preferred not to be stored in a situation where they might be gazed upon as though they were figures in a painting or sculptures. Back then, the GSV had been called the Quietly Confident, and it had been run, as ships of that class normally were, by not one, but three minds. What happened next depended on who you believed. The official version was that when one of the three minds had decided it wanted to quit the culture, the other two minds had argued with it, and then made the unusual decision to leave the structure of the GSV to the single dissenting mind, rather than, as would have been more normal, just giving it a smaller ship. The perhaps more plausible, and certainly more interesting rumour, was that there had been a good old-fashioned winding battle between the minds, two against one, and the two had lost very much against the odds. The two losing minds had been kicked out, taking to commandeered GCUs like officers given lifeboats after a mutiny. And that was why, this version went, the whole of the quietly confident, which promptly renamed itself the sleeper service, had been turned over to the single dissident mind. It hadn't been some gentle people's agreement. It had been a revolution. Whatever version you chose to believe... It was no secret that the culture proper had chosen to dedicate another, smaller GSV to the task of following the sleeper service wherever it went, presumably to keep an eye on it. Following its renaming and paying no apparent heed to the craft now tailing it, the sleeper service's next step was to evacuate everybody else remaining aboard. Most of the ships had already gone, and the rest were asked to leave. Then the drones, aliens, and all the human personnel and their pets were deposited on the first orbital it came to. The only people left aboard were those in storage. After that, the ship went in search of others, and one other in particular, and let it be known throughout the culture, through its information network, that was willing to travel anywhere to pick up those who might wish to join it, so long as they were in storage and happy to be set amongst one of its tableau. People were reluctant at first. This was definitely the sort of behaviour that earned a ship the title eccentric, and eccentric ships had been known to do odd, even dangerous things. Still, the culture had its share of brave souls, and a few took up the craft's strange invitation without apparent ill effect. When the first few people who had been stored aboard the GSV were safely returned on the realisation of their revival criteria, Again, without seeming to have suffered from the strangeness of their temporary lodgings, the slow trickle of adventurous individuals began to turn into a steady stream of slightly perverse or just romantic ones, as the reputation of the sleeper service spread and it released holograms of its more and more ambitious tableau, important historical incidents, then small battles and details from greater conflicts. So more and more people thought it rather amusing to be stored within this eccentric eccentric where they might be said to be forming part of a work of art, even while they slept, rather than just plonked in a boring box somewhere underneath their local plate. And so taking a ride aboard the sleeper service as a kind of vicariously wandering soul became nothing less than fashionable, and the ship slowly filled with undead people in storage suits, whom it posed into larger and larger scenes, until eventually 
it was able to tackle whole battlefields and lay them out in the sixteen square kilometres of territory it possessed in each of its general bays. Amorphia completed its sweeping gaze across the bright, silent stillness of the vast killing ground. As an avatar, it possessed no real thoughts of its own, but the mind that was the sleeper service liked to run the creature off a small subroutine that was only a little more intelligent than the average human being, while both retaining the option of stepping in full force if it needed to, and making the avatar behave in a confused, distracted state that the ship believed somehow reflected, on the nearly infinitely smaller human scale, its own philosophical perplexities. So it was that the semi-human subroutine looked out across that great tableau, and felt a kind of sadness that it might all have to be dismantled. There was an extra, perhaps deeper melancholy, at the thought that it would no longer be able to play host to the living things aboard, the creatures of the sea and the air and the gas-giant atmosphere, and the woman. Its thoughts turned to that woman, Dajil Gillian, who in one sense had been the cause, the seed for all of this, and the one person it had wanted to find, the one soul, asleep or awake, it had been determined to offer sanctuary to when it had first renounced the culture's normality. Now that sanctuary was compromised, and she too would have to be offloaded with all the rest of its waifs and strays and teeming undead, a promise being fulfilled leading to a promise to her being broken, as though she had not experienced enough of that in her life. Still, it would make amends, and for that reason there were a lot of other promises being made, and, so far it would seem, kept. That would have to do. Movement on the motionless tableau. Amorphia turned its attention there and saw the black bird Gravius flapping away across the field. More movement. Amorphia walked towards it. Around and over the poised, charging cavalry and the fallen soldiers, between a pair of convincing-looking hanging fountains of earth, where two cannonballs were slamming into the ground, and over a small, blood-swollen stream to another part of the battlefield, where a team of three revival drones were floating above a revive. This was unusual. People normally wanted to be woken back in their home and in the presence of friends. But over the last couple of decades, as the tableau had become more impressive, more people had wished to be brought back to life here, in the midst of them. Amorphia squatted down by the woman, who had been lying posed as a dying soldier, her tunic punctured by bullet holes and stained red. She lay on her back, blinking in the sunlight, attended by machines. The head of the storage suit had been slipped off, and lay like a rubbery mask on the grass beside her. Her face looked pale and just a little blotchy. She was an old woman, but her depilated head gave her a curious, baby-like quality of nakedness. Hello, Amorphia said, taking one of the woman's hands in hers and gently detaching that part of the suit too, pulling the hand covering off inside out like a tight glove. Whoa, the woman said, swallowing, her eyes watering. Sikler Najasa Kropize in Stahal Damapin, stored thirty-one years ago at the age of three hundred and eighty-six. Revival criterion on the acclamation of the next line messiah elect on the planet Ishes. She had been a scholar of the planet's major religion, and had wanted to be present at the elevation of its next saviour, an event which had not been anticipated for another two hundred years or so. Her mouth twisted and she coughed. How? she began, then coughed again. Just thirty-one standard years, Amorphia told her. The woman's eyes widened, then she smiled. That was quick, she said. She recovered rapidly for one of her age. In a few minutes, she was able to be helped to her feet, and, taking Amorphia's arm and trailed by the three drones, they walked across the battlefield towards the nearest edge of the tableau. They stood on the small hill, Hill 4, that Amorphia had stood on a little earlier. Amorphia was distantly, naggingly aware of the gap the woman's revival had left in the scene. Normally, she would have been replaced within the day with another story, posed in the same position, but there were none left. The gap she had left would remain unless the ship plundered another tableau to repair the hole in this one. The woman gazed around her for some time, then shook her head. 
Amorphia guessed what she was thinking. It is a terrible sight, said, but it was the last great land battle on Eglafir Prime. To have one's final significant battle at such an early technological stage is actually a great achievement for a humanoid species. The woman turned to Amorphia. I know, she said. I was just thinking how impressive all this was. You must be proud. Chapter 2 The explorer ship, Peace Makes Plenty, a vessel of the Stargazer clan, part of the fifth fleet of the Zetetica Lench, had been investigating a little explored part of the upper leaf swirl on a standard random search pattern. It had left Tier Habitat on N4.28.725.500, along with the seven other Stargazer vessels. They had scattered like seeds into the depths of the swirl, bidding each other farewell, and knowing they might never see each other again. One month in, and the ship had turned up nothing special, just a few bits of uncharted interstellar debris, duly logged, and that was all. There was a hint, a probably false signal resonation in the skein of space-time behind them, that there might be a craft following them, but then it was not unusual for other civilizations to follow ships of the Zetetic Alench. The Alench had once been part of the culture proper. They had split off fifteen hundred years ago. The few habitats and the many rocks, ships, drones and humans concerned, preferring to take a slightly different line from the mainstream culture. The culture aimed to stay roughly as it was, and change at least a proportion of those lesser civilizations it discovered, while acting as an honest broker between the involved, the more developed societies who made up the current players in the great galactic civilizational game. The Alench wanted to alter themselves, not others. They sought out the undiscovered, not to change it, but to be changed by it. The Alentia ideal was that somebody from a more stable society, the culture itself was the perfect example, could meet the same Alentia, rock, ship, drone or human, on successive occasions, and never encounter the same entity twice. They would have changed between meetings just because, in the interim, they had encountered some other civilization and incorporated some different technology into their bodies or information into their minds. It was a search for the sort of pan-relevant truth that the culture's monosophical approach was unlikely ever to throw up. It was a vocation, a mission, a calling. The results of this attitude were as various as might be imagined. Entire Elentia fleets had either never come back from expeditions and remained lost, or had eventually been found, the vessels and their crews, completely, if willingly, subsumed by another civilization. At its most extreme, in the old days, some craft had been discovered turned entirely into aggressive, hegemonizing swarm objects, selfishly auto-replicating organisms, determined to turn every piece of matter they found into copies of themselves. There were techniques, beyond simple outright destruction, which was always an option, for dealing with this sort of eventuality, which normally resulted in the objects concerned becoming evangelical hegemonizing swarm objects, rather than aggressive hegemonizing swarm objects. But if the objects concerned had been particularly single-minded, it still meant that people had died to contribute to its greedily ungracious self-regard. These days, the Alench very rarely ran into anything like that sort of trouble, but they did still change all the time. In a way, the Alench, even more than the culture, was an attitude rather than an easily definable grouping of ships or people. Because parts of the Alench were constantly being subsumed and assimilated or just disappearing, while at the same time other individuals and small groups were joining it, both from the culture and from other societies, human and otherwise, there was anyway a turnover of personnel and secondary ideas that made it one of the most rapidly evolving in-play civilizations. Somehow, though, despite it all, and perhaps because it was more an attitude, a meme, than anything else, the Alench had developed an ability that it had arguably inherited from its parent civilization, the ability to remain roughly the same in the midst of constant change. It also had a knack of turning up intriguing things, ancient artifacts, new civilizations, the mysterious remnants of sublimed species, unguessably old depositories of antique knowledge, not all of which were of ultimate interest to the Lench itself, but many of which might excite the curiosity, further the purposes, and benefit the informational or monetary funds of others, especially if they could get to them before anybody else. Such opportunities arose but rarely, 
but they had occurred sufficiently often in the past for certain societies of an opportunistic bent to consider it worth the expense or the bother of dedicating a ship to follow an adventure craft for a while at least. And so the peace makes plenty had not been unduly alarmed by the discovery that it might be being tailed. Two months in, and still nothing exciting, just gas clouds, dust clouds, brown dwarfs, and a couple of lifeless star systems, all well enough charted from afar and displaying no sign of ever having been touched by anything intelligent. Even the hint of the following ship had disappeared, if it ever had been real. The vessel concerned had probably decided the peace makes plenty was not going to strike lucky this trip. Nevertheless, everything the Alentia ship came within range of was scanned. Passive sensors filtered the natural spectrum for signs of meaning. Beams and pulses were sent out into the vacuum and across the skein of space-time, searching and probing, while the ship consumed whatever echoes came back, analysing, considering, evaluating. Seventy-eight days after leaving Tyr, approaching a red giant star named Esperi, from a direction which, according to his records, nobody had ever taken before, the Peace Makes Plenty had discovered an artefact, fourteen light months distant from the sun itself. The artefact was a little over fifty kilometres in diameter. It was black body, an ambient anomaly, indistinguishable from a distance from any given volume of almost empty interstellar space. The Peace Makes Plenty only noticed it at all, because it occluded part of a distant galaxy, and the Alentia ship, knowing that bits of galaxies did not just wink off and back on again of their own accord, had turned to investigate. The artifact appeared to be either almost completely massless, or, perhaps, some sort of projection. It seemed to make no impression on the skein, the fabric of space-time, which any accumulation of matter effectively dents with its mass, like a boulder lying on a trampoline. The artifact, projection, gave the impression that it was floating on the skein, making no impression on it whatsoever. This was unusual. This was certainly worth investigating. Even more intriguingly, there was also a possible anomaly in the lower energy grid, which underlay the fabric of real space. There was a region directly underneath the three-dimensional form of the artifact that, intermittently, seemed to lack the otherwise universally chaotic nature of the grid. There was a vaguest of vague hint of order there, almost as if the artifact was casting some sort of bizarre, indeed impossible, shadow. Even more curious. The piece makes plenty, hove too, sitting in front of the artifact, in as much as it could be said to have a front, and trying both to analyse it and communicate with it. Nothing. The black body sphere appeared to be massless and inviolable, almost as though it was a blister on the skein itself, as though the signals the ship was sending towards it could never connect with a thing there, because all they did was slide flickering over that blister, almost as though it wasn't there, and pass on undisturbed into space beyond. As though trying to pick up a stone that appeared to be resting on the surface of a trampoline, one discovered that the trampoline surface itself was bulged up to cover the stone. The ship decided to attempt to contact the artifact in a more direct manner. It would send a drone probe underneath the object in hyperspace, below the surface of space-time, effectively making a tear, a rent in the fabric of the skein, the sort of opening it would normally create to fashion a way into HS through which it could travel. The drone probe would attempt, as it were, to surface inside the artifact. If there was nothing there but a projection, it would find out. If there was something there, it would presumably either be prevented from entering it or accepted within. The ship readied its emissary. The situation was so unusual, the peace makes plenty even considered breaking with a lynch precedent by informing Tier Habitat, or one of its peers, what was going on. The nearest other stargazer craft was a month's travel away, but might be able to help if the peace makes plenty got itself into trouble. In the end, however, it stuck with tradition and kept quiet. There was a kind of stealthy pragmatism in this. An encounter of the sort the ship was embarking upon might only be successful if the Alentia craft could fairly claim to be acting on its own, without having made what might to a suspicious contactee look like a request for reinforcements. Plus, there was simple pride involved. An Alentia ship would not be an Alentia ship if it started acting like part of a committee. Why, it might as well then be a culture ship. The drone probe was dispatched, with the peace makes plenty keeping in close contact. 
The instant the probe passed within the horizon of the artifact, it... The records the drone Cicely Thales, one of two, had access to, ended there. Something, obviously, had happened. The next thing it personally knew, the Peace Makes Plenty had been under attack. The assault had been almost unbelievably swift and ferocious. The drone probe must have been taken over almost instantaneously. The ship's subsystems surrendered milliseconds later, and the integrity of the ship's mind shattered within, at a guess, less than a second after the drone probe had infringed the space beneath the artifact. A few more seconds later, and Cicela Euthalus I of Two itself had been involved in a last desperate attempt to get word of the ship's plight to the outside galaxy, while the vessel's usurped systems did their damnedest to prevent it, by destroying it if necessary. The long agreed, carefully worked out ruse using itself and its twin and the pre-programmed independent displacer unit had worked, though only just, and even so, with considerable damage to the drone that had been Cicela Euthalus 2 of 2 and was now Cicela Euthalus 1 of 2, with a kind of twisted remnant of Cicela Euthalus 2 of 2 lodged within it. The drone had carried out the equivalent of pressing an ear to the wall of the core with its twin's mind in it carefully accessing a meaning-free abstract of the activity inside the closed-off core to find out what was happening in there. It was like listening to a furious argument going on in an adjoining room. A chilling, frightening sound. The sort of bawling match that made you expect the sound of screams and things breaking any moment. Its original self had probably died in the process of escape. Instead of its own body, it now inhabited that of its twin, whose violated, defected mind-state now raged helplessly within the core labelled Two of Two. The drone, still tumbling through interstellar space at 280 kilometres a second, felt a kind of revulsion at the very idea of having a treacherous, perverted version of its twin locked inside its own mind. Its first reaction was to expunge it. It thought about just dumping the core into the vacuum and wasting it with its laser the one weapon which still seemed to be working at close to normal capacity. Or it could just shut off power to the core, letting whatever was in it die for want of energy. And yet, it mustn't. Like the two higher mind components, the ravaged version of its twin's mind state might contain clues to the nature of the artifact's own mind type. It, the AI core, and the photonic nucleus all had to be kept as evidence— retained, perhaps, as samples from which a kind of antidote to the artifact's poisonous infectivity might be drawn. There was even a chance that something of its twin's true personality might be retained in the rapacious mind-state the two upper minds and the core contained. Equally, there was a possibility that the ship's mind had lost control, but not integrity. Perhaps, like a small garrison quitting the undefendable curtain wall of a great fortress to take refuge in an all but invulnerable central keep, the mind had been forced to dissociate itself from all its subsystems and given up command to the invader, but succeeded in retaining its own personality in a mind core as invulnerable to infiltration as the electronic core within the drone's mind, where what was left of its twin now seethed, was proof against escape. Elentia minds had been in such dire situations before and survived. Certainly such a core could be destroyed, they could not have their power turned off, as the drone's core could. Mind cores had their own internal energy sources. But even the most brutal aggressor would far rather lay siege to that keep core in the knowledge that the information contained within must surely fall to it eventually, than just destroy it. There was always hope, the drone told itself. It must not give up hope. According to the specifications it had, the displacer which had catapulted it out of the ill-fated ship had a range, with something the volume of Cicela Euthalus 1 of 2, of nearly a light second. Surely that was far enough to put it beyond range of detection. Certainly, the Peace Makes Plenty's sensors wouldn't have had a hope of spotting something so small so far away. It just had to hope that neither could the artifact. Accession. That was what the culture called such things. It had become a pejorative term, and so the Alench didn't use it normally, except sometimes informally amongst themselves. Accession. Something excessive. Excessively aggressive. Excessively powerful. Excessively expansionist. Whatever. Such things turned up, or were created now and again. Encountering an example was one of the risks you ran when you went to wandering.
So, now it knew what had happened to it and what the core two of two contained, the question was, what was to be done? It had to get word to outside. That was the task it had been entrusted with by the ship. That was what its whole life mission had become, the instant the ship came under such intensive attack. But how? Its tiny warp unit had been destroyed. Its Boncom unit likewise. Its HS laser too. It had nothing that worked at translight speeds. No way of unsticking itself, or even a signal from the glutinous slowness that trapped anything unable to step outside the skein of space-time. The drone felt as if it was some quick, graceful flying insect, knocked down to a stagnant pond and trapped there by surface tension, all grace abandoned in its bedraggled, doomed struggle with a strange, cloyingly foreign medium. It considered again the subcore where its self-repair mechanisms waited, but not its own repair systems, those of its turncoat twin. It was beyond belief that those two had not been subverted by the invader. Worse than useless, a temptation, because there was a vanishingly small chance that in all the excitement they had not been taken over. Temptation. But no, it couldn't risk it. It would be folly. It would have to make its own self-repair units. It was possible, but it would take forever. A month. For a human, a month was not that long. For a drone, even one thinking at the shamefully slow speed of light on the skein, it was like a sequence of life sentences. A month was not a long time to wait. Drones were very good at waiting and had a whole suite of techniques to pass the time pleasantly or just sidestep it. But it was an abominably long time to have to concentrate on anything, to have to work at a single task. Even at the end of that month, it would just be the start. At the very least, there would be a lot of fine-tuning to be done. The self-repair mechanisms would need direction, amendment, tinkering with. Some would doubtless dismantle where they were supposed to build. Others would duplicate what they were meant to scour. It would be like releasing millions of potential cancer cells into an already damaged animal body and trying to keep track of each one. It could quite easily kill itself by mistake, or accidentally breach the containment around the core of its corrupted twin or the original self-repair mechanisms. Even if all went well, the whole process could take years. Despair. It set the initial routines underway all the same. What else could it do? And thought on. It had a few million particles of antimatter stored. It had some maniple field capability left, somewhere between finger and arm strength, but downscalable to the point of being able to work at the micrometer scale and capable of slicing molecular bonds. It would need both capabilities when it came to building the prototype self-repairer constructs. It possessed 240 one-millimeter-long nanomissiles, also AM-tipped. It could still put up a small mirror field about it, and it had its laser, which was not far off maximum potential. Plus, it still had the thimbleful of mush that had been the final resort backup biochemical brain, which might no longer be able to support thought, but could still inspire it. Well, it was one way to use the nasty gooey mess. Cicela Euthalus, one of two, started to fashion a shielded reaction chamber and began working out both how best to bring the antimatter and the cellular gunge together to provide itself with the most reaction mass and maximum thrust, and how to direct the resulting exhaust plume so as to minimize the chances of attracting attention. Accelerating into the stars using a wasted brain. It had its amusing side, it supposed. It set those routines in motion too, and, with the equivalent of a long sigh and the taking off of a jacket and the rolling up of sleeves, returned its attention to the self-repair a building problem. At that instant, a skein wave passed around and through it, a sharp, purposeful ripple in space-time. It stopped thinking for a nanosecond. A few things produced such waves. Several were natural, collapsing stellar cores, for example. But this wave was compressed, tightly folded, not the massive, swell-long surge created when a star contracted into a black hole. This wave was not natural. It had been made. It was a signal. Or it was part of a sense. The drone, Cecilia Euthalus one of two, was helplessly aware of its body, the few kilos of mass it represented, resonating.
producing an echoing signal that would transmit back along the radius of that expanding circular disturbance in the skein to whatever instrument had produced the pulse in the first place. It felt... not despair. It felt sick. It waited. The reaction was not long in coming. A delicate, fanning, probing cluster of maser filaments, rods of energy seeming to converge almost as infinity some distance off to one side from where it had guessed the artifact was, three hundred thousand or so kilometres away. The drone tried to shield itself from the signals, but they overcame it. It started to shut down certain systems which might conceivably be corrupted by an attack through the maser signal itself, though the characteristics of the beam had not looked particularly sophisticated. Then, suddenly, the beam shut off. The drone looked around. Nothing to be seen. But even as it scanned the cold, empty depths of the space around it, it felt the surface of space-time itself tremble again, all around it, ever so slightly. Something was coming. The distant vibration increased slowly. The insect, trapped in the surface tension of the pond, would have gone still now, while the water quivered and whatever was advancing upon it, skating across the water's surface or angling up from underneath approached its helpless prey. Chapter 3 The car zipped along, slung under one of the monorails that ran amongst the superconducting coils beneath the ceiling of the habitat. Gaynor Hofoen looked down through the angled windows of the car at the clouded framescape below. God's whole habitat... It was much too small to be called an orbital, according to the culture's definitive nomenclature, plus it was enclosed, was at nearly a thousand years old, one of the affront's older outposts in a region of space most civilizations had long since agreed to call the Fern Blade. The small world was in the shape of a hollow ring, a tube ten kilometers in diameter and two thousand two hundred long, which had been joined into a circle. The superconducting coils and EM waveguides formed the inner rim of the enormous wheel. The tiny, rapidly spinning black hole which provided the structure's power sat where the wheel's hub would have been. The circular sectioned living space was like a highly pressurized tire bulging from the inner rim, and where its tread would have been hung the gantries and docks where the ships of the affront and a dozen other species came and went. The whole lot was in a slow, distant orbit about an otherwise satellite-less brown dwarf mass, just too small to be a proper star but which had long had the honour of being in exactly the right place to further the continuing expansion and consolidation of the affront sphere of influence. The monorail car rushed towards a huge wall spread entirely across the view ahead. The rails disappeared into a small circular door, which opened like a sphincter as the car approached, then closed again behind it. It was dim in the car for a while as it traversed a short tunnel, then another door ahead of it dilated, and it shot out into a huge, open, mist-filled space where the view just disappeared amongst clouds and haze. The interior of God's whole habitat was sectioned off into about forty individually isolable compartments, most of them crisscrossed by a webwork of frames, girders, and tubular members, partly to provide additional strength for the structure, but partly because these created a multitude of places for the affront to anchor the nest spaces that were the basic cellular building block of their architecture. There were more open compartments every few sections along the habitat, filled with little more than layers of cloud, a few floating nest space bundles, and a selection of flora and fauna. These were the sections which more closely mirrored conditions on the sort of mainly methane atmosphere planets and moons the affront preferred, and it was in these the affront indulged their greatest passion by going hunting. It was one of these immense game reserves that the car was now crossing. Gaynor Hofoen looked downwards again, but he couldn't see a hunt in progress. As much as a fifth of the whole habitat was devoted to hunting space, and even that represented a huge concession to practicality by the affront, they'd probably have preferred the proportions to be about half and half hunting space and everything else, and even then have thought they were being highly responsible and self-sacrificing. Gaynor Hofoen found himself wondering again about the trade-off between skill honing and distraction that took place in the development of any species likely to end up as one of those in play in the great galactic civilization game.
The culture's standard assessment held that the affront spent far too much time hunting and not nearly enough time getting on with the business of being a responsible, spacefaring species. Though, of course, the culture was sophisticated enough to know that this was just its admittedly subjective way of looking at things. And besides, the more time the affront spent dallying in their hunting parks and regaling each other with hunting tales in their carousing halls, the less they had for rampaging across their bit of the galaxy being horrible to people. But if the affront didn't love hunting as much as they did, would they still be the affront? Hunting, especially the highly cooperative form of hunting in three dimensions which the affront had evolved, required and encouraged intelligence, and it was generally, though not exclusively, intelligence that took a species into space. The required mix of common sense, inventiveness, compassion and aggression required was different for each. Perhaps, if you tried to make the affront just a little less enraptured by hunting, you would only be able to do so by making them much less intelligent and inquisitive. It was like play. It was fun at the time when you were a child, but it was also training for when you became an adult. Fun was serious. Still no sign of a hunt in progress, or even of any herds of prey animals. Just a few filmy mats and hanging verticals of floating plant life. Doubtless, some of the smaller animals, which a few species of the prey creatures themselves predated, would be hanging, munching away on the membranes and gas sacs of the flora. But they were invisible from this distance, with the haze preventing closer inspection. Gaynar Hafoen sat back. There was no seat to sit back on, because the monorail car wasn't built for humans, but the gelfield suit was imitating the effects of a seat. He wore his usual gilet and holster. At his feet was his gelfield hold-all. He looked at it then prodded it with a foot. It didn't look much to be taking on a round trip of six thousand light-years. Bastards, the module said inside his head. What? he asked it. They seem to enjoy leaving everything to the last moment, the module said, sounding annoyed. You know, we only just finished negotiating for the hire of the ships. I mean, you're due to leave in about ten minutes. How late can these maniacs leave things? Ships, plural, he asked. Ships plural, the module said. They insist we hire three of their ridiculous tubs, any one of which could easily accommodate me, I might add. And that's another point at issue. But three? Can you believe? That's practically a fleet by their standards. Must need the money. Gaynar Hafoon, I know you think it amusing to be the cause of the transfer of funds to the affront, but might I point out to you that were it not to all intents and purposes irrelevant, money is power, money is influence, Money is effect. Money is effect, Gaynor Hafoen mused. That one of your own, Scopola Franqui. The point is that every time we donate the affront extra means of exchange, we effectively become part of their expansionist drive. It is not moral. Shit. We gave them orbital building technology. How does that compare with a few gambling debts? That was different. We only gave them that so they'd stop taking over so many planets, and because they didn't trust the orbitals we made for them. And I'm not talking about your gambling debts, however outrageous, or your bizarre habit of bidding up the price of bribes. I'm talking about the cost of hiring three affront and Nova class battle cruisers and their crews for two months. Gaynar Hafoen almost laughed out loud. SC isn't putting that on your tab, is it? Of course not. I was thinking of the wider picture. What the fuck am I supposed to do? he protested. This is the fastest way of getting me where SC wants me to be. Not my fault. You could have said no. Could have, and you'd have spent the next year or so biting my ear about not doing my duty to the culture when I was asked. Your only motive, I'm sure, Scopola Franqui said sniffily, as the monorail car slowed. The module went offline with an ostentatious click. Prick, Gaynor Hafoen thought, unheard. The monorail car passed through another couple of habitat section walls, exiting into a crowded-looking industrial section, where the keel skeletons of newly begun affronter ships rose out of the haze like oddly inappropriate collections of spines and ribs. Ornate elaborations within the greater framework of buttresses and columns supporting the habitat itself. The monorail car continued to slow until it drew to a stop within a web tube attached to one of the structural members. The car started to drop almost in freefall. The car vibrated. In fact, it was rattling. Gaynor Hafoen had grown up on a culture orbital where only sporting vehicles and things you built yourself for a laugh ever vibrated. 
Normal transport systems rarely ever even made a noise unless it was to ask which floor you wanted or whether you'd like the onboard scent changed. The monorail car flashed through a floor and into another gigantic hangar space, where the towering shapes of half-finished craft rose like barbed pinnacles out of the mist-shrouded framework of slender girders below. The bladed hulls of the ships blurred past to one side. Whee-hee! said the gel-filled suit, which thought a front of freefall was just a total hoot. Glad you're amused, Gaynor Hafoen thought. I hope you realize that if this thing crashes now, even I won't be able to stop you breaking most of your major bones, the suit informed him. If you can't say something helpful, shut the fuck up, he told it. Another floor rushed up to meet the car. It plummeted through to a vast misty hall where almost finished affronter ships rose like jagged skyscrapers. The car came juddering and screeching to a halt near the floor of the huge space. The suit clamped around him in support. But Gaynor Hafoen could feel his insides doing uncomfortable things under the effects of the additional apparent gravity. Then the car cycled through a pair of airlocks and rumbled down a dark tunnel. It came out onto the edge of the underside of the habitat, where a succession of docks, shaped like giant rib cages, disappeared away along the lazy curve of the little world. There was a lot of glare, but a few bright stars shone in the darkness. About half the docks were occupied, some with the fronter ships, some with craft from a handful of other species. Dwarfing all the others were three huge dark craft, each of which looked vaguely as though it had been modelled by taking a free-fall aerial bomb from one age and welding onto it a profusion of broadswords, scimitars and daggers from an even earlier time, and then magnifying the result until each was a couple of kilometres in length. They hung, cradled in docks a few kilometres off. The car swung round and headed towards them. The good ships, Sack Slicer 2, Fright Spear, and Kiss the Blade, the suit announced as the car slowed again, and the bulbous black bulks of the craft blotted out the stars. Charmed, I'm sure, thought Gaynor Hafoen, picking up his holdall. He studied the hulls of the three warships, looking for the signs of damage that would indicate the craft were veterans. The signs were there. A delicate tracery of curved lines, light grey on dark grey and black, spread out across the spines, blades and curtain hull of the middle ship, indicated a probably glancing blow from a plasma blast, which even Gaynor Hafoen, who found weapons boring, could recognise. Blurred grey randals like concentric bruises on that middle ship and the nearest vessel were the marks of another weapon system, and sharp, straight lines etched across the various surfaces of the third craft looked like the effects of yet another. Of course, the affront's ships were as self-repairing as any other reasonably advanced civilizations, and the marks that had been left on the vessels were just that. They would be no thicker than a coat of paint, and have negligible effect on the ship's operational capability. However, the affront thought it was only right that their ships should, like themselves, bear the scars of honour that battle brings, and so allowed their warships' self-repair mechanisms to stop just short of perfection, the better to display the provenance of their warfleet's glorious reputations. The car stopped directly underneath the middle warcraft, in the midst of a forest of giant pipes and tubes which disappeared into the belly of the ship. Crunches, thumps and hisses from outside the car announced all was being made safe. A wisp of vapour burst from a seal, and the car's door swung out and up. There was a corridor beyond. An honour guard of affronters jerked to attention, not for him, of course, but for Five Tide and the affronter at his side, dressed in the uniform of a navy commander. Both of them were half floating, half walking along towards him, paddles rowing and dangling limbs pushing. And here's our guest, Five Tide shouted. Gina Hafern, allow me to present Commander Kindrama Six of both the Blades Corner tribe and the battle cruiser Kiss the Blade. So, human, ready for our little jaunt? Yep, he said, and stepped out into the corridor. Chapter 4 Ulva Seish, barely twenty-two, famed scholastic overachiever since the age of three, voted most luscious student by her last five university years, and breaker of more hearts on phage rock than anybody since her legendary great-great-great-grandmother, had been summarily dragged away from her graduation ball by the drone Chert Line. Chert, she said, balling her fists in her long black gloves and nodding her head forward. Her high heels clicked along the inlaid wood of the vestibule floor. How dare you! That was a deeply lovely young man I was dancing with. He was utterly, utterly gorgeous. How could you just drag me away like that? 
The drone, hurrying at her back, dived round in front of her and opened the ancient manually operated double doors leading from the ballroom vestibule, its suitcase-sized body rustling against the bustle of her gown as it did so. I'm sorry beyond words, Alva, it told her. Now please, let's not delay. Mind my bustle, she said. Sorry. He was gorgeous, Alva Seish said vehemently, as she strode down a stone-flagged hallway lined with paintings and urn plants, following the floating drone as it headed for the travel tube doors. I'll take your word for it, it said. And he liked my legs, she said, looking down at the slashed front of her gown. Her long, exposed legs were sheathed in sheer blackness. Violet shoes matched her deep-cut gown. Its short train hurried after her in quick, sinuous flicks. They are beautiful legs, the drone agreed, signalling ahead to the travel tube controls to hurry things up. Damn right they are, she said. She shook her head. He was gorgeous, I'm sure. She stopped abruptly. I'm going back. She turned on her heel, just a little unsteadily. What? yelped Chirp Line. The drone darted round in front of her. She almost bumped into it. Alva, the machine said, sounding angry. Its aura field flashed white. Really? Get out of the way. He was gorgeous. He's mine. He deserves me. Come on. Shift. It wouldn't get out of the way. She balled her fists again and beat at its snout, stamping her feet. She hiccuped. Alva, Alva the drone said, gently taking her hands in its fields. She stuck her head forward and frowned as hard as she could at the machine's front sensory band. Alva, it said again. Please, please listen. This is... What is it anyway? She cried. I told you, something you have to see, a signal. Well, why can't you show it to me here? She looked round the hallway at the softly lit portraits and the variegated fronds, creepers and parasols of the urn plants. There isn't even anybody else around. Because it just doesn't work that way, Chertline said, sounding exasperated. Alva, please. This is important. You still want to join contact? She sighed. I suppose so, she said, rolling her eyes. Join contact and go exploring. Well, this is your invitation. It let go of her hands. She stuck her head forward at it again. Her hair was an artful tangle of massed black curls, studded with tiny helium-filled globes of gold, platinum and emerald. It brushed against the drone's snout like a particularly decorative thundercloud. Will it let me go exploring on that young man? She asked, trying to keep her face straight. Alva, if you will just do as I ask, there is every chance contact will happily provide you with entire ships full of gorgeous young men. Now, please turn round. She snorted derisively and went on tiptoes to look wobblingly over the machine's casing in the direction of the ballroom. She could still hear the music of the dance she'd left. Yeah, but it was that one I was interested in. The drone took her hands again in fields coloured yellow-green with calm friendliness, bringing her down off her toes. Young lady, it said, I shall never say anything more truthful to you than these two things. One, there will be plenty more gorgeous young men in your life. Two, you will never have a better chance of getting into contact, even special circumstances, and with them owing you a favour or two. Do you understand? This is your big chance, girl. Don't you girl me, she told it sniffily. The drone, Chert Line, had been a family friend for nearly a millennium, and parts of its personality were supposed to date back to when they'd been programmed in a house systems computer 9,000 years earlier. It wasn't in the habit of pulling age on her like this and reminding her that she was a mere dayfly to its creakingly venerable antiquity, but it wasn't above doing so when it thought the situation demanded it either. She closed one eye and looked closely at the machine. Did you say special circumstances just there? Yes. She drew back. Hmm, she said, her eyes narrowing. Behind her, the travel tube chimed and the door rolled open. She turned and started walking towards it. Well, come on then, she said over her shoulder. Phage Rock had been wandering the galaxy for nearly 9,000 years. That made it one of the culture's oldest elements. It had started out as a three-kilometre-long asteroid in a solar system, which was one of the first explored by a species that would later form part of the culture. 
It had been mined for metals, minerals, and precious stones, and then its great internal voids had been sealed against the vacuum and flooded with air. It had been spun to provide artificial gravity, and it had become a habitat orbiting its parent sun. Later, when the technology made it possible, and the political conditions prevailing at the time made it advisable to quit that system, it had been fitted with fusion-powered steam rockets and ion engines to help propel it into interstellar space. Again, due to those political conditions, it armed itself with uprated signal lasers and a number of at least partially targetable mass launchers, which doubled as rail guns. Some years later, scarred but intact, and finally accepted as personally sentient by its human inhabitants, it had been one of the first space-based entities to declare for the new pan-civilizational pan-species grouping, which was calling itself the Culture. Over the years, decades, centuries, and millennia that had followed, Phage had journeyed through the galaxy, wandering from system to system, concentrating on trading and manufacturing at first, and then on a gradually more cultural, educatory role, as the advances in technology the culture was cultivating began to distribute the society's productive capacity so evenly throughout its fabric that the ability to manufacture almost anything developed almost everywhere, and trade became relatively rare. And Phage Rock, by now recognised as one of a distinct category of culture artefacts which were neither ships nor worlds but something in between, had grown accruing new bits of systemic or interstellar debris about it as its needs required and its population increased, securing the chunks of metal, rock, ice and compacted dust to its still gnarled outer surface in a slow process of acquisition, consumption and evolution, so that within just a millennium of its transition from mine to habitat, its earlier original self wouldn't have recognised it. It was thirty kilometres long by then, not three and only the front half of that initial body still peeped out from the prow of the knobbly collection of equipment-scattered mountains and expanded balloon-like hangar and accommodation rotundi that now formed its roughly conical body. Phage Rock's state of accretion had slowed after that, and it was now just over 70 kilometres long and home to 150 million people. It looked like a collection of craggy rocks, smooth stones and still smoother shells brought from a beach and cemented into a rough cairn, all dotted with what looked like a museum collection of culture equipment through the ages. Launch pads, radar pits, aerial frames, sensory arrays, telescope dishes, railgun pylons, crater-like rocket nozzles, clamshell hangar doors, iris apertures, and a bewildering variety of domes, large and small, intact and part dismantled, or just ruined. As its size and its population had grown, so had the speeds Phage Rock was capable of. It had been successfully fitted with ever more efficient and powerful drives and engines, until eventually it was able to maintain a perfectly respectable velocity, either warping along the fabric of space-time, or creating its own induced singularity pathway through hyperspace beneath or above it. Ulva Seishes had been one of the rock's founding families. She could trace her ancestry back through fifty-four generations on Phage itself, and numbered amongst her ancestors at least two forebears who were inevitably mentioned in even one-volume histories of the culture, as well as being descended from, as the fashions of the intervening times had ordained, people who had resembled birds, fish, dirigible balloons, snakes, small clouds of cohesive smoke, and animated bushes. The tenor of the time had generally turned against such outlandishness, and people had mostly returned to looking more like people over the last millennium, albeit assuredly pretty good-looking people. But still, some part of one's appearance was initially at least left to luck and the random nature of genetic inheritance, and it was a matter of some pride to Ulva that she had never had any form of physical alteration carried out. Well, apart from the neural lace, of course, but that didn't count. It would have been a brave or deranged human or machine who told Ulva Seish to her face that the give-or-take-a-bit human basic form was not almost unimprovably graceful and alluring, especially in its female state, and even more especially when it was called Ulva Seish. She looked round the room the drone had brought her to. It was semicircular and moderately big, shaped like an auditorium or a shallowly sloped lecture hall, but most of the steps or seats seemed to be filled with complicated-looking desks and pieces of equipment. A huge screen filled the far wall. They'd entered the room through a long tunnel, which she'd never seen before, and which was blocked by a series of thick, mirror-coated doors which had rolled silently back into recesses as they'd approached and revolved back into place behind them once they'd passed. Ulva had admired her reflection in every one of them and drawn herself up even straighter in her spectacular violet gown.
The lights had come on in the semicircular room as the last door had rolled back into place. The place was bright but dusty. The drone whooshed off to one side and hovered over one of the desks. Ulva stood looking round the space, wondering. She sneezed. Bless you. Thank you. What is this place, Jurt? she asked. Emergency Center Command Space, the drone told her, as the desk beneath it lit up in places and various panes and panels of light leapt up to waver in the air above its surface. Ulva Seish wandered over to look at the pretty displays. Didn't even know this place existed, she said, drawing one black gloved finger along the desk's surface. The displays altered and the desk made a chirping noise. Chert Line slapped her hand away going tsk, while its aura field flashed white. She glowered at the machine, inspected the grey rim of dust on her fingertip, and smeared it on the casing of the drone. Normally, Chert Line would have slicked that part of its body with a field, and the dust would have just fallen off, having literally nothing to cling to. But this time, it ignored her, and just kept on hovering over the desk and its rapidly changing displays, obviously controlling both it and them. Ulva crossed her black-gloved arms in annoyance. The sliding panels of lights hanging in the air changed and rotated. Figures and letters slid across their surfaces. Then they all disappeared. Right, the drone said. A maniple field, coloured formal blue, extended from the machine's casing and dragged a small sculpted metal seat over, placing it behind her and then shoving it quickly forward. She had no choice but to plonk down into it. Ow, she said pointedly. She adjusted her bustle and glared at the drone, but it still wasn't paying attention. Here we go, it said. What looked like a pane of brown smoked glass suddenly leapt into existence above the desk. She studied it, attempting to see her reflection. Ready? the drone asked her. Mm-hmm, she said. Ulva, child, the drone said, in a voice she knew it had spent centuries investing with gravitas. It swiveled through the air until it was directly in front of her. She rolled her eyes. Yes? What? Ulva. I knew you're a little I'm drunk drone, I know, she told it, but I haven't lost my wits. Well, good. But I need to know you're fit to make this decision. What you're about to see might change your life. She sighed and put her gloved elbow on the surface of the desk, resting her chin on her hand. I've had a few young fellows tell me that before, she drawled. It always turns out to be a disappointment, or a joke of the grossest nature. This is neither. But you must understand that just seeing what I'm about to show you might give special circumstances an interest in you that will not pass. Even if you decide you don't want to join contact, or even if you do but you're still refused, it is possible they might watch you for the rest of your life, just because of what you're about to see. I'm sorry to sound so melodramatic, but I don't want you to enter into anything you don't understand the full implications of. Me neither, she yawned. Can we get on with this? You're sure you've understood what I've said? Hell yes, she exclaimed, waving her arms around. Just get on with it. Oh, just one other thing. What? she yelled. Will you travel to a distant location in the guise of somebody else and probably help kidnap somebody, another culture citizen? Will I what? she said, wrinkling her nose and snorting with laughter and disbelief. Sounds like a no to me, the drone said. Didn't think you would. Had to ask, though. Uh, that means I have no choice but to show you this. It sounded relieved. She put both her black-gloved arms on the desk, rested her chin on them, and looked as soberly as she could at the drone. Chirrut, she said. What is going on here? You'll see, it told her, getting out of the way of the screen. Are you ready? If I get any more ready, I'll be asleep. Good. Pay attention. Oh, yes, sir, she said, glancing narrow-eyed at the machine. Watch, it said. She sat back in the seat with her arms folded. Words appeared on the screen. Text trans. Obscure term acronym explanation function running. Instances flagged thus. Signal sequence received at Phage Rock. 1. Scan broadcast M clear, standard nonary moraine, received at N4.28.855.0065 plus. 
What's nonary mean? Based on nine. Ordinary moraine. The stuff you learned in kindergarten, for goodness sake. The three by three dot grid. Oh. The text scrolled on. Asterisk. Exclamation C11505. Asterisk. Trans. Asterisk equals broadcast. Exclamation equals warning. Galaxy sector number. Whole comprises standard format high compression factor emergency warning signal. 2. Swept beam M1. Basic culture intragalactic ship language. Received at N4.28.855.0079 minus. SDA. Trans. Significant developmental anomaly. C2314992 plus 52. Trans. Fourth level of accuracy galactic location. X. From. FATC. Trans. General contact unit. Fate amenable to change. At N4.28.855. Asterisk. Could we lose all these strings of figures? She asked the drone. They're not really telling me anything I need to know, are they? I suppose not. There. Command. Text strands, long numeral stripping function enabled. Set at five numerals or more. Instances flagged thus. Dot. Three. Swept beam M2. Standard contact section idiom. Relay received at N. Dot. From GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient. And as requested. Significant developmental anomaly. C. Dot. Trans. Eighth level of accuracy galactic location at N dot. Four. Tight beam M16. Special circumstances section high level code sequence. Relay received at N dot. From GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient and only as required. Developmental anomaly provisionally rated EQT. Trans equivalent technology. Potentially jeopardizing found here. C. Dot. My status, L5 secure, moving to L6. Trans, contact mind, prophylactic system security levels. Instigating all other extreme precautions. 5. Broadcast M clear, received at N. Dot. Asterisk, from GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient and broadcast. Rev 3 previous compacts. Trans. Communication packages. Reference 1 to 3 above. Panic over. I misinterpreted. It's a scapsile vault craft. Oh hum. Sorry. Full internal report to follow immediately in high embarrassment factor mode. BSTS, H and H, BTB. Trans, BSTS, H and H, BTB equals, better safe than sorry, hail and hearty, back to business. Pre-agreed OK signal between Escarpment Class General Contact Unit, Fate Amenable to Change, and General Systems Vehicle, Ethics Gradient confirmed. End signal sequence. Is that it? She cried, staring at the drone. That's the most boring... No, it isn't. Look. She looked back. The text scrolled on. Pre-refereed security clearance granted. Ref, Phage Rock. Signal sequence log unlocked, re-enabled. Text trans record event function disabled. Signal sequence resuming. 6. Started tight point M32 SCANTK. Trans special circumstances absolute need to know level maximum encryption code process. Relay tracked copy 4 received at N dot. Check to read. X. Being read at N dot in ESENT command space on phage rock by text trans. Recognized archaic V891.4 non-sentient. NV, text trans, record event function will remain disabled to document end read point. So cleared. And phage, quins, broatza, ulva, hals, seish, dam, ifetra. So cleared. And escaruz, chert, line, b handrehen, zatil, treberis. So cleared. Sentient sight of the following document will be recorded. Each check to proceed. X, X. Thank you. Proceeding. NB. Attention. 
The following is a screen written text only dynamically scrolled discrete assimilation opportunity document which may not be vocalized, glyphed, diaglyphed, copied, stored or media transferred in any conventionally accessible form. Any attempt to do so will be noted. Please adjust reading speed. Default human. NB important. Established SC secrecy methodology applies at M32 level. See following schedule, redefinitions, precedence warnings, likely sanctions and punishments. You are strongly advised to study this schedule carefully if you are not already fully familiar. Override. Schedule readout aborted. You weren't supposed to do that, Chertline yelped. Ulva had spotted the part of the text panel that overrode the readout and pressed it. She snorted. Shh, she said, nodding at the screen. You're missing it. Begin read point of tracked copy document hash sc dot c4 plus. From GCU fate amenable to change to GSV ethics gradient and strictly as SC cleared. Accession notice at dot. Constitutes formal all ships warning level zero. In temporary sequestration, textual note added by GSV wisdom like silence at dot. Accession. Confirmed precedent breach type K7. True class non estimal. Its status active, aware, contactifile, uninvasive SF. Trans, so far. Lock statry. Trans, locally static with reference to. Esperi, star. First com at. Trans, communication attempt. It's following shear by contact via my primary scanner at dot. At dot in M1A16 and Galen 2 by tight beam, type 2A, PTA. Trans, permission to approach. And handshake burst as appended. X at 0.7Y. Trans, light here. Suspect signal gleaned from ZE. Trans, zetetica lench. Lalsea com beam. Trans, communication beam. Spread, second era. X contact call signed I. No other signals registered. My subsequent actions. Maintained course and speed. Skim declutched. Primary scanner to mimic 50% closer approach. Began directed full passive HS. Trans. Hyperspatial. Scan. Sync. Start of signal sequence as above. Sent buffered gallon 2 pro forma message reception confirmation signal to contact location. Dedicated track scanner at 90% power and 300% beam spread to contact at minus 25% primary scanner roll off point. Instigated squared exponential. Slow to stop line maneuver synchronized to scan local stop point at 12% of track scanner range limit. Ran full systems check as detailed. Executed slow for swing around, then retraced course to previous closest approach point and stop at standard squared X curve. Holding there. Accession's physical characteristics. Exclamation AM exclamation. Trans antimatter. Sphere rad 53.34 kilometers. Mass, non-estimal by space-time fabric influence, locality ambiently planar, estimated by pan-polarity material density norms at 1.45 times 8 to the power 13 T. Black body surface, stipple granular, fractal within 0 0.0012 to 1344 mm range, open to field-filtered vacuum, anomalous field presence inferred from 8 to the power 21 kilohertz leakage. A firm K7 category by HS topology and EG. Trans, hyperspatial energy grid. Links, inf and alt. Trans, the hyperspatial directions infra and ultra. EG, link details non-estimal. Diaglyph files attached. Associated anomalous materials presence. Several highly dispersed detritus clouds, all within 28 minutes. Three consistent with stage destruction of 0.1 meter cubed near a Quivtec entity. Another, ditto approx, 3 to the power 8 partially exhausted M doors, 0.1 cal rounds. Trans, miniaturized drone advanced weapon systems nanomissiles. Another consisting of general high soft level, O2 atmosphered. Ship internal combat debris. Latter drifting directly away from accession's current position. Retracts of debris clouds, expansion profiles indicate mutual age of 52.5 days. Combat debris cloud implicitly originating at 0.948 milliseconds from accession's current position. Diaglyph files attached. No other presence is apparent to within 30 years. My status, H&H, &H, untouched. L8 secure post-system scour, 100%. 
ATDPSs. Trans. Auto Total Destruct Protocol Suites. Engaged. CRTTDPSs. Trans. Coded Remote Triggered Total Destruct Protocol Suites. Engaged. Repeat. Accession. E-Grid, Inf and Alt, Linked, Confirmed. E-Grid Link Details non estimal True Class, non estimal Awaiting. At. N. Dot. P.S. Gulp. Document binary choice menu, 1 equals yes or 0 equals no. Repeat. Inspect reading history. Read previous comments. Attach comments. Read appendices. All the above. 0 equals leave doc. We'll dip out here for now, the drone said. All the above. 0 equals leave doc. 0. End read point tracked copy document. Hash SC dot C4 plus. NB. The preceding tracked copy document is not readable, copyable, transmissible without its embedded security program. NB. Important. Communicating any part, detail, property, interpretation or attribute of the preceding document, including its existence, override. Post document warning readout aborted. I wish you'd stop doing that, the drone muttered. Sorry, she said. Alpha Seish shook her head slowly at the text hanging in the air in front of her and the drone jerked line. She took a deep breath. Suddenly, she felt quite entirely sober. Is this as important as I think it is? Almost certainly much more so. Oh, she said. Fuck. Indeed, the drone replied. Any other questions so far? She looked at the last word of the GCU's main signal. Gulp. Well, she could relate to that all right. Questions, Ulva Seish said, staring at the hollow screen and blowing her cheeks out. She turned to the drone, her violet ball gown rustling. Lots? First, what are we really... Uh, no, hold on. Just take me through the signal, never mind all the translations or whatever. What's it actually saying? The General Contact Unit issues an accession notice through its home general systems vehicle, the drone told her. But it's prevented from being broadcast by another GSV, which the first one obviously contacted before doing anything. The GCU tells us that its sensors clipped this artifact, which then hailed the GCU using an old Elinch greeting and an even older galactic common language. Then, the GCU spends a great deal of the signal detailing how clever it was pretending that it's slower, not as manoeuvrable, and less well-equipped in the sensor department than actually it is. It describes the object and a few surrounding bits and pieces of debris, which imply there was some sort of small-scale military action there 53 days earlier. Then, it assures us it's well and unviolated, but it's ready to blow itself up, or let somebody else blow it up, if its integrity is threatened. Not a step a GCU takes lightly. However, entirely the most important aspect of the signal is that the object it has discovered is linked to the energy grid in both hyperspatial directions. That alone puts it well outside all known parameters and precedents. We have no previous experience whatsoever with something like this. It's unique, beyond our ken. I'm not surprised the GCU is scared. Okay, okay, that's kind of what I thought. Shit, she belched delicately. Excuse me. Of course. And now, like I was going to say, what are we really dealing with here? An accession or something else? Well, if you take the definition of an accession as anything external to the culture that we should be worried about, this is an accession, all right. On the other hand, if you compare it to the average, or even an exceptional, hegemonizing swarm, it's small, localized, non-invasive, unaggressive, unshielded, immobile, and almost chatty, using Galen too to communicate. The drone paused. The crucial characteristic then remains the fact that the thing's linked to the energy grid, both up and down. That's interesting, to put it mildly, because as far as we know... Nobody knows how to do that. Well, uh, nobody apart from the elder civilizations. They're probably. They won't say, and we can't tell. So, this thing can do something the culture can't? Looks like it. And I take it the culture would like to be able to do what it can do. 
Oh, yes, yes, very much so. Or, even if it couldn't partake of the technology, at least it would like to use the implied opportunity the accession may represent. To do what? Well, Chertline said, drawing the word out while its aura field coloured with embarrassment and its body wobbled in the air. Technically, maybe, the ability to travel easily to other universes. The machine paused again, looking at the human and waiting for her sarcastic reply. When she didn't say anything, it continued. It should be possible to step outside the time strand of our universe as easily as a ship steps outside the space-time fabric. It might then become feasible to travel through superior hyperspace upwards to universes older than ours, or through inferior hyperspace downwards to universes younger than our own. Time travel? No, but affording the opportunity to become time-proof, age-proof. In theory, one might become able to step down consecutively through earlier universes. Well, forever. Forever? Real forever, as far as we understand it. You could choose the size and therefore age of the universe you wanted to remain within, and or visit as many as you wanted. You could, for example, head on up through older universes and attempt to access technologies perhaps beyond even this one. But just as interesting is the point that because you wouldn't be tied to one universe, one time stream, you need be involved in no heat death when the time came in your original universe, or no evaporation, or no big crunch, depending. It's like being on an escalator. At the moment, confined to this universe, we're stuck to this stair, this level. The possibility this artifact appears to offer is that of being able to step from one stair to another, so that before your stair on the escalator comes to the end of its travel, heat, death, big crunch, whatever, you just step off one level down to another. You could, in effect, live forever. Well, unless it's discovered that cosmic fireball engines themselves have a life cycle. As I understand it, the metamath on that implies, but does not guarantee perpetuity. Seish looked at the drone for a while. Her brows furrowed. Haven't we ever found anything like this before? Not really. There are ambiguous reports of vaguely similar entities turning up in the past, though they tend to disappear before anybody can fully investigate. But as far as we know, nobody has ever found anything quite like this before. The human was silent for a while. Then she said, if you could access any universe and go back to one universe at a very early, pre-sentient stage with an already highly developed civilization, you could take over the whole thing, the drone confirmed. An entire universe would be yours alone. If, in fact, go back far enough, that is, to a small enough, early enough, just post-singularity universe, and you could conceivably customize it, mold it, shape it, influence its primary characteristics. Admittedly, that sort of control may well remain in the realm of the fantastic, but it might be possible. Alva Seish drew a deep breath, and, looking at the floor, nodded slowly. And, of course, she said, if this thing is what it appears to be, it could be an exit as well as an entrance. Entirely so. It is almost certainly both at once. As you imply, never mind us getting into it. We don't know what might come out of it. Alva Seish nodded slowly. Holy shit, she said. Let's call up the comments, Chertline suggested. Can we miss out the preparatory junk at the start? Allow me. There. Read previous comments. One. And skip all the detailology crap, too. Just who said what? As you wish. Comment section. From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV, Continent Class. 1.0. As agreed within the informal SC Extraordinary Events Core Group, Crisis Preparatory Foresight Subcommittee Occasional, we, in multiple mode, have assumed the management of this situation as of N. 1.1. The following constitute our introductory remarks. 
Uh, might we first beg to record that it goes without saying that we are not only extremely flattered, but also deeply humbled to be placed in a position of such importance on the occasion of this grave, profound, and indeed, one might even say, momentous circumstance. Po-faced bastard! Are all continents this up themselves? Want me to ask somebody? Yeah, I'm sure we'd get a straight answer to that one. Just so. Hmm. Meanwhile, the bullshit rolls on. 3.0. Clearly, this is a matter of the utmost consequence. It follows that the manner in which it is presented beyond ourselves must be considered with regard to all the possible ramifications and repercussions such a pan-developmentally crucial subject might reasonably be expected to entail. Sit on it, in other words, Sage said tartly. What exactly is a continent class's multiple mode anyway? Three-mind grouping, usually. That's why it's saying everything in triplicate. 3.1. The accession under consideration is without precedent, but it is also, it would appear, static, and presently, and again apparently, to all intents and purposes, inactive. Thus, caution, born of import, situational stability, and imprecedence, would appear to be the order of the moment. We have, as a temporary measure, and with the approval of those comprising the above group and subcommittee, who are within reasonable consultative range, deemed the matter to be secrecy-rated, such that all discussions and communications regarding it are carried out according to M32 standard. 3.2 under the terms of the temporary emergencies, allowed subterfuges, post-debacle steering committee report following the Azadian matter, the maximum length of the M32 secrecy interval has been set at 128 days, standard from N. Dot, with a mean envisaged duration of 96 days and a full subcommittee review period of 32 hours. 3.3 the nearest star to this accession is called Esperi, under standard adopted nomenclature. However, in accordance with M32 procedure, we propose the code term Tausig, from the primary random event naming list, be used regarding this matter henceforth. 3.4. This concludes our introductory remarks. 4.0. The following comments will be arranged in sorted relevance order. Actual receive times and context schedules are available in the usual appendices. 4.1. We hereby open the discussion on the Tausig matter. From Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival, the GSV Plate Class. Right. First, this should not be kept secret, even for a limited time. I object in the strongest possible terms to the fact that the instant we stumble over possibly the most important thing anybody's ever found anywhere ever, the first thing SC does is snap into full-scale raving paranoia mode and apply this M32 total secrecy will pull your plugs out baby shit. I've given my word and I'm not going to leak this, but for the record, I believe we should be telling everybody. Let's face it, we'll probably have to well before this unrealistic time limit of 128 days anyway. That said, if we are going to keep this to ourselves for the time being, might I anticipate SC's all-too-predictable reaction and draw everyone's attention to a study by the added value, text and details attached, which basically says if you surround something like this with a mega-fleet and it isn't quite omnipotent, just staggeringly powerful and fully invasive, you're basically giving it an immense, ready-made war fleet to play with, if it is hostile. Just a thought. From Tactical Grace GCU Escarpment Class. I agree absolutely with the above and endorse the added value study. Let us not thoughtlessly get counted up on this one. From Uitra, Orbital Hub, Schiphase Oveli System, Solo. Some sadness reigns. We may approach the end of our knowing naivety. Draw round. The fire growing dim draws too drawing in its breath for one fine, final burst of flame. Potentially an end of innocence, we face this, glancing backwards. Within the horizon of our mutual import, an end and start to meaning, finally beginning. Ancients, knowing so little, would have half expected, partly welcomed what we all fear this might be. We, knowing all too much, would rather deny its untold implications. Ephemera, they were half happy with and wholly used to the possibility of an end. By their knowing, immortal, we tremble before the same. My friends, if we have ever worshipped anything, it has been the great god Chaos, 
what else shields intelligence from the awful implications of utter omniscience? Might we be looking at our gods day at last? From Steely Glint, GCV, Plains Class. Remarkable. One hears nothing for years, and suddenly... Well, anyway... Parche the added value study mentioned above, I propose the immediate and complete remilitarization of all viable units to within, say, sixty-four days' Russian distance. Not so much because we might need to fight the Tausig matter itself, but because this event will undoubtedly not stay secret for very long, and will, with equal certitude, attract an entire caste of terminological civilizeds of the distinctly undesirable persuasion. Serious up-cannoning on our part, for all its intrinsic vulgarity and first-principle undesirability, may be the only way to prevent scalar inter-civilization conflicts which, at worst, might overshadow the entail of the matter itself. From Serious Callers Only, LSV, Tundra Class Here, in the bare, dark face of night, a calm, unhurried eye draws sight. We see, in what we think we fear, the cloudings of our thought made clear. From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV, Continent Class A most interesting contribution, we are sure, but can we keep this just a little more focused? From Shoot Them Later, Eccentric Culture Ulterior, Our Forget It Tendency, T-Rated Integration Factor 73%, Vessel Rated 99%, Illuminating. Unhappy as I am to agree with the steely glint, I suspect it might be right. There, I said it. From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV Continent Class I was not aware that the Shoot Them Later was part of this core group. No entity with an IF of less than 100% is supposed even to be considered for inclusion in this group. No eccentric or ulterior craft are eligible. LSV Serious Callers Only said message was relayed through you. Provide an explanation immediately. From Serious Callers Only, LSV Tundra Class. No. From Ethics Gradient, GSV Range Class. With the group's permission, hint of warp wake, inadvertent soliton resonation signature, Krasil system, 62 standard years XTM, curved V towards TM region, DGs attached, probably nothing. From Limivorous, GSV Ocean Class. This TM, this latest E, this I, this strange new object of concern. Telic? From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV Continent Class. With immense respect to our highly esteemed colleague Limivorous, and with full cognizance of its most illustrious career and near-legendary reputation, we have to say we were also not aware that our humble group was graced with its exalted regard. GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, the as Rilaire, you should have informed us you are in contact with the Limivorous. From Not Invented Here, MSV, Desert Class. Red. Also hypnotic? From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV, Continent Class. But the not invented here was reported destroyed in 2.31. Identify yourself, you liar. Security breach. What is going on here? From Shoot Them Later, Eccentric Culture Ulterior, Our Forget It Tendency, T-Rated Integration Factor 73%, Vessel Rated 99%, Tee-hee. From Full Refund, Hamomden Empire Class Main Battle Unit, original name NBU-604. Convert Craft, Vessel Rated Integration Factor 80%, NB, Self-Assessed. Ad Delitescent. From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV, Continent Class. What? We can't have a self-assessed ex-enemy craft privy to M32 level matters. What is going on here? A security breach. I invoke my authority as convener of this group to suspend all M32 level discussion immediately and until further notice, while a full security review is carried out. From Different Tan, GCU Mountain Class. Indeed so, perhaps. Even whisper it. An outrance. From Wisdom Like Silence, GSV Continent Class. The different Tan is also not an accredited member of this core group. This has gone far enough. We hereby... Switching Document Comments Track. 
New M32 level core group formed. Name, Interesting Times Gang, Act 4. Group initially comprises all previously mentioned craft except Wisdom Like Silence, GSV Continent Class. From Star Turn, Rock, First Era. Filing name change from Star Turn to End in Tears. From No Fixed Abode, GSV, Sabbatical, X Equator Class. I suggest, firstly, that we rid ourselves of this ridiculous Taussig nonsense and call the matter after Esperi, the nearest star. I also propose that between eight and sixteen days from now, depending on the availability of more noteworthy news from elsewhere, we move to an information release at M16 level, simply saying that we have discovered an accession of an ambiguous nature, which we are investigating and which we are asking others to stay away from. Assuming that they will not, we should request this steely glint to instigate a measured and localized military mobilization immediately. Beyond that, the normal democratic processes will doubtless apply. From Tactical Grace, GCU Escarpment Class. A subtle cannon up then. From Steely Glint, GCV Plains Class. Indeed, an honor. I accept. From Serious Callers Only, LSV Tundra Class. And let the wisdom like silence be the agent of information release. From Shoot Them Later. Eccentric culture ulterior, our forget it tendency. T rated integration factor 73%, vessel rated 99%. Ooh, witty. Well, if it isn't in the half. From Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival V, GSV plate class. I think we ought to release immediately. From No Fixed Abode, GSV Sabbatical X Equator class. Abhorrent as I'm sure we all find such ploys, I suspect that the extra week or two's additional start on everybody else this delay ought to give us will prove significant in preparing for the fray which may result from this becoming public. From Different Tan, GCU Mountain Class As the knot invented here is the closest major unit to the matter, I suggest it makes all speed for the location of the accession and acts as instant coordinator. I myself am not too far away from the Asperi system. I shall make my way there and rendezvous with the Not Invented Here. From Not Invented Here, MSV Desert Class. My pleasure. From Different Tan, GCU Mountain Class. I also submit that the GSV Ethics Gradient and the GCU Fate Amenable to Change ought to be invited into the Interesting Times Gang, Act 4, for the duration of the crisis, and both craft instructed to hold back from full investigation of the accession until further notice. Relate character assessments of the two craft attached. They look reliable. From Uitra, Orbital Hub, Skipaze Oevli System, Solo. And call our mutual friend. From No Fixed Abode, GSV Sabbatical, Ex Equator Class. Of course. So, are they all agreed on all the above? From Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival, the GSV Plate Class. Agreed. From Tactical Grace, GCU Escarpment Class. Agreed. From Waitra, Orbital Hub, Skipaze Oevli System Solo. Agreed. From Steely Glint, GCV Planes Class. Agreed. From Serious Callers Only, LSV Tundra Class. Objection. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Agreed. From Shoot Them Later, Eccentric Culture Ulterior, Our Forget It Tendency, T-rated integration factor 73%, vessel rated 99%. Agreed. From Limiverus, GSV Ocean Class. Agreed. From Not Invented Here, MSV Desert Class. Agreed. From Full Refund, Hamomden Empire Class Main Battle Unit, original name MBU-604, convert craft vessel rated integration factor 80%, NB self-assessed, Agreed. From Different Tan, GCU, Mountain Class. Agreed. From End in Tears, Rock, First Era, Previously Star Turn. Agreed. Doing my bit. Done. From No Fixed Abode, GSV Sabbatical, Ex Equator Class. Agreed. From Limiverous, GSV Ocean Class. Good talking to you all again, by the way. So, now 
We wait. From serious callers only. LSV Tundra Class. And see. End of comments. Document binary choice menu. One equals yes or zero equals no. Repeat. Inspect reading history. Read previous comments. Attach comments. Read appendices. All the above. Zero equals leave doc. End read point. Tract copy document. SC dot plus. NB. The preceding tract copy document is not readable, copyable, transmissible without its embedded security program. NB important. Communicating any part, detail, property, interpretation, or attribute of the preceding document, including its existence, override. Post document warning readout aborted. The hollow screen disappeared. So what does all that mean? She asked. Good grief, Alva, the drone said, giving a fair impression of spluttering. It's the heavy crew. It's the ghosts. What? The who? She swivelled in the seat to face the drone. Child, there were names appearing there I haven't seen for five centuries. Some of those mines are legends. This is the interesting times gang we're talking about. I take it. Well, that's obviously what they call themselves. Well, good for them. But I still want to know what all that was about. Well. A normal enough but pretty high power mind incident group gets together to discuss what's going on. Then, allowing for signal travel duration, within real time seconds, it's taken over by probably the most respected, not to mention enigmatic group of minds ever assembled together in the same signal sequence since the end of the Adiran War. You don't say, Alva said, yawning a little and putting one black gloved hand over her mouth. Yes. In the case of the not invented here, everybody I know thought the thing had been lost half a millennium ago. Then they dump the boring, pedantic GSV that happened to be on the incident coordinating rotor, agree to wait and see with the accession itself, while sending investigatory reinforcements, start a localized mobilization, mobilization, and release a half truth about the accession when there's some more exciting news breaking. Alva frowned. When did all this happen? Well. If you hadn't turned off the date time function, muttered the drone, colouring frosty blue. Alva rolled her eyes again. The accession was discovered, and that signal sequence plus comment dates from twelve days ago. The accession's discovery was announced through the standard channels the day before yesterday. The human shrugged. I missed it. The headlines concerned the resolution of the blittering goer situation. Ah, that would do it, I suppose. Most of the developed galaxy had been following that story for the past hundred days, as the aftermath of the short but bitter Blitteringue Deluge War played itself out on the CAM bomb-mined Blitteringue home planets and the Deluge fleets fleeing with their precious holy relics and grand house captives. It had ended with relatively little loss of life, but in high drama and with continuing developing repercussions. Little wonder anything else announced that day had slipped by almost unnoticed and stayed that way. And what was that thing towards the end there about calling our mutual friend? That'll probably turn out to be something to do with inviting some other mind onto the group. The drone was silent for a moment, though of course it could be some pre-agreed form of words, a secret signal amongst the group. Sage stared at the drone. A secret signal? She said, in an M32 level transmission. It's possible. No more. Sage continued to stare at the machine for a moment. You're saying that these minds are discussing something, agreeing to something that's so sensitive, so secret, they won't even talk about it in special circumstances. Top end code, the fucking holy of holies, the unbreakable, inviolable, totally secure M three two. No, I'm not. I'm just saying it's. Semi possible. The drone's aura field flickered grey with frustration. In that event, though, I don't think it would be breakability they'd be worried about. What then? Sasha's eyes narrowed. Deniability? If we're thinking in such paranoid terms in the first place, yes, that'll be my guess. The drone said, dipping its front once in a nod and making a noise like a sigh. So they're up to something. Well, they're up to a lot by the sound of it. But it's just possible that some part of what they're up to might be, well, 
Whiskey. Ulva Seish sat back, staring at the empty square of the projected screen, hanging in the air in front of her in the drone chert line, like a pane of slightly opaque smoked glass. Whiskey, she said. She shook her head and felt a strange urge to shiver, which she suppressed. Shit, don't you hate it when the guards come out to play? In a word, said the drone, yes. So what am I supposed to do, and why? You're supposed to look like this woman, the drone said, as a bright, still picture flashed onto the smoky screen in front of her. Olva studied the face, chin in her hand again. Hmm, she said. She's older than me. True, and not as pretty. But fair enough. Why do I have to look like her? To draw the attention of a certain man. She narrowed her eyes. Wait a minute. I'm not expected to fuck this guy, am I? Oh, good grief, no, the drone said. It's aura field briefly grey again. All you have to do is look like an old flame of his. She laughed. I bet I am expected to fuck him. She rocked back in the little metal seat. How quaint. Is this really what SC gets up to? No, you're not, hissed the drone. Aura field going deep grey. You just have to be there. I'll bet, she guffawed and sat back, crossing her arms. So, who is he anyway? Him, the drone said. Another still face appeared on the screen. Olva Seish sat forward again, raising one hand. Hold on. I take it all back. Actually, he's pretty enticing. The drone made a sighing noise. Olva! If you will please try to hold your hormones in check for just a second. What? she shouted, spreading her arms. Will you do this or not? it asked her. She closed one eye and wobbled her head from side to side. Maybe, she slurred. It means a trip, the drone said, leaving tonight. Pa! She sat back, crossing her arms and looking up at the ceiling. Out of the question, forget it. All right, tomorrow. She turned to the drone. After lunch. Breakfast. Late breakfast. No, the machine said, aura field briefly grey with frustration. All right, late breakfast, but before noon in any event. Ulva opened her mouth to protest, then gave a tiny shrug and settled for scowling. Okay. How long for? You'll be back in a month, if all goes well. She tipped her head back narrowed her eyes again, and said quite soberly and precisely, Where? The drone said, Tear. Huh, she said, tossing her head. A sore point. Phage had been heading to Tear specifically for that year's festival, but had been diverted off course to help build an orbital after the part evacuation of some stupid planet. It had taken forever. The festival only lasted a month and was now almost over. The rock was still heading that way, but wouldn't arrive for two hundred days or so. She frowned. But that's a couple of months away, even on a fast ship. Special circumstances has its own ships, and they're faster. Ten days to get there on the one they're giving you. My own ship? Ulva asked, eyes flashing. All yours, not even any human crew. Wow, she said, sitting back and looking pleased with herself. Aloof! Part 4 Dependency Principle Chapter 1 Tight Beam M16.4 Wreck at N4.28.856.4903 From GSV Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival V to Eccentric Shoot Them Later Is it just me, or does something smell suspicious about all this? Tight Beam M16.4 Tra, point, at N4.28.856.6883. From Eccentric Shoot Them Later to GSV Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival V. Oh, good, an easy one. It's you. I'm serious. This feels strange. How dare you imply I'm not serious? Anyway, what's the problem? This is the most important thing ever, by our understanding. Naturally, everything and everybody will seem a little odd after such a realization. We cannot help but be affected. You're right, I'm sure, but I just have this niggling feeling. Now, 
The more I think about it, the more I'm convinced you are right, and I'm worrying over nothing. I'll do a little checking for my own peace of mind, but I'm sure it will only help lay my fears to rest. You should spend more time in infinite fun space, you know. You're probably right. Oh, well. Still, keep in touch, just in case anything does turn up, of course. Take care. Good checking, my friend. You take care, too. Chapter 2 The drone, Cicela Euthalus one of two, drifted, waiting. Several seconds had passed since the skein pulse had resonated around it, and it was still trying to decide what to do. It had passed the time by throwing together the antimatter reaction chamber as best it could in the short time available, instead of painstakingly putting it together bit by delicate bit. As an afterthought, it released all but one of its nanomissiles and stuck two hundred of them around its heat-scarred rear panel in two groups on either side of the reaction chamber. Fortuitously, the panel's damaged surface made it easy for it to embed the tiny missiles so that only the last third of their millimetre-long bodies protruded from the panel. It kept the other thirty-nine missiles ready to fire, for all the good that would do against whatever it was stalking it. The gentle, buzzing vibrations in the skein had taken on a distinctive signature. Something was coming towards it in hyperspace, with a sensory keel in real space, trawling slowly, well below light speed. Whatever it was, it was not the piece makes plenty. The timbral characteristics were all wrong. A wash of wideband radiation, like a sourceless light, a final pulse of maser energies in real space this time, and then something shimmering away to one side, a ship surfacing into the three-dimensional void, image flickering once, then snapping steady. Ten kilometres away, one click long, matched velocity, a fat, grey-black ellipsoid shape covered with sharp spines, barbs and blades. An affront a ship. The drone hesitated. Could this have been the ship that had been following the Peacemakes Plenty? Probably. Had it been taken over by the artifact accession? Possibly. Not that it mattered in the end. Shit. The affront. No friends of the Alench. Or anybody else, for that matter. I failed. They'll reel me in, gobble me up. The drone tried desperately to work out what it could do. Did the fact it was an affronter ship make any real difference? Doubtful. Should it signal it? Try to get it to help? It could try. The affront were signatories to the standard conventions on ships and individuals in distress, and, in theory, they ought to take the drone aboard, help repair it and broadcast a warning about the artifact to the rest of the galaxy. In practice, they would take the drone to bits, find out how it worked, drain it of all its information, ransom it if they hadn't destroyed it in the process of investigation and inquisition, probably try to put a spy program into it so that it would report back to them once it was back amongst the Alench, and, meanwhile, try to work out how they could use the artifact stroke accession, perhaps being foolhardy enough to attempt investigating it in the same final, fatal way the peace makes plenty had, or perhaps keeping it secret for now and bringing more ships and technology to bear upon it. Almost certainly, the one thing they wouldn't do was play the situation by the book. EM Effector Communicating Cicela Euthalius one of two readied its shields for as much as that was worth, probably delay proceedings by, oh, a good nanosecond if the affronter ship decided to attack it. Machine, what are you? Well, that was spoken like an affronter, certainly. It had bet they hadn't tangled with the artifact accession yet. Oh well, play it by the conventions. I am Cicela Euthalius, one of two, drone of the explorer ship Peace Makes Plenty, a vessel of the Stargazer clan, part of the fifth fleet of the Zetetical Lench, and in distress, it communicated. And you? You are ours now. Surrender or take flight. Definitely still 100% affront. Sorry, I missed that. What did you say your name was again? Surrender at once or take flight, wretch. Let me think about that. And thinking was exactly what it was doing. Thinking hard, thinking feverishly. Stalling for time, but thinking. No. The effector signal strength started to soar exponentially. It had plenty of time to slam down its shields. Bastards, it thought. Of course, they like a chase.
The drone fired the missiles embedded in its rear panel. The two hundred tiny engines brought unequal amounts of matter and antimatter together and threw the resulting blast of plasma boiling into the vacuum, careening the machine away across space directly away from the affronter craft. The acceleration was relatively mild. The drone had no time to test the antimatter reaction chamber it had constructed. It threw a few particles of each sort into the chamber and hoped. The chamber blew up. Shit! Back to the drawing board. Not much damage. Not much extra damage, anyway. But not much extra impetus, either. And it wouldn't be using the chamber again. The acceleration went on, building slowly. What else? Think! The affronter ship didn't bother to set off in pursuit of the drone. Cicela Euthalus one of two dropped its plan of leaving a few nanomissiles scattered like mines behind it. Who am I trying to kid anyway? Think, think! Space seemed to buckle and twist in front of it, and suddenly it was no longer heading straight away from the affronter ship. It was parallel to it again. Those animal pus bags are playing with me. A flicker from near the affronter ship's nose. A centimetre diameter circle of laser light blinked onto the drone's casing and wavered there. The drone instructed the nanomissile engines to shut off and flicked on its mirror shields. The laser beam tracked it unsteadily and narrowed until it was a millimetre in diameter. Then its power suddenly leapt by seven orders of magnitude. The drone combed its protesting mirror field and turned rear onto the ship again, presenting the smallest possible target. The laser modulated, stepping up to the ultraviolet. It started strobing. Playing with me. Just fucking playing with me. Think. Think. Well, first, it popped the clamps around its two upper-level mines and raised the bit of its casing that would let the two components, AI core and photonic nucleus, free. The casing shuddered and grated, but it moved. Once it was clear of the main casing, the drone nudged the two mind components with its maniple field. Nothing happened. They were stuck. Panic! If they remained intact and the affronters captured them and weren't a great deal more careful than they were notorious for being, it pushed harder. The components duly drifted out, losing power the instant contact lapsed with the drone's body. Whatever was inside them should be dead or dying now. It blasted them with its laser anyway, turning them into hot dust, then vented the powder behind it round the edge of the mirror shield, where it might interfere with the laser a little. A very little. It readied the core inside its present substrate. That would have to be dumped and lasered too. Then, the drone had an idea. It thought about it. If it had been a human, its mouth would have gone dry. It turned round inside the tight confines of its pummeled shield and fired all two hundred of the nanomissile engines. It shook off the remaining loose nanomissiles and fired thirty of them straight at the affronter ship. The other nine it left tumbling behind it like a handful of tiny black-body needle tips, with their own instructions and the small amount of spare capacity in their microscopic brains packed with coded nonsense. The nanomissiles fired at the affronter ship accelerated towards it in a cloud of sparkling light ahead of the drone. They were picked off one by one over the course of a millisecond, in a dizzy flaring scatter of light blossoms, their tiny warheads and the remains of their antimatter fuel erupting together. The last one to be targeted by the affronter's effector and forced to self-destruct had closed the range to the ship by less than a kilometre. Behind, all nine of the tumbling nanomissiles must have been picked out by the effector as well, because they detonated too. And with any luck, you'll think those were my messages in bottles, and that was my neat idea, Cicely Euthalus one of two thought decoupling the core with its twin's mind state in it. The core depowered. Whatever was in there died. It had no time to mourn. It rearranged its internal state to shunt the core to the outside, then let its body settle back to normal. It pushed the core back down over its blistered, cracked casing to the top of the rear panel, near where the wreckage of the cobbled-together and blown-apart reaction chamber hung. Then it let the core fall into the livid plasma and sleeting radiation of the nanomissile's exhausts. It flared and disintegrated, falling astern in a bright trail of fire. The laser targeted on the drone was heading into the X-ray part of the spectrum. It would break through the mirror shield in a second and a half. 
It would take the drone four and a half seconds to get within range of the ship. Shit. It waited until the mirror shield was a couple of tenths of a second from failing, then signalled, I surrender, and hoped that it was talking to another machine. If it was relying on affronter reactions, it'd be fried before the message got through to their stupid animal brains. The laser flicked off. The drone kept its EM shields up. It was heading towards the affronter vessel at about half a click a second. The ship's bebladed, swollen-looking bulk drifted closer. Turn off your shields! I can't! It put expression into the signal so that it came across as a wail. Now! I'm trying! I'm trying! You damaged me! Damaged me even more! Such weaponry! What chance have I, a mere drone, something smaller than an affronter's beak against such power? Nearly in range. Not far. Not far now. Another two seconds. Drop your shields instantly and allow yourself to be taken over or suffer instant destruction. Still nearly two seconds. It would never keep them talking long enough. Please don't. I'm attempting to shut off the shield projector, but it's in fail-safe mode. It won't let itself be shut off. It's arguing. Can you believe that? But honestly, I am doing my best. Please believe me. Please don't kill me. I'm the only survivor, you know. Our ship was attacked. I was lucky to get away. I've never seen anything like it. Never heard of anything like it, either. A pause. A pause of animal dimensions. Time for animal thoughts. Loads of time. Final chance. Turn off. There. Turning shields off now. I'm all yours. The drone, Cicela Euthalus 1 of 2, turned off its electromagnetic mirror shield. In the same instant, it fired its laser straight at the affronter ship. An instant later, it released the containment around its remaining stock of antimatter, detonated its inbuilt self-destruct charge, and instructed the single nanomissile it still carried within its body to explode too. Fuck you, were its final words. Its last emotion was a mixture of sorrow, elation, and a kind of desperate pride that its plan might have worked. Then it died, instantly and forever, in its own small fireball of heat and light. To the affronter ship, the effect of the tiny drone's laser was rather less than a tickle. It flickered across its hull and barely singed it. The cloud of glowing wreckage the drone's self-destruction had caused passed over the affronter ship and was duly swept by analysing sensors. Plasma, atoms, nothing as big as a molecule. Likewise, the slowly expanding debris from the two groups of nanomissiles. Disappointment, then. That had been a particularly sophisticated model of a lecture drone, not far behind the leading edge of culture drone technology. Capturing one would have been a good prize. Still, it had put up a reasonable fight considering, and provided a morsel of unexpected sport. The affront light cruiser, Furious Purpose, came about and headed slowly away from the scene of its miniature battle, carefully scanning for more nanomissiles. They posed no threat to the cruiser, of course, but the small drone appeared to try to use some of the tiny weapons to place information in, and it might have left others behind, which were not inclined to self-destruct when effector targeted. None showed up. The cruiser backtracked along the course the drifting drone appeared to have taken. It discovered a small cooling cloud of matter at one point, the remnants of some sort of explosion, apparently. But that was all. Beyond that, nothing. Nothing everywhere one looked. Most dissatisfying. The Furious Purpose's restless officers debated how much more time they should spend looking for this lost Lencher ship. Had something happened to it? Had the small drone been lying? Might there be a more interesting opponent floating around out here somewhere? Or might it all be a ruse, a decoy? The culture, the real culture, the wily ones, not these semi-mystical Elenches with their miserable hankering to be somebody else, had been known to give whole of front of fleets the runaround for several months with not dissimilar enticements and subterfuges, keeping them occupied seemingly on the track of some wildly promising prey, which turned out to be nothing at all, or a culture ship with some ridiculous but earnestly argued excuse, while the culture, or one of its snivelling client species, got on, or away, with something else somewhere else, spoiling rightful affront of fun. How were they to know this was not one of those occasions? Perhaps the Alentia ship was under contract to the culture proper, 
Perhaps they had lost the Explorer craft, and a GCU, trailing them as they had been trailing the Lynch craft, had slipped in to take its place. Might this not be true? No, argued some of the officers, because the culture would never sacrifice a drone it considered sentient. The rest thought about this, considered the culture's bizarrely sentimental attitude to life, and were forced to concede the point. The cruiser spent another two days around the Asperi system, and then broke away. It returned to the habitat called Tyr, with a trivial but niggling engine fault. Chapter 3 Technically, it was a branch of metamathematics, usually called metamathics. Metamathics, the investigation of the properties of realities, more correctly, reality fields, intrinsically unknowable by and from our own, but whose general principles could be hazarded at. Metamathics led to everything else. It led to the places that nobody else had ever seen or heard of or previously imagined. It was like living half your life in a tiny, stuffy, warm, grey box and being moderately happy in there because you knew no better, and then discovering a little hole in one corner of the box, a tiny opening which you could get a finger into and tease and pull at, so that eventually you created a tear, which led to a greater tear, which led to the box falling apart around you, so that you stepped out of the tiny box's confines into startlingly cool, clear, fresh air, and found yourself on top of a mountain, surrounded by deep valleys, sighing forests, soaring peaks, glittering lakes, sparkling snowfields, and a stunning, breathtakingly blue sky. And that, of course, wasn't even the start of the real story. That was more like the breath that is drawn in before the first syllable of the first word of the first paragraph of the first chapter of the first book of the first volume of the story. Metamathics led to the mind equivalent of that experience, repeated a million times, magnified a billion times, and then beyond to configurations of wonder and bliss, even the simplest abstract of which the human basic brain had no conceivable way of comprehending. It was like a drug an ultimately liberating, utterly enhancing, unadulterably beneficial, overpoweringly glorious drug for the intellect of machines as far beyond the sagacity of the human mind as they were beyond its understanding. This was the way the minds spent their time. They imagined entirely new universes with altered physical laws and played with them, lived in them and tinkered with them, sometimes setting up the conditions for life, sometimes just letting things run to see if it would rise spontaneously sometimes arranging things so that life was impossible, but other kinds and types of bizarrely fabulous complication were enabled. Some of the universes possessed just one tiny but significant alteration, leading to some subtle twist in the way things worked, while others were so wildly, aberrantly different, it could take a perfectly first-rate mind, the human equivalent of years of intense thought, even to find the one tenuously familiar strand of recognisable reality that would allow it to translate the rest into comprehensibility. Between those extremes lay an infinitude of universes of unutterable fascination, consummate joy and absolute enlightenment. All that humanity knew and could understand, every single aspect known, guessed at and hoped for in and of the universe, was like a mean and base mud hut compared to the vast, glittering, cloud-high palace of monumentally exquisite proportions and prodigious riches that was the metamathical realm. Within the infinities raised to the power of infinities that those metamathical rules provided, the minds built their immense pleasure domes of rhapsodic philosophical ecstasy. That was where they lived. That was their home, when they weren't running ships, meddling with alien civilizations, or planning the future course of the culture itself, the minds existed in those fantastic virtual realities, sojourning beyondward into the multidimensional geographies of their unleashed imaginations, vanishingly far away from the single, limited point that was reality. The minds had long ago come up with a proper name for it. They called it the Irreal, but they thought of it as Infinite Fun, that was what they really knew it as, the land of infinite fun. It did the experience pathetically little justice. The sleeper service promenaded metaphysically amongst the lush creates of its splendid disposition, an expanding shell of awareness in a dreamscape of staggering extent and complexity, like a gravity-free sun built by a jeweller of infinite patience and skill. It is absolutely the case, it said to itself. It is 
absolutely the case. There was only one problem with the land of infinite fun, and that was that if you ever did lose yourself in it completely, as minds occasionally did, just as humans sometimes surrendered utterly to some AI environment, you could forget that there was a base reality at all. In a way, this didn't really matter, as long as there was somebody back where you came from minding the hearth. The problem came when there was nobody left or inclined to tend the fire, mind the store, look after the housekeeping, or however you wanted to express it. Or if somebody or something else, somebody or something from outside, the sort of entity that came under the general heading of an outside context problem, for example, decided they wanted to meddle with the fire in that hearth, the stock in the store, the contents and running of the house. If you'd spent all your time having fun, with no way back to reality, or just no idea what to do to protect yourself when you did get back there, then you were vulnerable. In fact, you were probably dead or enslaved. It didn't matter that base reality was petty and grey and mean and demeaning, and quite empty of meaning compared to the glorious majesty of the multi-hued life you'd been living through metamathics. It didn't matter that base reality was of no consequence aesthetically, hedonistically, metamathically, intellectually and philosophically. If that was the single foundation stone that all your higher-level comfort and joy rested upon, and it was kicked away from underneath you, you fell, and your limitless pleasure realms fell with you. It was just like some ancient electricity-powered computer. It didn't matter how fast, error-free and tireless it was. It didn't matter how great a labour-saving boon it was. It didn't matter what it could do or how many different ways it could amaze. If you pulled its plug out or just hit the off button, all it became was a lump of matter. All its programs became just settings, dead instructions, and all its computations vanished as quickly as they'd moved. It was, also, like the dependency of the human basic brain on the human basic body. No matter how intelligent, perceptive, and gifted you were, no matter how entirely you lived for the ascetic rewards of the intellect and eschewed the material world and the ignobility of the flesh, if your heart just gave out, that was the dependency principle, that you could never forget where your off-switches were located, even if it was somewhere tiresome. It was the problem that subliming dispensed with, of course, and it was one of the usually more minor reasons that civilizations chose elderhood. If your course was set in that direction in the first place, then eventually that reliance on the material universe came to seem vestigial, untidy, pointless, and even embarrassing. It wasn't the course the culture had fully embarked upon, at least not yet, but as a society, it was well aware of both the difficulties presented by remaining in base reality and the attractions of the sublime. In the meantime, it compromised, busying itself in the macrocosmic clumsiness and petty, messy profanity of the real galaxy, while at the same time exploring the transcendental possibilities of the sacred irreal. It is absolutely the a single signal flicked the great ship's attention entirely back to base reality. From Rock End in Tears to GSV Sleeper Service. Done. The ship contemplated the one-word message for what was, for it, a very long time, and wondered at the mixture of emotions it felt. It set its newly manufactured drone fleet to work in the external environments, and rechecked the evacuation schedule. Then it located Amorphia. The Avatar was wandering bemused through kilometres of tableau exhibition space that had once been accommodation sections, and instructed it to revisit the woman, Dajil Julian. Chapter 4 Gaynar Hafoen was distinctly unimpressed with his quarters aboard the battle cruiser Kiss the Blade. For one thing, they smelled. What is that? he asked, his nose wrinkling. Methane? Methane is odorless, Gaynor Herfoen, the suit said. I believe the smell you find objectionable may be a mixture of methanol and methylamine. Fucking horrible smell, whatever it is. I'm sure your mucous membrane receptors will cease to react to it before long. I certainly hope so. He was standing in what was supposed to be his bedroom. It was cold. It was very big, a ten-metre square, plenty of headroom, but it was cold. He could see his breath. 
He still wore most of the Gelfield suit, but he detached all but the nape part of the neck and let the head of the suit flop down over his back so that he could get a fresher impression of his quarters, which consisted of a vestibule, a lounge, a frighteningly industrial-looking kitchen diner, an equally intimidatingly mechanical bathroom, and this so-called bedroom. He was starting to wish he hadn't bothered. The walls, floor, and ceiling of the room were some sort of white plastic, the floor bulged up to create a sort of platform on which a huge white thing lay spread, like a cloud made solid. What? he asked, pointing at the bed. Is that? I think it's your bed. I'd guessed. But what is that? Thing lying on it. Quilt? Duvet? Bed covering? What do you want to cover it for? he asked, genuinely confused. Well, it's more to cover you. I think when you're asleep, the suit said, sounding uncertain. The man dropped his hold all onto the shiny plastic floor and went forward to heft the white cloudy thing. It felt quite light, possibly a little damp, unless the suit's tactiles were getting confused. He pulled a glove section back and touched the bed cover thing with his bare skin. Cold, maybe damp. Module, Gaynor Hoffoen said. He'd get its opinion on all this. You can't talk to Scopola Frankly directly, remember? The suit said politely. Shit, Gaynor Hoffoen said. He rubbed the material of the bed cover between his fingers. This feel damp to you, suit? A little. Do you want me to ask the ship to patch you through to the module? Eh? Oh, uh, no, I don't bother. We moving yet? No. The man shook his head. Horrible smell, he said. He prodded the bed cover thing again. He wished now he'd insisted that the module be accommodated on board the ship so that he could live inside it. But the affronters had said this wasn't possible. Hangar space was at a premium on all three ships. The module had protested, and he'd made supportive noises, but he had been rather entertained by the idea that Scopel Afranqui would have to stay here while he went zapping off to far-off parts of the galaxy on an important mission. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Now he wasn't so sure. There was a distant growling noise and a tremor underfoot. Then there came a jerk that almost threw the human off his feet. He staggered to one side and had to sit down on the bed. It made a squelching sound. He stared at it aghast. Now we're moving, said the suit. Chapter 5 Singing softly to himself, the man tended the little fire he had started on the floor of the hall, beneath and between the stored ships, arrayed in the blackness like the trunks of enormous trees in a silent, petrified forest. Geistra Ishmitit was surveying his charges in the deep-buried darkness that was Pittance. Pittance was a huge, irregular lump of matter, 200 kilometers across at its narrowest point, and 98% iron by volume. It was the remnant of a catastrophe which had occurred over four billion years earlier, when the planet, of whose core it had been part, had been struck by another large body. Expelled from its own solar system by that cataclysm, it had wandered between the stars for a quarter of the life of the universe, uncaptured by any other gravity well, but subtly affected by all it passed anywhere near. It had been discovered drifting in deep space a millennium ago by a GCU taking an eccentrically trajectorial course between two stellar systems. It had been given the brief examination its simple and homogeneous composition deserved, and then had been left to glide, noted, effectively tagged, untouched, but given the name Pittance. When the time came, five hundred years later, to dismantle the colossal war machine the culture had created in order to destroy that of the Adirans, Pittance had suddenly been found a role. Most of the culture's warships had been decommissioned and dismantled, a few were retained, demilitarized, to act as express delivery systems for small packages of matter. Humans, for example, on the rare occasions when the transmission of information alone was not sufficient to deal with a problem, and an even smaller number were kept intact and operational. Two hundred years after the war ended, the number of fully active warcraft was actually smaller than it had been before the conflict began, Though, as the culture's critics never tired of pointing out, the average and avowedly completely peaceful general contact unit was more than a match for the vast majority of alien craft it was likely to bump into over the course of its career. 
never a civilization to take too many risks, however, and priding itself on the assiduity of its bet hedging, the culture had not disposed of all the remaining craft. A few thousand, representing less than a percent of the original total, were kept in reserve, fully armed, save for their usual complement of displacer dispatched explosive warheads, a relatively minor weapon system anyway, which they and other craft would manufacture in the event of mobilization. Most of the mothballed ships were retained within a scattering of culture orbitals, chosen so that, if there ever was an emergency which the craft would be required to deal with, no part of the greater galaxy would be more than a month or so's flight away. Still guarding against threats and possibilities even it found difficult to specify, some of the culture's stored war vessels were harboured not in or around highly populated orbitals full of life and the comings and goings of cruise ships and visiting GSVs, but in places as far out of the way as it was possible to find amongst the cavernously cold and empty spaces of the Great Lens. Quiet, secret, hidden places, places off the beaten track, places possibly nobody else even knew existed. Pittance had been chosen as one of those places. The General Systems Vehicle, Uninvited Guest, and a fleet of accompanying warcraft had been dispatched to rendezvous with the cold, dark, wandering mass. It was found exactly where it had been predicted it ought to be, and work began. Firstly, a series of enormous halls had been hollowed out of its interior. Then, a precisely weighed and shaped piece of the matter, mined from one of those giant hangars, had been aimed with millimetric accuracy and fired at pittance by the GSV, leaving a small new crater on the surface of the world, exactly as though it had been struck by another, smaller piece of interstellar debris. This was done because Pittance wasn't spinning quite quickly enough or heading in exactly the right direction for the culture's purposes. The exquisitely engineered collision made both alterations at once. So Pittance spun a little quicker to provide a more powerful hint of artificial gravity inside, and its course was altered just a fraction to deflect it from a star system it would otherwise have drifted through in five and a half thousand years or so. A number of giant displacer units were set within the fabric of Pittance, and the warships were safely displaced, one at a time, into the giant spaces the GSV had created. Lastly, a frightening variety in number of sensory and weapon systems had been emplaced, camouflaged on the surface of Pittance, and buried deep underneath it, while a cloud of tiny, dark, almost invisible but apocalyptically powerful devices were placed in orbit about the slowly tumbling mass, also to watch for unwelcome guests and, if necessary, welcome them with destruction. Its work finished, the uninvited guest had departed, taking with it most of the iron mined from Pittance's interior. It left behind a world that, save for that plausible-looking extra crater, seemed untouched. Even its overall mass was almost exactly as it had been before, again minus a little to allow for the collision it had suffered, the debris of which was allowed to drift as the laws of gravity dictated, most of it sailing like lazy shrapnel spinning into space, but a little of it captured by the tiny world's weak gravitational field, drifting along with it, and so, incidentally, providing perfect cover for the cloud of black-body sentry devices. Watching over pittance from near its centre was its own quiet mind, carefully designed to enjoy the quiet life and to take a subdued, passive pride in the feeling of containing and jealously guarding an almost incalculable amount of stored, latent, preferably never to be used, power. The rarefied, specialist minds in the warships themselves had been consulted like the rest on their fate those five hundred years ago. Those in storage at Pittance had been of the persuasion that preferred to sleep until they might be needed, and been prepared to accept that their sleep might be very long indeed, before quite probably ending in battle and death. What they had all agreed they would prefer would be to be woken only as a prelude to joining the culture's ultimate sublimation, if and when that became the society's choice. Until then, they would be content to slumber in their dark halls, the war gods of past wrath, implicitly guarding the peace of the present and the security of the future. Meanwhile, the mind of pittance watched over them, and looked out into the resounding silence and the sun-freckled darkness of the spaces between the stars, forever content and ineffably satisfied with the absence of anything remotely interesting happening. Pittance was a very safe place then, and Gestra Ishmetit liked safe places. 
It was a very lonely place, and Gestra Ismatid had always craved loneliness. It was at once a very important place, and a place that almost nobody knew or cared about, or indeed probably ever would. And that also suited Gestra Ismatid quite perfectly, because he was a strange creature, and accepted that he was. Tall, adolescently gawky, and awkward despite his two hundred years, Gestra felt he had been an outsider all his life. He'd tried physical alteration. He'd been quite handsome for a while. He'd tried being female. She'd been quite pretty, she'd been told. He'd tried moving away from where he'd been brought up. He'd moved half the galaxy away to an orbital quite different but every bit as pleasant as his home. And he'd tried a life lived a dream. He'd been a merman prince in a water-filled spaceship fighting an evil machine hive mind, and, according to the scenario, was supposed to woo the warrior princess of another clan. But in all the things he'd tried, he had never felt anything else than awkward. Being handsome was worse than being gangly and bumbling, because his body felt like a lie he was wearing. Being a woman was the same, and somehow embarrassing as well, as though it was somebody else's body he had kidnapped from inside. Moving away just left him terrified of having to explain to people why he'd wanted to leave home in the first place, and living in a dream scenario all day and night just felt wrong. He had a horror of immersing himself in that virtual world as completely as his merman did in his watery realm, and thus losing hold of what he felt was a tenuous grip on reality at the best of times. And so he'd lived the scenario with a nagging sensation that he was just a pet fish in somebody else's fish tank, swimming in circles through the petrified ruins of sunken castles. In the end, to his mortification, the princess had defected to the machine hive mind. The plain fact was that he didn't like talking to people. He didn't like mixing with them, and he didn't even like thinking about them individually. The best he could manage was when he was well away from people. Then he could feel a not unpleasant craving for their company as a whole, a craving that quite vanished to be replaced by stomach-churning dread the instant it looked like being satisfied. Geistra Ismetit was a freak. Despite being born to the most ordinary and healthy of mothers, and an equally ordinary father, in the most ordinary of families on the most ordinary of orbitals, and having the most ordinary of upbringings, an accident of birth, or some all but impossible conjunction of disposition and upbringing, had left him the sort of person the cultures carefully meddled with genes virtually never threw up. A genuine misfit something even rarer in the culture than a baby born physically deformed. But, whereas it was perfectly simple to replace or regrow a stunted limb or a misshapen face, it was a different matter when the oddness lay inside. A fact Geistra had always accepted with an equanimity he sometimes suspected people regarded as even more freakish than his original almost pathological shyness. Why didn't he just have the condition treated? His relations and few acquaintances asked. Why didn't he ask to remain as much himself as possible, yet with this strange aberrancy removed, expunged? It might not be easy, but it would be painless. Probably it could be done in his sleep. He'd remember nothing about it, and when he woke up, he could live a normal life. He came to the attention of AIs, drones, humans, and minds that took an interest in that sort of thing. Soon they were queuing up to treat him. He was a challenge. He became so frightened by the, by turns, kind, cheery, cajoling, brusque, or just plain plaintive entreaties to talk to him, counsel him, explain the merits of their various treatments and courses to him, that he stopped answering his terminal, and practically became a hermit in a summer house in his family's estate, unable to explain that, despite it all, indeed, exactly because of all his previous attempts to integrate with the rest of society and what he had learned about himself through them, he wanted to be who he was, not the person he would become if he lost the one trait that distinguished him from everybody else, no matter how perverse that decision seemed to others. In the end, it had taken the intervention of the hub mind of his home orbital to come up with a solution. A drone from contact had come to speak to him one day. He'd always found it easier talking to drones rather than humans, and this drone had been somehow particularly businesslike, but unconcernedly charming as well, and after probably the longest conversation with anybody Gestra had ever had, it had offered him a variety of posts where he could be alone. He had chosen the position where he could be most alone and most lonely, where he could happily yearn for the human contact he knew was the one thing he was incapable of appreciating. It was, in the end, a sinecure. 
It had been explained from the beginning that he would not really have anything to do on pittance. He would simply be there, a symbolic human presence amongst the mass of quiescent weapons, a witness to the mind's silent sentinel ship over the sleeping machines. Gestra Ishmetid had been perfectly happy with that lack of responsibility too, and had now been resident on pittance for one and a half centuries, had not once left to go anywhere else, had not received a single visitor in all that time, and had never felt anything less than content. Some days he even felt happy. The ships were arranged in lines and rows, sixty-four at a time, in the series of huge dark spaces. Those great halls were kept cold and in vacuum. But Gestra had discovered that if he found some rubbish from his quarters and kept it warm in a gelfield sack, and then set it down on the chill floor of one of the hangars and blew oxygen over it from a pressurised tank, it could be made to burn. Quite a satisfactory little fire could be got going, flaring white and yellow in the breath of gas and producing a quickly dispersing cloud of smoke and soot. He had found that by adjusting the flow of oxygen and directing it through a nozzle he had designed and made himself, he could produce a fierce blaze, a dull red glow, or any state of conflagration in between. He knew the mind didn't like him doing this, but it amused him, and it was almost the only thing he did which annoyed it. Besides, the mind had grudgingly admitted both that the amount of heat produced was too small ever to leak through the eighty kilometres of iron to show up on the surface of pittance, and that, ultimately, the waste products of the combustion would be recovered and recycled. So Gaistra felt free to indulge himself with a clear conscience every few months or so. Today's fire was composed of some old wall hangings he'd grown tired of, some vegetable scraps from past meals, and tiny bits and pieces of wood. The wooden scraps were produced by his hobby, which was constructing one in one twenty-eighth scale models of ancient sailing ships. He had drained the swimming pool in his quarters and turned it into a miniature forestry plantation and farm, using some of the biomass the mind and he had been provided with. Tiny trees grew there, which he cut down, and sliced into little planks, and turned on lathes to produce all the masts, spars, decks, and other wooden parts the sea ships required. Other bonsai plants in the forest provided long fibres, which he teased and twisted and coiled into thread, and string-thin ropes to make halyards and sheets. Different plants let him create still thinner fibres, which he wove into sails on infinitesimal looms he had also constructed himself. The iron and steel parts were made from material scraped from the iron walls of pittance itself. He smelted the metal in a miniature furnace to rid it of the last traces of impurities, and either flattened it in a tiny hand-turned rolling mill, cast it using wax and talc-like fines, or turned it on microscopic lathes. Another furnace fused sand, taken from the beach, which had been part of the swimming pool, to make wafer-thin sheets of glass for portholes and skylights. Yet more of the life support system's biomass was used to produce pitch and oils, which corked the hull and greased the little winches, derricks and other pieces of machinery. His most precious commodity was brass, which he had to pair from an antique telescope his mother had given him, with some ironic comment he had long chosen to forget when he'd announced his decision to leave for pittance. His mother was herself stalled now. One of his great-grand-nieces had sent him a letter. It had taken him ten years to make the tiny machines to make the ships, and then making each ship occupied another twenty years of his time. He had constructed six vessels so far, each slightly larger and better made than the one before. He had almost completed a seventh, with just the sails to finish and sew. The scraps of wood he was burning were the last of its offcuts and compacted sawdust. The little fire burned well enough. He let it blaze and looked around. His breath sounded loud in his suit as he lifted his head to gaze around the dark space. The sixty-four ships stored in this hall were gangster-class rapid offensive units, slim segmented cylinders over two hundred metres tall and fifty in diameter. The tiny glow from the fire was lost to normal sight amongst the spire-like heights of the ships. He had to press the control surfaces on the forearm of the ancient spacesuit to intensify the image displayed on the visor screen in front of him. The ships looked like they'd been tattooed. Their hulls were covered in a bewildering swirl of patterns upon patterns upon patterns, a fractal welter of colours, designs and textures that saturated their every square millimetre. He had seen this a hundred times before but it never failed to fascinate and amaze him. On a few occasions, he had floated up to some of the ships and touched their skins, 
and even through the thickness of the gloves on the millennium-old suit he had felt the roughened surface whirled and raised and encrusted beneath. He had looked closely, then more closely still, using the suit's lights and the magnification on the visor screen to peer into the gaudy display in front of him, and found himself becoming lost within concentric layers of complexity and design. Finally, the suit was using electrons to scan the surface and imposing false colours on the surfaces displayed, and still the complexity went on, down and down to the atomic level. He had pulled back out through the layers and levels of motifs, figures, mandalas and fronds, his head buzzing with the extravagant, numbing complexity of it all. Gestra Ismetid remembered seeing screenshots of warships. They had been whatever colour they wanted to be, usually perfectly black or perfectly reflecting when they were not hidden by a hologram of the view straight through them. But he could not recall ever having seen such odd designs upon them. He had consulted the mine's archives. Sure enough, the ships had been ordinary, plain-hulled craft when they had flown here. He asked the mind why the ships had become decorated so, writing to it on the display of his terminal, as he always did when he wanted to communicate. Why ships tattooed look? The mind had replied, Think of it as a form of armour, Gestra. And that was all he could get out of it. He decided he would have to be content to remain puzzled. The little fire sent quivering veins of dim light into the hollow shadows around the enigmatic towers of the dazzlingly patterned ships. The only sound was his breathing. He felt wonderfully alone here. Even the mind couldn't communicate with him here as long as he kept the suit's communicator turned off. Here was perfect. Here was total and complete loneliness. Here was peace and quiet and a fire in the vacuum. He lowered his gaze again towards the embers. Something glinted near the floor of the hall, a couple of kilometres away. His heart seemed to freeze. The thing glinted again. Whatever it was, it was coming closer. He turned the suit communicator on with a shaking hand. Before his quivering fingers could tap in a question to the mind, the display on his visor screen lit up. Gestra. We are to be visited. Please return to your quarters. He stared at the text, his eyes wide, his heart thudding in his chest, his mind reeling. The glowing letters stayed where they were. They added up to the same thing. They would not go away. He inspected each one in turn, looking for mistakes, desperately trying to make some different kind of sense from them. But they kept repeating the same sentence. They kept meaning the same thing. Visit it, he thought. Visit it? Visit it? Visit it? He felt terror for the first time in one and a half centuries. The drone which had glinted in the shadows, which the mind had sent to summon him because his suit communicator had been turned off, had to carry the man back to his quarters. He was shaking so much. It had picked up the oxygen cylinder, too, turning it off. Behind it, the fire went on glowing faintly for a few seconds in the darkness. Then, even that baleful glimmer succumbed to the empty coldness, and it winked out. Part 5 Kiss the Blade Chapter 1 the explorer ship, break even of the Stargazer Clan's fifth fleet, part of the Zetetica Lench, looped slowly around the outer limit of the comet cloud of the star system Tremesia One of Two, scanning beams briefly touching on as many of the dark, frozen bodies as it could, searching for its lost sister vessel. The double sun system was relatively poor in comets. There were only a hundred billion of them. However, Many of them had orbits well outside the ecliptic, and that helped to make the search every bit as difficult as it would have been with a greater number of comet nuclei, but in a more planar cloud. Even so, it was impossible to check all of them. Ten thousand ships would have been required to thoroughly check every single sensor trace in the comet cloud to make sure that one of them was not a stricken ship, and the best the break-even could do was briefly fasten its gaze on the most likely-looking candidates. Just doing that bare minimum would take a full day for this system alone, and it had another nine stars allocated to it as prime possibilities, plus another eighty less likely solar systems. 
The other six vessels of the Fifth Fleet had similar schedules, similar allocations of stellar systems to attempt to search. Elentia ships send routine location and status reports back to responsible and reliable habitat, facility or course scheduled craft every 16 standard days. The Peace Makes Plenty had signalled safely back to the Elentia Embassy on Tyr, along with the other seven ships of the fleet, 64 days after they'd all left the habitat. Day 80 had come, and only seven had reported in. The others immediately stopped heading any further away, if that was the course they'd been set on. Four days later, still with no word and with no sign of anybody else having heard anything, the seven remaining ships of the Fifth Fleet set their courses to converge on the last known position of the missing ship and accelerated to their maximum speed. The first of them had arrived in the general volume where the Peace Makes Plenty ought to be five days later. The last one appeared another twelve days after that. They had to assume that the ship they were looking for had not travelled at that sort of speed since it had last signalled. They had to assume that it had been cruising, even loitering amongst the systems it had been investigating. They had to assume that it was somewhere within a stellar system, small nebula or gas cloud in the first place, and they had to assume that it was not deliberately trying to hide from them, or that somebody else was not deliberately trying to hide it from them. The stars themselves were relatively easy to check. Microscopic as it might be compared to the average sun, a half-million-ton ship containing a few tons of antimatter and a variety of highly exotic materials falling into a star left a tiny but distinct and unmistakable flash behind it, and usually a mark on the stellar surface that lasted for days at least. One loop round the star could tell you if that kind of disaster had befallen a missing craft. Small, solid planets were easy too, unless a ship was deliberately hiding or being hidden, which of course was perfectly possible in such situations, and considerably more likely than a ship suffering some natural disaster or terminal technical fault. Large, gaseous planets presented a bigger challenge. Asteroid belts where they existed could pose real problems, and comet clouds were a nightmare. In the vast majority of solar systems, the spaces between the inner system and the comet cloud were easy to search for big, obvious things, and pointless to search for small things or anything trying to hide. Interstellar space was the same, but much worse. Unless something was trying to signal you from out there, you could more or less forget about finding anything smaller than a planet. The break-even and its crew, like the rest of the fleet, the clan and the Alench, had no illusions about the likelihood of success their search offered. They were doing it because you had to do something, because there was always just a chance, no matter how remote, that their sister ship was somewhere findable and obvious, orbiting a planet, sitting in a one of six stabile round a big planet's orbit, and you wouldn't be able to live with yourself if you took the cold statistical view that there was next to zero hope of finding the ship intact, and then later discovered it had been there all along, savable at the time, but later lost because nobody could be bothered to hope and act against the odds. Still, the statistics did not make optimistic reading, indicating that the whole task was as close to being impossible as made little difference, and there was a morbid, depressing quality about such searches, almost as though they were more a kind of vigil for the dead, part of a funeral ceremony than a practical attempt to look for the missing. The days went by. The ships, aware that whatever had befallen the Peace Makes Plenty might as easily happen to them, signalled their locations to each other every few hours. Sixteen days after the first ship had started searching, and hundreds of investigated star systems later, the quest began to be wound down. Over the next few days, five of the ships returned to the other parts of the upper leaf spiral they had been exploring, while two remained behind in the volume the Peace Makes Plenty ought still to be in, somewhere carrying out more thorough explorations of the star systems as part of their normal mission profile, but always hoping that their missing sister ship might turn up, or at the very least that they might uncover some fragment of evidence, some hint of what had happened to their missing sibling. The fact that the ship had disappeared would not be reported outside the fleet for another sixteen days. The Stargazer clan would pass the sad news on to the rest of the Alench eight days subsequently, and the outside galaxy would be informed, if it cared, another month after that. The Alench looked after their own, and kept themselves to themselves as well. The break-even powered away from the last stellar system it had investigated, leaving the red giant astern with a kind of dismal relief. 
It was not one of the two craft who'd stay to continue the scaled-down search. It was heading back to the volume where it had been before the Peacemakes Plenty had gone missing. It kept all its senses sweeping on full scan as it moved away from the giant sun, through the orbits of two small cold planets, and further out, the dark, gelid bodies of the comet nuclei. Its course took it directly towards the next nearest star. On the way, it swept interstellar space with its sensors, too, still hoping, still half-dreading, but nothing turned up. Esperi's single, dim red globe fell away astern, like an ember cooling to ash in the freezing night. A few hours later, the ship was out of the volume altogether, heading out down spinward back to its allotted crop of distant, anonymous stars. Chapter 2 Tight Beam M32, Tra Point at N4.28.860.0446 From GSV, Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival V, to Eccentric, Shoot Them Later I think I've discovered something. Attached are course schedules for the steely glint and no fixed abode. Diaglis attached. The movements of the not invented here can only be guessed at. Note that both alter within hours of each other for no given reason, nineteen days ago. The GCU, fate amenable to change, which discovered the accession, also made a sudden and acute course change nineteen days ago. A new heading which took it almost straight to the accession. Then there is a report from the GCU, reasonable excuse, charged with oversight of our semi-detached friend, the GCU, Grey Area, that the ship left its most recent place of interest two days ago and was last detected heading in the direction of the lower leaf swirl, possibly tear. Tight beam M32 Tra point at N4.28.860.2426 From Eccentric Shoot Them Later to GSV Anticipation of a New Lover's Arrival V Yes? Do not be obtuse. I am not being obtuse. You are being paranoid. A lot of course schedules have been altered recently thanks to this thing. I'm thinking about finding an excuse to edge in that direction myself. And as you point out yourself, the meat fucker is heading towards the lower swirl, not the upper. There is a certain potential rendezvous implied in that direction. Do I have to spell it out? And the point remains, these are the only three schedules which change at the same point. They alter over the course of five hours, hardly a point. And even so, what if they do? And what's so special about nineteen or even nineteen two days ago? Stuttered tight point M32. It does not worry you that there might be a conspiracy in the highest levels of a contact SC committee. I am suggesting that there may be prior knowledge here, that some tip or clue was received by one of our colleagues which was not passed on to anybody else. That is what is so special about 19 days ago. It is less than 57 days ago when whatever took place in the vicinity of the accession appears to have occurred. Yes, yes, yes. But so what? My dear ship, which of us has not taken part in some scheme, some ruse or secret plan, some stratagem or diversion, sometimes of quite a sizable and labyrinthine nature and involving matters of considerable import? They're what makes ordinary life worth living. So some of our chums in the core group may have had a sniff of something interesting in that region. Good for them, I say. Have you never had some clue, some lead, a hint of some potential sport, amusement, jape or focus of contemplation that was certainly worth acting upon, but equally, decidedly, did not merit advertising due to some reservation concerning potential embarrassment, the wish not to seem vain or simply a desire for privacy? Really, I think there is no conspiracy here whatsoever, and that even if there is, it is a benign one. Apart from anything else, there is one question you have not, I believe, addressed. What is the conspiracy for? If it was merely a couple of minds getting wind of something odd in the upper leaf spiral and finessing a search there, are they not simply to be congratulated? But there has been nothing this important before. This is perhaps our first real OCP, and we may not be up to the challenge it represents. Meat, it makes me ashamed. I just find this all so... distressing. For millennia, we have congratulated ourselves on our wisdom and maturity, and reveled in our freedom from baser drives and from the ignobility of thought and action that desperation born of indigence produces. My fear, my terror, 
is that our freedom from material concern has blinded us to our true underlying nature. We have been good because we have never needed to make the choice between that and anything else. Altruism has been imposed upon us. Now, suddenly, we are presented with something we cannot manufacture or simulate, something which is to us as precious metals or stones or just to other lands were to ancient monarchs, and we may find that we are prepared to cheat and lie and scheme and plot like any bloody tyrant and contemplate adopting any behaviour, however reprehensible, so that we may grab this prize. It is as if we have been children until this point, playing without care and dressing in but not filling adult clothes, blithely assuming that when we are grown we shall behave as we have done in the headlong, heedless innocence that has been our life so far. But, my dear friend, none of this has happened yet. Have you not carried out the projections? I took your advice to spend more time in metamathical pursuits, modelling the likely course of events, divining the shape of the future. The results worry me. What I feel myself worries me. I wonder what we may stop at, what we may not stop at to attain the prize this accession may offer. I meant spend more time enjoying yourself, as you well know. Besides, simulations, abstractions, projections, these are only themselves, not the reality of what they claim to represent. Attend to the actuality of events. We have a fascinating phenomenon before us, and we are taking all reasonable precautions as we deal or prepare to deal with it. Some of our colleagues show laudable enterprise and initiative, while others, ourselves, exhibit caution, just as commendable as, and in some complementary to, their ambition. What is there to fear but the wild imaginings which may well be the result of looking too far beyond the scale of relevance? I suppose so. Perhaps it is me. Certainly I see worrying signs everywhere. I dare say it must be me. I may still make some further inquiries, but I take your point. Make your inquiries if you must, but frankly, I think it is this constant urge to inquire that causes you such pain. When one is able to scrutinise a subject as closely as we are, and do so with the cross-referential capacity we possess, then the closer one looks into anything, the more coincidences one finds, perfectly innocent though they may be. What is the point of inquiring at such depth that one loses sight of the sunlit surface? Lay up that magnified glass and take up thy drink glass, my friend. Slip off the academic gown and on with the antic pants. I thank you for your advice. I am reassured somewhat. I shall consider what you say. Do keep in touch. Farewell for now. Started tight point M32 Tra point at N4.28.862.3465 From Eccentric, Shoot Them Later to LSV Serious Callers Only The anticipation of a new lover's arrival was in touch again, signal file attached. I still think it could be one of them. Stuttered type point M32 Tra point at N4.28.862.3980 from LSV Serious Callers Only to Eccentric, shoot them later. And I still think you should let it in with us. It almost certainly now suspects you were part of the conspiracy. I have an image to maintain, and I would point out that we are still very much in the dark. We are not yet sure there is a conspiracy beyond the kind of normal, outsmarting, out nonsense in which all of us indulge from time to time. What purpose would formally extending the circumference of our concern serve for now? Our sleuth is still behaving as though it is one of us, but it knows nothing of our scepticism. We have naught to gain by bringing it aboard at present. If it is genuine, it will apply itself to our purpose, and if discovered, the shadow of its guilt will not fall across us. If it is a test, then it, they, may decide to bait us with more information of genuine interest, delivered at no cost to our virtue. Are we agreed? Have I convinced you? Anyway, enough of that. Have we yet a plan? What was the result of your own investigations? Frustratingly vague. An exhaustive search has thrown up one remote possibility, but it remains an improbability predicated upon an uncertainty. Pretty tell. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you understand results by our communicating with our mutual friend? Why, 
that we are allowed to share in its inimitable objectivity. What else? That is the general volume of my concern. I'll say no more. What? Don't be ridiculous. Elaborate. No. You know what you said to our unwitting fellow in suspicion about not advertising lines of inquiry which might end in embarrassment? Unfair. After all, I've shared with you. Yes, including the exciting opportunity to get involved with this in the first place. Thanks a lot. Cast that up to me again, would you? I've said I'm sorry. We should never said anything now. Yes. But if the anticipation of a new lover's arrival finds out who passed on the information which led to the fate amenable to change of search in the first place, I know, I know. Look, I'm doing all I can. I have requested a sympathetic ship to divert itself to pittance, just in case. That's where my prognostications indicate a site for possible future mischief. Death, if it comes to that. Chapter Three. The twittering bat ball bounced off the center of the high-scoring wall and flew straight towards Gaina Hafoen. The creature's tiny clipped wings paddled frantically at the atmosphere as it tried to right itself and flee. One of its stumpy wings was ragged, perhaps even broken. It started to curve away as it approached the human. He took a good backswing with his bat and slammed it into the little creature, sending it yelping and spinning away. He had intended it to head for the high-scoring wall, but the stroke had been slightly off target, resulting in the spin he had given the thing and its course towards the corner between the high-scoring wall and the right-side forfeit baffle. Shit, he thought. The bat ball thrashed at the atmosphere and curved further towards the forfeit battle. Five Tide darted forward and, with a flip of the bat strapped to one of his front limbs and a resounding ha, snapped the bat ball into the centre of the high-scoring wall again. It thudded against the randle and ricocheted off at an angle Gaynor Hafoen knew he wasn't going to be able to intercept. He lunged at it anyway, but the creature sailed slackly past, half a meter away from his outstretched bat. He fell to the floor and rolled, feeling the jailfield suit tensing and squeezing him as it absorbed the shock. He picked himself up to a sitting position and looked around. He was breathing hard and his heart was hammering. Playing this sort of game against another human would have been no joke in a front of gravity. Playing it against an affronter, even one with half his tentacles sportingly tied round its back, was even harder work. Hopeless, Five Tide roared, crossing towards where the bat ball lay motionless near the back of the court. As he passed the human, he flicked a tentacle under Gaynor Hafoen's chin and levered him up. The gesture was almost certainly meant to be helpful, but it would have broken the average unprotected human neck. Gaynor Hafoen merely found himself propelled off the floor like a rock out of a catapult and sent sailing towards the ceiling of the court, arms flailing. Idiot, the suit said, as Gaynor Hafoen reached the top of his trajectory. He assumed the suit was talking about Five Tide. A tentacle wrapped itself round his waist like a whip. Oops, Five Tide said, and lowered him safely to the floor with surprising gentleness. Sorry about that, Gaynor Hafoen, he yelled. You know what they say? It's a wise lad notices in strength when he's having fun. <laughs> he patted the human relatively gently on the head, then continued over to the motionless body of the bat ball. He prodded it with the bat. Don't breathe them like they used to, he said, then made a noise Gaynor Hafoen had learned to interpret as a sigh. Tentacle scumbag fuckwit, said the suit. Suit, really, he thought, amused. Well... The suit was not in the best of moods. He and it were spending a lot more time together. The suit didn't trust the containment around Gaynor Hafoen's quarters in the ship, and had insisted that the human keep it on, even when he was asleep. Gaynor Hafoen had grumbled, but not overmuch. There were too many funny smells in his quarters for him to have complete faith in the affront's attempt at a human life support system. The most the gelfield suit would let him do at night was peel aside its head section so that he could sleep with his face exposed, that way, even if his environment collapsed suddenly and totally, the suit would be able to protect him. Five Tide flicked the bat ball up at the end of his bat and flicked it over the transparent wall of the court into the spectators' seats. Then he banged on the wall, waking the snoozing form of the gelding on the far side. Wake up, you dozy pellet! Five Tide bellowed. Another bat ball, dolt! The neutered affronter adolescent jumped to its tentacle tips, its eye stalks waving around wildly. Then it reached into a small cage by its side with one limb, while another tentacle opened the door in the court wall. 
It picked one bat ball out of the dozen or so tied up in the cage and handed the squirming creature to the adult affronter, who accepted it, then jerked forward and hissed at the adolescent, making it flinch. It closed the door quickly. Ha! Five Tide shouted, putting the trust wriggling bat ball to his forebeak and tearing the cord that had held it immobile. Another game, Gainer Hoffern? Five Tide spat the short length of cord away and patted the bat ball up and down in one of his limbs while the little animal flexed its abbreviated wings. Why not? Gainer Hoffern said coolly. He was exhausted, but he wasn't going to let Five Tide know. Nine nil to me, I believe, the affronter said, holding the bat ball up to his eyes. I know, he said. Let's make it more interesting. He put the struggling bat ball into the tip of his forebeak. His eye stalks bent forward and down to look at what he was doing. There was a delicate movement around Five Tide's beak fronds and a tiny screech accompanied by a faint pop. Five Tide withdrew the creature from his beak and inspected it, apparently satisfied. There, he said. Always good for a change, playing with a blinded one. He threw the writhing, mewling creature to gain a huffoon. Your serve, I believe. The culture had a problem with the affront. The affront had a problem with the culture, too, for that matter. But it was a pretty plain thing in comparison. The affront's problem with the culture was simply that the older civilization stopped it doing all the things it wanted to do. The culture's problem with the affront was like an itch they couldn't scratch. The culture's problem with the affront was that the affront existed at all, and the culture couldn't in all conscience do anything about it. The problem stemmed from an accident of galactic topography and a combination of bad luck and bad timing. The fuzzily specified region, which had given rise to the various species that had eventually made up the culture, had been on the far side of the galaxy from the affront home planet, and contacts between the culture and the affront had been unusually sparse for a long time for a variety of frankly banal reasons. By the time the culture came to know the affront better, shortly after the long distraction of the Adiran War, the affront were a rapidly developing and swiftly maturing species, and, short of another war, there was no practical way of quickly changing either their nature or behaviour. Some culture minds had argued at the time that a quick war against the affront was exactly the right course of action, but even as they'd started setting out their case, they'd known it was already lost. For all that the culture was just then at a peak of military power it had never expected to attain at the start of that long and terrible conflict, just so, there was a corresponding determination at all levels that, the task of stopping the Adirans' relentless expansion having been accomplished, the culture would neither need nor seek to achieve such a martial zenith again. Even while the minds concerned had been contending that a single abrupt and crushing blow would benefit all concerned, including the affront, not just ultimately but soon, the culture's warships were being stood down deactivated, componented, stored and demilitarized by the tens of thousands, while its trillions of citizens were congratulating themselves on a job well done, and returning with the relish of the truly peace-loving to the uninhibited enjoyment of all the recreational wonders the resolutely hedonism-focused society of the culture had to offer. There had probably never been a less propitious time for arguing that more fighting was a good idea, and the argument duly founded, though the problem remained. Part of the problem was that the affront had the disturbing habit of treating every other species they encountered with either total suspicion or amused contempt, depending almost entirely on whether that civilization was ahead of or behind them in technological development. There had been one developed species, the Padrisal, in that same volume of the galaxy, which had been sufficiently like the affront in terms of evolutionary background and physical appearance to be treated almost as friends by the affront, and which yet had a moral outlook similar enough to the cultures to consider it worth the effort of chaperoning the affront with the other local species, and, to their eternal credit, the Padrisal had been doggedly endeavouring to nudge the affront into something remotely resembling decent behaviour for more centuries than they cared to remember or admit. It was the Padrisal who had given the affront their name. Originally, the affront had called themselves after their homeworld, Isoril. Calling them the affront following an episode involving a Padrasal trade mission to Israel, which the recipients had treated more as a food parcel, had been most decidedly intended as an insult. 
But the Isserillians, as they then were, thought that a front sounded much better, and had steadfastly refused to drop their new name, even after they had formed their loose patron-stroke-protégé alliance with the Padrasal. However, a century or so after the end of the Adiran War, the Padrasal had had what the culture regarded as the gross bad manners to suddenly sublime off into advanced elderhood at just the wrong time, leaving their less mature charges joyfully off the leash, and, both snapping at the heels of the local members of the culture's great, long, straggling civilizational caravan wending its way towards progress, whether they went wittingly or not, and positively savaging several of the even less well-developed neighbouring species, which for their own good nobody else had yet thought fit to contact. Suggestions by a few of the more cynical culture minds that the Padrasal decision to hit the hyperspace button and go for full don't give a damn any more godhead had been caused partially if not principally by their frustration and revulsion at the incorrigible ghastliness of a front nature had never been either fully accepted or convincingly refuted. Whatever. In the end, with a deal of arm and tentacle twisting, some deftly managed suitable technology donation, through what the Affront Intelligence Regiment still gleefully but naively thought was some really neat high-tech theft on their part, the occasional instance of knocking heads together, or whatever anatomical feature was considered appropriate, and a hefty amount of naked bribery, woefully inelegant to the refined intellect of the average culture mind, their tastes generally ran to far more rarefied forms of chicanery, but undeniably effective, the affront had, kicking and screaming at times admittedly, finally been more or less persuaded to join the great commonality of the galactic meta-civilization. They had agreed to abide by its rules almost all the time, and had grudgingly accepted that other beings beside themselves might have rights, or at least tolerably excusable desires, such as those concerning life, liberty, self-determination, and so on, which occasionally might even override the self-evidently perfectly natural, demonstrably just, and indeed arguably even sacred affront of prerogative to go wherever they wanted and do whatever they damn well pleased, preferably while having a bit of fun with the locals at the same time. All that, however, represented only a partial solution to the least vexing part of the problem. If the affront had been simply one more expansionist species of callously immature but technologically localized adventurers with bad contact manners, the problem they represented to the culture would have subsided to the sort of level that would have gone more or less unnoticed. They would have become just another part of the general clutter of inventively obdurate species struggling to express themselves in the vast emptiness that was the galaxy. The problem was rooted deeper, however. It went back further. It was more intrinsic. The problem was that the affront had spent uncounted millennia, long before they'd even got off their own fog-bound moon planet, tinkering with and carefully altering the flora and, especially, the fauna of that environment. They had discovered, at a relatively early point in their development, how to change the genetic makeup of both their own inheritance, which almost by definition needed little further amendment given their manifest superiority, and that of the creatures with whom they shared their homeworld. Those creatures had all, accordingly, been amended as the affront saw fit for their own amusement and delight. The result was what one culture mind had described as a kind of self-perpetuating, never-ending holocaust of pain and fear. Affront as society rested on a huge base of ruthlessly exploited juvenile geldings and a subclass of oppressed females who, unless born to the highest families, and not always even then, could count themselves lucky if they were only raped by the males from their own tribe. It was generally regarded as significant, within the culture of nowhere else, that one of the few aspects of their own genetic inheritance with which the affront had deemed it desirable to meddle had been in the matter of making the act of sex a somewhat less pleasurable and considerably more painful act for their females than their basic genetic legacy required, the better, it was claimed, to further the considered good of the species rather than the impetuously selfish pleasure of the individual. When an affronter went hunting for the artificially fattened tree hurdlers, limb croppers, paralyse or skin strippers that were their favoured prey, it was in a sore chariot, pushed by the animals called swiftwings, which lived in a state of perpetual dread, 
Their nervous systems and pheromone receptors painstakingly tuned to react with ever-increasing levels of dread and the urge to escape as their masters became more and more excited and so exuded more of the relevant odors. The hunted animals themselves were artificially terrified as well, just by the very appearance of the affronters, and so driven to ever more desperate maneuvers in their frantic urge to escape. When an affronter's skin was cleaned, it was by the small animals called zeisters, whose diligence had been vastly improved by giving them such a frenetic hunger for an affronter's dead skin cells that, unless they were overcome by exhaustion, they were prone to bloating themselves literally to the point of bursting. Even the affronts, standard domesticated food animals, had long since been declared as tasting much more interesting when they betrayed the signs of having been severely stressed, and so had also been altered to such a pitch of highly strung anxiety, and husbanded in conditions diligently contrived to intensify the effect, that they inevitably produced what any affronter worth his methylacetylene would agree was the most inspiringly tasty meat this side of an event horizon. The examples went on. In fact, Reviewing their society, it was more or less impossible to avoid manifestations of the affronter's deliberate, even artistic use of genetic manipulation to produce, through a kind of ebulliently misplaced selfishness, which to them was indistinguishable from genuine altruism, the sort of result it took most societies' paroxysms of self-destructive wretchedness to generate. Hearty, but horrible. That was the affront. Progress through pain! It was an affront to saying. Gaina Hathorn had even heard Five Tide say it. He couldn't recall exactly, but it had probably been followed by a bellowed, Ho, ho, ho! The affront appalled the culture. They appeared so unamendable. Their attitude and their abominable morality seemed so secured against remedy. The culture had offered to provide machines to do the kind of jobs the juvenile Castrati did. But the affront just laughed. Why? They could quite easily build machines of their own, but where was the honour being served by a mere machine? Similarly, the culture's attempts to persuade the affront that there were other ways to control fertility and familial inheritance besides those which relied on the virtual imprisonment, genetic mutilation and organised violation of their females, or to consume vat-grown meat, better of anything than the real thing, or to offer non-sentient versions of their hunting animals, all met with equally derisive, if brusquely good-humoured dismissals. Still, Gaina Hofoen liked them, and had come even to admire them for their vivacity and enthusiasm. He had never really subscribed to the standard culture belief that any form of suffering was intrinsically bad. He accepted that a degree of exploitation was inevitable in a developing culture, and leant towards the school of thought which held that evolution, or at least evolutionary pressures, ought to continue within and around a civilized species, rather than, as the culture had done, choosing to replace evolution with a kind of democratically agreed physiological stasis plus option list, while handing over the real control of one's society to machines. It was not that Gaynor Hofoen hated the culture, or particularly wished it ill in its present form, he was deeply satisfied that he had been born into it, and not some other humanoid species where you suffered, procreated and died, and that was about it. He just didn't feel at home in the culture all the time. It was a motherland he wanted to leave, and yet no, he could always return to if he wanted. He wanted to experience life as an affronter, and not just in some simulation, however accurate. Plus, he wanted to go somewhere the culture had never been, and, well, explore. Neither ambition seemed to him all that much to ask, but he'd been thwarted in both desires until now. He'd thought he detected movement on the affronter side of things before this sleeper business had come up, but now, if all concerned were to be believed, he could more or less have whatever he wanted, no strings attached. He found this suspicious in itself. Special Circumstances was not notorious for its desire to issue blank checks to anyone. He wondered if he was being paranoid, or had just been living with the affront for too long. None of his predecessors had lasted longer than a hundred days, and he'd been here nearly two years already. Either way, he was being cautious. He had asked around. He still had some replies to receive. They should be waiting for him when he arrived at Tyr. But so far, everything seemed to tally. 
He had also asked to speak to a representation of the Desert Class MSV, not invented here, the ship acting as incident coordinator for all this. Again, this ought to happen on Tyr, and he'd looked up the craft's own history in the module's archives and transferred the results to the suit's own AI. The Desert Class had been the first type of general systems vehicle the culture had constructed, providing the original template for the very large, fast, self-sufficient ship concept. At three and a bit clicks in length, it was tiny by today's standards. Ships twice its length and eight times its volume were routinely constructed inside GSVs the size of the sleeper service, and the whole class had been demoted to medium systems vehicle status. But it certainly had the distinction of age. The not invented here had been around for nearly two millennia, and boasted a long and interesting career coming as close as the culture's distributed and democratic military command structure had allowed to being in advisory control of several fleets in the course of the Adiran War. It was now in that equivalent of serenely glorious senescence that affected some ancient minds, no longer producing many smaller ships, taking relatively little to do with contacts normal business, and keeping itself relatively sparsely populated. It remained, nevertheless, a full culture ship, it hadn't taken a sabbatical, gone into a retreat, or become an eccentric. Nor had it joined the culture Ulterior, the fairly recently fashionable name for the bits of the culture that had split away and weren't really fully paid up members anymore. All the same, and despite the fact that the archive entry on the old ship was huge, as well as all the naked factual stuff it contained 103 different full-length biographies of the craft, which it would have taken him a couple of years to read— Gaynor Hofoen couldn't help feeling that there was a slight air of mystery about the old ship. It also occurred to him that minds wrote voluminous biographies of each other in order to cover the odd, potentially valuable or embarrassing nugget of truth under a mountain of bullshit. Also included in the archive entries were some fairly wild claims by a few of the smaller, more eccentric news and analysis journals and reviews, some of them one-person outfits, to the effect that the MSV was a member of some shadowy cabal, that it was part of a conspiracy of mostly very old craft, which stepped in to take control of situations which might threaten the culture's cosy proto-imperialist meta-hegemony. Situations which proved beyond all doubt that the so-called normal democratic process of general policy-making was a complete and utter ultra-statist sham, and the humans, and indeed their cousins and fellow dupes in this mind-controlled plot, the drones, had even less power than they thought they had in the culture. There was quite a lot of stuff like that. Gaynor Hofoen read it until his head felt as if it was spinning. Then he stopped. There came a point when, if a conspiracy was that powerful and subtle, it became pointless to worry about it. Whatever. Doubtless the old MSV was not itself in total command of the situation he was allowing himself to be dragged into, but just the tip of the iceberg, representing a collection, if not a cabal, of other interested and experienced minds who'd all be having a say in the immediate reaction to the discovery of this artifact near Esperi. As well as his request for a talk with a personality state of the not invented here, Gaynor Hafoen had sent messages to ships, drones, and people he knew with SC connections asking them if what he'd been told was all true. A few of the nearer ones had got replies to him before he'd left God's whole habitat, each confirming that what they had been told of what he was asking about, which admittedly varied according to how much whatever collection of minds the not invented here was representing had chosen to tell the individuals concerned, the information he'd received looked genuine and the deal he'd been offered sounded good. At any rate, by the time he got to Tyr and received all his replies, he reckoned so many other people and minds not irretrievably complicit with SC would have heard about what he'd been offered, it would become impossible for SC to wriggle out of its deal with him without losing an unthinkable amount of face. He still suspected there was a lot more to this than he was being told, and he had no doubt he was and would continue to be both manipulated and used. But, providing the price they were paying him was right, that didn't bother him, and at least the job itself sounded simple enough. He'd taken the precaution of checking up on the story his uncle had told him about the disappearing trillion-year-old sun and the orbiting artifact. Sure enough, there it was, a semi-mythological story set way back in the archives, one of any number of weird-sounding tales with frustratingly little evidence to back them up. Certainly, nobody seemed able to explain what had happened in this case. 
And, of course, there was nobody around to ask any more, except for the lady he was travelling to talk to. The captain of the good ship Problem Child had indeed been a woman, Zrain Tramau. Honorary contact fleet captain Gart Kepilesa Zrain Enov Tramau, a Fayaf Dam Niskat West, to give her her official title and full name. The archives held her picture. She'd looked proud and capable. A pale, narrow face with close-set eyes, centimetre-short blonde hair and thin lips, but smiling, and with what appeared to him, at least, to be an intelligent brightness to those eyes. He liked the look of her. He'd wondered what it would be like to have been stored for two and a bit millennia, and then be woken up with no body to return to, and a man you'd never seen before talking to you, and trying to steal your soul. He'd stared at the photograph for a while, trying to see behind those clear, blue, mocking eyes. They played another two games of bat ball. Five Tide won those as well. Gaynar Hafoan was quivering with fatigue by the end. Then it was time to freshen up and head for the officer's mess, where there was a full-dress uniform celebration dinner that evening, because it was Commander Kindrum and the Sixth birthday. The carousing went on long into the night. Five Tide taught the humans some obscene songs. Gaynor Huffoen responded in kind. Two Atmosphere Force wing captains had an only semi-serious duel with greater muffs. Much blood, no limbs lost, honor satisfied. And Gaynor Huffoen did a tightrope walk over the commander's table pit while the scratch hounds howled beneath. The suit swore it hadn't contributed to the feat, though he was sure it had steadied him a couple of times. However, he didn't say anything. Around them, the Kiss the Blade and its two escorts powered their way through the spaces between the stars, heading for Tyr Habitat. Chapter 4 Ulva Seish woke up in the best possible way. She surfaced with a languorous slowness through fuzzy layers of luxurious half-dreams and memories of sweetness, sensuality, and sheer carnal bliss— to find it all merging rather splendidly into reality and what was happening right now. She toyed with the idea of pretending she was still asleep, but then he must just have touched exactly the right spot and she couldn't help making a noise and moving and clenching and so she rolled over and took his face in her hands and kissed it. Oh, no, she croaked, laughing. Don't stop. That's a fine way to say good morning. Nearly afternoon the young man breathed. He was called Otiel. He was tall and very dark-skinned, and he had fabulously blonde hair and a voice that could raise bumps on your skin at a hundred metres, or, better still, millimetres. Metaphysics student, swam a lot and free-climbed, the one she'd set her heart on the previous evening, the leg-liker, long, sensitive fingers. Mmm, really? Well, you know, maybe you can say that later. But, meantime, you can just keep right on... What? Ulva Seish jerked to a sitting position, eyes wide open. She slapped the young man's hand away and stared wildly around. She was in what she thought of as her romantic bed. It was more of a chamber, really. A ruched, pavilion-ceilinged five-metre crimson hemisphere filled with billowy bolsters and slinky sheets, which blended into puffy paddings, forming the single wall of the chamber, and which swelled out in places to form various projections, shelves, straps, and little seat-like things. She had other beds, her childhood bed, still stuffed with toys, her just-sleep bed, comfy and surrounded by nocturne plants. A huge, grandly formal and terribly old-fashioned canopied reception bed for when she wanted to receive friends, and an oil bed, which was basically a four-metre sphere of warm oils. You had to put little nose-plug things in, and the air was displaced into you. Not to everybody's taste, sadly, but very erotic. Her neural lace had woken up already with the adrenaline rush. It told her it was half an hour to noon. Shit! She'd thought she'd set an alarm to wake her an hour ago. She'd meant to. Must have slipped her mind due to the fun. Hormonal reprioritization. Well, it happened. What? Otiel said, smiling. He was looking at her oddly, like he was wondering whether this was part of some game. Twinkle in the eye. He reached out for her. Damn, the gravity was still on. She commanded the bed controls to switch to one-tenth G. Sorry, she said, blowing him a kiss as the apparent gravity cut by ninety percent. 
The padding beneath their bodies suddenly had a lot less weight to support. The effect was to produce a very gentle padded pat on the bottom, which was enough to send them both floating fractionally upwards. He looked surprised. It was such a sweet, boyish, innocent expression she almost stayed. But she didn't. She jumped out of the bed, kicking up through the air and raising her arms above her head to dive through the loose gatherings of the chamber's tented ceiling and out into the bedroom beyond, arcing out over the padded platform around the bedchamber and falling gently back into the clutches of its standard gravity. She ran down the curved steps to the bedroom floor and almost bumped into the drone chert line. I know, she yelled, flapping one hand at it. It lifted out of her way, then turned smoothly and followed her across the floor of the bedroom towards the bathroom, its fields formal blue but tinged with a rosy humour. Ulva broke into a run. She'd always liked big rooms. The bedroom one was twenty metres square and five high. One wall was window. It looked out onto a tightly curved landscape of fields and wooded hills dotted with towers and ziggurats. This was interior space one, the central and longest cylinder of a cluster of independently revolving five-kilometre diameter tubes which formed the main living areas in the rock. Anything I can do? the drone asked as Ulva ran into the bathroom. Behind it, there was a shout and then a series of curses as the young man tried to exit the bedchamber in the same way Ulva had and got the gravity transition wrong. The drone turned briefly towards the disturbance, then swiveled back as Ulva's voice floated out through the noise of rushing fluids. Well, you could throw him out. Nicely, mind. What? Ulva screamed. You get me to ditch a luscious new guy after one night, you make me scrap all my engagements for a month, and then you won't even let me take a few pets or a couple of pals? Ulva, can I talk to you alone? Chertline said calmly, rotating to point at a room off the main gallery. No, you can't, she yelled, throwing down the cloak she'd been carrying. Anything you have to say to me, you can damn well say in front of my friends. They were in the outer gallery of Ephetra, a long reception area lined with windows and old paintings. It looked out to the formal gardens and interior space one beyond. A couple of travel tubes waited beyond doors set into the wall full of portraits. She'd told everybody to rendezvous here. She'd missed the noon deadline by over an hour, but there were certain things about one's toilet that simply couldn't be rushed, and, as she told a briefly but fetchingly incandescently furious chert line from her milk bath, if she was really that important to all these top-secret plans, S.C. had no choice but to wait. As a concession to the urgency of the situation, she had left her face unadorned, tied her hair back into a simple bun, and slipped into a conservatively patterned loose pants and jacket combination, even choosing her jewellery for the day had taken no more than five minutes. The gallery had got quite busy. Her mother was here, tall and tousled in a jalaba, three cousins, seven aunts and uncles, about a dozen friends, all house guests and a little bleary-eyed after the graduation party, and a couple of house-slaved drones attempting to control the animals. A brace of tawny, spatelid hunters looking about at everybody and snuffling and slavering with excitement, and her three hooded but still restless alzanes, which kept stretching their wings and giving their piercing, plangent cry. Another drone waited outside the nearest window with Brave, her favourite mount, saddled up and pawing the ground, while the three drones she decided were the minimum she could manage with were taking care of her luggage trunks, which were still appearing from the house lift. A tray floated at her side with breakfast. She just started munching on a chiseling segment when the drone had told her she had to make this journey alone. Chert Line didn't reply in speech. Instead, astonishingly, it spoke through her neural lace. Alva, for pity's sake, this is a secret mission for special circumstances, not a social outing with your girlfriends. And don't secret talk me, Alva hissed through clenched teeth. Grief, that's so rude. Quite right, dear nodded her mother, yawning. A couple of her friends laughed lightly. Chert Line came right up to her until it was almost touching her, and then the next thing she knew, there was a sort of grey cylinder around her in the machine. It stretched from wooden floor to stone-carved ceiling, and it was about a metre and a half in diameter, neatly enclosing her, Chert, and the tray carrying breakfast. She stared at the drone, her mouth open, eyes wide. It had never done anything like this before. Its aura field had disappeared. It hadn't even had the decency to square the field and put the field on a mirror finish. 
At least she could have checked her appearance. Sorry about this, Alva, the machine said. Its voice sounded flat in the narrow cylinder. Alva closed her mouth and prodded the field the drone had slung around them. It was like touching warm stone. Alva, the drone said again, taking one of her hands in a maniple field. I apologize. I ought to have made the point earlier. I just assumed. Well, never mind. I'm supposed to come with you to Tyr, but not anybody else. Your friends have to stay here. But Pace and I always go deep space together. And Clatsley is my new protege. I promised her she could stick around me. I can't just abandon her. Do you have any idea what that could do to her development, to her social life? People might think I've dumped her. Besides, she's got an utterly exquisite older brother. If I... You can't take them, the drone said loudly. They're not included in the invitation. I heard what you said yesterday, you know, Alva said, shaking her head and leaning forward at the drone. Keep it secret. I haven't told them where we're going. That's not the point. When I said don't tell a soul, I meant don't tell a soul you're going, not don't tell a soul exactly where you're going. She laughed, throwing her head back. Chert, real space here. My diary is a public document, hadn't you noticed? There are at least three channels devoted to me, all run by rather desperate young men, admittedly, but nevertheless. I can't change my eye color without anybody on the rock who follows fashion knowing about it within the hour. I can't just disappear. Are you mad? And I don't think the animals can come either, Chertline said smoothly, ignoring her question. The Protira certainly can't. There isn't room on the ship. Isn't room? she roared. What size is this thing? Are you sure it's safe? Warships don't have stables, Alva. It's an ex-warship, she exclaimed, waving her arms around. Ow! She sucked at the knuckle she'd hit against the field cylinder. Sorry, but still. What about my clothes? A cabin full of clothes is perfectly all right, though I don't know for whose benefit you're going to be wearing them. What about when I get to tear? she cried. What about this guy I'm not supposed to fuck? Am I supposed to just wander past him naked? Take two rooms full. Three. Clothes are not a problem, and you can pick up more when you get there. Uh, no, wait a minute. I know how long it takes you to choose new clothes. Just take what you want. Four cabins there. But my friends! Tell you what, I'll show you the space you've got to work with, okay? Oh, okay she said, shaking her head and sighing heavily. The drone fed convincing-looking pictures of the ex-warship's interior into Ulva's brain through the neural lace. She caught her breath. Her eyes were wide when the display stopped. She stared at the drone. The rooms! she exclaimed. The cabins! They're so small! Quite. Still think you want to take your friends? She thought for a second. Yes! she yelled, thumping a fist on the little tray floating at her side. It wobbled, trying not to spill the fruit juice. It'll be cosy. What if you fall out? That stopped her for a moment. She tapped her lips with one finger, frowning into space. She shrugged. I can cut people dead in a travel tube, Chert. I can ostracize people in the same bed. She leant towards the machine again, then glanced round at the grey walls of the field cylinder. I can ostracize people in something this big, she said pointedly, her hands on her hips. She put her head back, narrowed her eyes, and lowered her voice. I could just refuse to go, you know. You could, the machine said with a pronounced sigh. But you'd never get into contact, and S.C. would be forced to try and get a double, a synthetic entity to impersonate this woman on tear. The authorities there wouldn't be amused if they found out. She gazed levelly at the machine for a moment. She sighed and shook her head. Bugger, she breathed, snatching the glass of fruit juice from the floating tray and looking in distaste at where the juice had run down the outside of the glass. I hate this acting adult shit. She knocked the juice back, set the glass back down and licked her lips. Okay, let's go, let's go. The goodbyes took a while. Chert line glowed greyer and greyer with frustration until it turned into a sort of off-black sphere. Then it dropped its aura field altogether and sped out of the nearest opened window. 
It raced around in the air outside for a while. A couple of sonic booms nearly had the mounts bolting. Eventually, though, Ulva had said her farewells, decided to leave all her animals and two trunks of clothes behind, and then, having remained serene in the midst of much hullabaloo and some tears from Clatsley, entered a travel tube with a frostily blue chert line, and was taken to the forward docks and a big, brightly lit hangar, where the psychopath class X rapid offensive unit Frank Exchange of Views was waiting for her. Alva laughed. It looks, she snorted, like a dildo. That's appropriate, Chertline said. Armed, it can fuck solar systems. She remembered when she was a little girl and had stood on a bridge over a gorge in one of the other interior spaces. She had a stone in her hand, and her mother had held her up to the bridge parapet so that she could look over the edge and drop the stone into the water below. She'd held the stone, it was about the same size as her little fist, right up to one eye, and closed her other eye so that the dark stone had blotted out everything else she could see. Then she'd let it go. She and Chert Line stood in the ship's tiny hangar area, surrounded by her cases, bags and trunks, as well as a deal of plain but somehow menacing-looking bits and pieces of military equipment. The way that stone had fallen towards the dark water then, shrinking and shrinking, was very like the way Phage Rock fell silently away from the old warship now. This time, of course, there was no splash. When Phage had entirely disappeared, she switched out of the view her neural lace had imported into her head and turned to the drone, thinking a thought that would have occurred to her a lot earlier, she hoped, if she'd been sober and unimpassioned over the last day. When was this ship sent to Phage Chert, and from where? Why don't you ask it yourself, it said, turning to indicate a small drone approaching over the jumble of equipment. Chert, she asked by the neural lace. Yes. Damn. I was hoping the ship's rep might be a dazzling, handsome young man. Instead, it's something that looks like a... Chert line interrupted. Alva, you are aware that the ship itself acts as exchange hub for these communications. Oh, dear, she thought, and felt herself color as the little drone approached. She smiled broadly at it. No offense, she said. None taken, said the little machine, as it came to a halt in front of her. It had a reedy but reasonably melodious voice. For the record, she said, still smiling and still blushing, I thought you looked a bit like a jewellery box. Could have been worse, tipped in Chertline. You should hear what she calls me sometimes. The little drone snout dipped once in a sort of bow. That's quite all right, Miss Sage, it said. Delighted to meet you. Allow me to welcome you aboard the very fast picket Frank Exchange of Views. Thank you, she said, also nodding slowly. I was just asking my friend where you'd come from and when you'd been dispatched. I didn't come from anywhere except Phage, the ship told her. She felt her eyes widen. Really? Really, it said laconically. And the answer to your next three questions, I'd guess, are, because I was very well hidden, and that's actually quite easy in a conglomeration of matter the size of Phage, getting on for five hundred years, and there are another fifteen like me back home. I trust you are reassured rather than shocked, and that we may rely on your discretion in the future. Oh, golly, absolutely, she said, nodding, and felt half inclined to click her heels and salute. Chapter 5 Dajil had been spending a lot more time with the beasts. She swam with the great fish and the sea of old mammals and reptiles, she donned a flyer suit and cruised high above the sea with her wide wings extended alongside the dirigible creatures in the calm currents of air and the cloud layers. And she donned a full gel field suit with a secondary AG unit and carved her way amongst the poison gases, the acid clouds and the storm bands of the upper atmosphere, surrounded by noxiousness and the ferocious beauty of the ecosystem there. She even spent some time walking in the ship's topside parks, the nature reserves which the sleeper service had possessed, even when it had been a regular, well-behaved GSV and diligent member of the contact section. The parks, complete landscapes with hills, forests, plains, river and lake systems, and the remains of small resort villages and hotels, covered all the great ship's flat top surfaces, and together measured over 800 square kilometres. 
With the humans gone from the ship, there were fairly large populations of land animals in the parklands, including grazers, predators, and scavengers. She'd never really paid any of them much attention. Her interests had always been with the larger, buoyant animals of the fluid environments. But now that they were all likely to suffer the same exile or unconsciousness as the rest, she had started to take a belated, almost guilty interest in them, as though, she thought ruefully, her attention bestowed some special significance on the behaviour she witnessed, or meant anything at all to the creatures concerned. Amorphia did not come for its regular visit. Another couple of days passed. When the Avatar came to her again, she had been swimming with the purple-winged triangular rays in the shallow part of the sea extending beyond the sheer, three-kilometre cliff which was the rear of the craft. Returning, she had taken the flyer which the ship habitually put at her disposal, but asked it to drop her at the top of the scree slope beneath the cliff facing the tower. It was a bright, cold day, and the air tasted sharp. This part of the ship's environment was cycling towards winter. All the trees, save for a few everblues, had lost their leaves, and soon the snows would come. The air was very clear, and from the top of the scree slope she could see the edge islands, thirty kilometres away, out close to where the inner containment field of the ship came down like a wall across the sea. She had scrambled down the scree in small rattles of stones, like dry, fanning rivers of pebbles and dust. She had long ago learned how to use her altered centre of gravity to her advantage in this sort of adventure, and had never yet fallen badly. She got to the bottom, her heart beating hard, her leg muscles warm with the effort expended, and her skin bright with sweat. She walked quickly back through the salt marsh along the path the ship had fashioned for her. The sun line was near setting when she returned to the tower, breathless and still perspiring. She took a shower and was sitting by the log fire the tower had lit for her, letting her hair dry naturally, when Gravius, the black bird, rapped once on the window and then disappeared again. She pulled her robe tighter about her as the tall, dark-dressed figure of Amorphia climbed the stairs and entered the room. Amorphia, she said, tucking her wet hair into the hood of the robe. Hello. Can I get you anything? No. No, thank you, the Avatar said, looking nervously around the circular living room. Dajil indicated a chair while she sat on a couch by the fire. Please. She pulled her legs up underneath her. So, what brings you here today? I... the Avatar began, then stopped and pulled at its lower lip with its fingers. Well, it seems... It started again, then hesitated once more. It took a breath. The time, it said, then stopped, looking confused. The time, Dejil Gillian said. It's... It's come, Amorphia said, and looked ashamed. For the changes you talked about? Yes, the Avatar said, sounding relieved. Yes, for the changes. They have to start now. In fact, they have already begun. The rounding up of the creatures comes first, and the... It looked unsure again and frowned deeply. The... The de-landscaping, it gulped. It tripped up on the next words in its rush to say them. The ungeometry... The ungeomorphologizing... The... The... The pristinization, it said, almost shouting. Dajil smiled trying not to show the alarm she felt. I see, she said slowly. So it is all definitely going to happen? Yes, Amorphia said, breathing heavily. Yes, it is. And I will have to leave the ship? Yes, you will have to leave the ship. I... I'm sorry. The Avatar looked suddenly crestfallen. Where am I to go? Where? Confused. Where are you going to stop? Or where will I be taken? Is it another ship, or a habitat, or an O, or a planet, a rock? What? I... The Avatar frowned again. The ship does not know yet, it said. Things are being worked out. Dajil looked at Amorphia for a while, her hands absently stroking the bulge of her belly under her robe. What is happening, Amorphia? she asked, keeping her voice soft. Why is all this taking place? I can't. There is no need. No need for you to know, 
the Avatar said hesitantly. It looked exasperated and shook its head as though angry, gaze flicking up and around the room as though seeking something. Finally, it looked back at her. I might be able to tell you more later, if you will agree to stay on board until... until a time comes when I can only evacuate you by another vessel. She smiled. That sounds like no great hardship. Does that mean I can stay here longer? Not here. The tower and everything else will have gone. It will mean living inside. Inside the GSV. Dajil shrugged. All right. I suppose I can suffer that. When will that have to happen? In a day or two, Amorphia said. Then the Avatar looked concerned and sat forward on the seat. There. It's possible. It's possible there might be a slightly increased risk to you staying aboard until then. The ship will do all it can to minimize that, of course, but the possibility exists. And it might be... Amorphia's head shook suddenly. I... The ship would like you to remain on board, if possible, until then. It might be... important. Good. The Avatar looked as though it had startled itself. Dajil suddenly recalled having held a tiny baby when it had farted loudly. The look of utter blinking surprise on its face was not dissimilar to that on Amorphia's face now. Dajil choked back an urge to laugh, and it disappeared anyway when, as though prompted by the thought, her child kicked within her. She clamped a hand to her belly. Yes, Amorphia said, nodding vigorously. It would be good if you stayed on board. Good might come of it altogether. It sat, staring at her, panting as though from exertion. Then I had better stay, hadn't I? Dajil said, again keeping her voice steady and calm. Yes, said the Avatar. Yes, I'd appreciate that. Thank you. It stood up suddenly from the seat, as though released by a spring within. Dajil was startled. She almost jumped. I must go now, Amorphia said. Dajil swung her legs out and stood too more slowly. Very well, she said, as the Avatar made its way to the staircase set onto the wall of the tower. I hope you'll tell me more later. Of course, the Avatar mumbled. Then it turned and bowed quickly, and was gone, bootsteps clattering down the stairs. The door slammed some moments later. Dajil Jelian climbed the steps to the parapet of the tower. A breeze caught her robe's hood and spilled her heavy, still-wet hair out and down. The sunline had set, throwing highlights of gold and ruby light across the sky, and turning the starboard horizon into a fuzzy violet border. The wind stiffened. It felt cold. Amorphia was not walking back this evening. After the creature had hurried up the narrow path through the tower's walled garden and out of the land gate, it just rose up into the air without any obvious AG pack or flying suit, and then accelerated through the air in a dark, thin blur, curving through the air to disappear a few seconds later over the edge of the cliff beyond. Dajil looked up. There were tears in her eyes, which annoyed her. She sniffed them back angrily and wiped her cheeks. A few blinks, and the view of the sky was steady and unobscured again. It had indeed already begun. A flight of the dirigible creatures were dropping down from the red speckled clouds above her, heading for the cliffs. Looking closely, she could see the accompanying drones that were their herders. Doubtless, the same scene was being repeated at this moment, both beneath the grey surface of the sea on the far side of the tower as well as above, in the region of furious heat and crushing pressure that was the gas giant environment. The dirigible creatures hesitated in the skies above. In front of them, a whole area of the cliff, perhaps a kilometre across and half that in height, simply folded in on itself in four parcel-neat sections and disappeared backwards into four huge, long, glowing halls. The reassured dirigible creatures were shepherded towards one of the opened bays. Elsewhere, other parts of the cliffs were performing similar tricks. Lights sparkled in the spaces revealed. The entire swathe of grey-brown scree, easily twenty kilometres across and a hundred metres in both depth and height, was folding and tipping in eight gigantic Vs and channeling several billion tons of real enough rock into eight presumably reinforced ship bays, doubtless to undergo whatever transformational process was in store for the sea and the gas giant atmosphere. 
A titanic, bone-resounding tremor shook the ground and rumbled over the tower, while huge clouds of dust leapt billowing into the chilly air as the rock disappeared. Dajil shook her head, her wet hair flapping on the sodden shoulders of her robe, then walked towards the doorway which led to the rest of the tower, intending to retreat there before the clouds of stone dust arrived. The black bird, Gravius, made to settle on her shoulder. She shooed it off, and it landed flapping uproariously on the edge of the opened trapdoor. My tree, it screamed, hopping from leg to leg. My tree! They've... I... My... It's gone! Too bad, she said. The sound of another great tumble of falling rock split the skies. Stay wherever it puts me, she told the bird, if it'll let you. Now get out of my way. But my food for the winter, it's gone. Winter has gone, you stupid bird, she told it. The black bird stopped moving and just perched there, head thrown forward and to one side, right eye staring at her, as though trying to catch some more meaningful echo of what she had just told it. Oh, don't worry, she said. I'm sure you'll be accommodated. She waved it off its perch, and it flapped noisily away. A last earthquake of sound rolled under and over the tower. The woman, Dajiljilian, looked round at the twilight-lit rolling grey dust clouds to see the light from open bays beyond shine through. As the pretense at natural form was dispensed with, and the overall shape of the craft's fabric began to reveal itself. The culture, general systems vehicle, sleeper service. No longer just her gallant protector and a grossly over-specified mobile game reserve. It seemed that the great ship had finally found something to become involved with, which was more in keeping with the extent of its powers. She wished it well, though with trepidation. The sea like stone, she thought. She turned and stepped down into the warmth of the tower, patting the bulge that was her sleeping, undreaming child. A stern winter indeed, harder than any of us had anticipated. Chapter 6 Lefid Ispantelli was trying desperately to remember the name of the lass he was with. Geltry? Usper? Stemley? Ah, oh, yes, yes, fuck, gods, yes, more, more, now, yes, there, there, yes, that's, oh, Soli, Getrin, Aesco, oh, fuck, there, more, harder, right, right, now, ah, oh. Selas, Serea, grief, how ungallant of him, oh, sweet providence, oh, fuck, no wonder he couldn't think of her name. The girl was kicking up such a racket he was surprised he could think at all. Still, a chap shouldn't grumble, he supposed. Always nice to be appreciated, even if it was the yacht that was doing most of the work. The diminutive hire yacht continued to shudder and buck beneath them, spiralling and curving through a space a few hundred kilometres away from the huge, stepped world that was Tyr. Lefid had used these little yachts for this sort of thing before, if you fed a nicely jagged course into their computers, they'd do most of the bumping and grinding for you, while leaving just enough apparent gravity to brace oneself without leaving one feeling terribly heavy. Programming in the odd power-off interval gave moments of delicious freefall and drew the small craft further away from the great world, so that gradually the view beyond the viewing ports increased in majesty as more and more of the conical habitat was revealed, turning slowly and glittering in the light of the system's sun. Altogether, a wonderful way of having sex, really, providing one found a suitable and willing partner. Oh, 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 oh force, push, 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 yes! She held his thrusting hips, smoothed his feathered scalp, and using her other hand, turned out to stroke his lower belly. Her huge, dark eyes glittered. Myriad tiny lights sparkling somewhere inside them, impulsing vortexes of colour and intensity that varied charmingly with the intensity of her pleasure. Come on, yes, come on up, further, further. <sighs> Damn it all, what was her name? Gelgri? Shokas? Ezio? Grief, what if it wasn't even a culture name? It had been certain it was, but now he was starting to think maybe it wasn't after all. 
That made it even more difficult. More excusable, maybe, too, but certainly more difficult, too. They'd met at the Hamomdan ambassador's party to celebrate the start of the 645th Festival of Tyr. He'd resolved to have his neural lace removed for the month of the festival, deciding that, as this year's theme was primitivism, he ought to give up some aspect of his amendments. The neural lace had been his choice, because although there was no physical alteration, and he looked just the same to everybody else, he'd reckoned he'd feel more different. Which he did. It was oddly liberating to have to ask things, or people, for information, and not know precisely what the time was and where he was located in the habitat. But it also meant that he was forced to rely on his own memory for things like people's names, and how imperfect was the unassisted human memory he'd forgotten. He'd even thought of having his wings removed too, at least partly, to show that he was taking part in the spirit of the festival. But in the end, he'd stuck with them. Probably just as well. This girl had made a big thing about the wings, headed straight for him, masked, body glittering. She was nearly as tall as he was, perfectly proportioned, and she had four arms, a drink in each hand too. His kind of female, he decided instantly, even as she was looking admiringly at his folded snow-white wings. She wore some sort of gel suit, basically deep blue, but covered with a pattern like gold wire wrapped all over it and dotted with little diamonds of contrasting subtly glowing red. Her whiskered mask was porcelain bone, studded with rubies and finished with iridescent badra feathers. Stunning perfume. She handed him a glass and took off her mask to reveal eyes the size of opened mouths. Eyes, softly, blackly featureless in the lustrous lights of the vibrantly decorated dome, until he'd looked carefully and seen the tiny hints of lights within their curved surfaces. The gelfield suit covered her everywhere except those heavily altered eyes, and a small hole at the back of her head where a plait of long, shiningly auburn hair spilled out. Wrapped in gold wire, it ended at the small of her back and was tethered to the suit there. She'd said her first name. The gel suit's lips had parted to show white teeth and a pink tongue. Lefid, he'd replied, bowing deeply, but watching her face as best he could while he did so. She'd looked up at his wings as they'd risen up and towards her over the plain black robe he'd worn. He'd seen her take a deep breath. The lights in her eyes had sparkled brightly. Aha, he'd thought. The Hamomdan ambassador had turned the riotously decorated stadium-sized bowl that was her residential quarters into an old-fashioned funfair for the party. They had wandered through the acts, tents and rides, he and she, talking small talk, passing comment on other people they passed, celebrating the refreshing absence of drones at the party, discussing the merits of whirligigs, shovelbubs, helter-skelters, ice flumes, quittle traps, slicicles, boing braces, air blows, tramples cups and body flaggers, and bemoaning the sheer pointlessness of interspecies funny face competitions. She was on an improving tour from her home orbital, cruising and learning with a party of friends on a semi-eccentric ship that would be here as long as the festival lasted. One of her aunts had some contact contacts and had swung an invitation to the ambassador's celebration. Her friends were so jealous. He guessed she was still in her teens, though she moved with the easy grace of somebody older, and her conversation was more intelligent and even shrewder than he'd have expected. He was used to being able to almost switch off talking to most teenagers, but he was having to race after her meanings and allusions at times. Were teenagers getting even smarter? Maybe he was just getting old. No matter. She obviously liked the wings. She asked to stroke them. He told her he was a resident of Tyr, culture or ex-culture, depending how you wanted to look at it. It wasn't something he bothered about, though he supposed, if forced, he felt more loyalty to Tyr, where he'd lived for twenty years, than to the culture, where he'd lived for the rest of his life. In the ah, forget it tendency, that was, not the culture proper, which the tendency regarded as being far too serious and not nearly as dedicated to hedonistic pursuits as it ought to be. He'd first come here as part of a tendency cultural mission, but stayed when the rest returned back to their home orbital. He'd thought about saying, well, actually, I was in the tendency's equivalent for special circumstances, kind of a spy, really, and I know lots of secret codes and stuff, but that probably wasn't the sort of line that would work with a sophisticated girl like this. Oh, much older than her, quite middle-aged at 140. Well, that was kind of her to say so. Yes, the wings worked, in anything less than 50% standard gravity. Had them since he was 30. 
He lived on an air level here with thirty percent gravity. Huge web trees up there. Some people lived in their hollowed-out fruit husks, though he preferred a sort of wispy house thing made from sheets of chaltresa silk stretched over high-pressure thin booms. Oh yes, she'd be very welcome to see it. Had she seen much of Tyr? Arrived yesterday. Such good timing for the festival. He'd love to be her guide. Why not now? Why not? They could hire a yacht. First, though, they would go and make their apologies to the ambassador. Of course, he and she were old pals. Something to tell that aunt of hers. And they'd call by the cruise ship. Bring the others. Oh, just a little camera drone. Well, why not? Yes, Tears' rules could be tiresome at times, couldn't they? Yes, yes, yes. That was him. She'd given one final ear-splitting shriek, and then gone limp, with just a huge grin on her gel-suited face. She'd kept it on. Another aperture had obligingly opened. Time to bring this bout to a climax. The yacht had served him before. It heard what he said and took that as a signal to cut engines and go into freefall. He loved technology. The neural lace would have handled his orgasm sequence better, controlling the flow of secretions from his drug glands so that they more precisely matched and enhanced the extended human basic physiological process taking place. But it was still pretty damn good all the same. His didn't last quite as long as hers obviously had, but he'd put it at over a minute easily. He floated, still joined to her, watching the smile on her face and the tiny dim lights in the huge dark eyes. Her fabulous chest heaved now and again. Her four arms waved round with a graceful undersea motion. After a while, one of her hands went to the nape of her neck. She took the gel suit's head off and let it float free. The deep, dark eyes stayed. The rest of her face was brown, flushed with red, and quite beautiful. He smiled at her. She smiled back. With the gel suit's head removed, a little sweat beaded on her forehead and top lip. He gently fanned her face with his wings, bringing them sweeping softly from behind his shoulders and then back. The huge eyes regarded him for a while. Then she put her head back, stretching and sighing. A couple of pink cushions floated past, bumping into her floating arms and ricocheting slowly away. The yacht's higher limit warning chimed. It wasn't allowed to stray too far from Tyr. He'd already told it to cruise back in when it hit the limit. It duly fired its engines, and they were pressed back into the slickly warm surfaces of the couches and cushions in a delicious tangle of limbs for a while. The girl wriggled with succulent slowness, eyes quite dark now. He looked over to one side and saw the little camera drone she'd brought sitting on the ledge under one of the diamond viewports. Its one beady eye still fastened on the two of them. He winked at it. Something moved outside in the darkness. Amongst the slow wheeling turn of stars, he watched it for a while. The yacht murmured, engine firing quietly. Some apparent gravity stuck him and the girl to the ceiling for a second or two. Then weightlessness returned. The girl made a couple of small noises that might have indicated she was asleep, and seemed to relax inside, letting go of him. He pulled her closer with his arms, while his wings beat once, twice. Bringing them both closer to the viewport, outside, close by, a ship was passing by, heading inbound on its final approach for Tyr. They must have been almost directly in its path. The yacht's engine burn had been avoidance action. Lefid looked down at the sleeping girl, wondering if he ought to wake her so that she could watch. There was something magical about seeing this great craft going sliding silently by. Its dark, spectacularly embellished hull slicing space just a hundred meters away. He had an idea and grinned to himself and stretched out his hand to take the little camera drone, currently getting a fine view of the lass's backside and his balls, and turn it round, pointed out the viewport at the passing ship, so that she would have a surprise when she watched her recording. But then, something else caught his attention, and his hand never did touch the camera drone. Instead, he stared out of the port, his eyes fastened on a section of the vessel's hull. The ship passed on by. He kept staring out into space. The girl sighed and moved. Two of her arms went out and drew his face towards hers. She squeezed him from inside. <sighs> She breathed and kissed him, 
their first real kiss without the gel suit over her face. Eyes still enchanting, oceanically deep and enchanting. Estre. Her name was Estre, of course. Con enough name for an uncommonly attractive girl. Here for a month, eh? Lethid congratulated himself. This could end up being a good festival. They started caressing each other again. It was just as good as the first time, but no better, because he still wasn't able to give the proceedings his full attention. Now, instead of trying to remember what the girl's name was, he couldn't stop wondering why there was an Alentia emergency message spatted minutely across the scar hull of an affronter light cruiser. Part 6 Pittance Chapter 1 Ulva Seish sobbed into her pillow. She had felt bad before. Her mother had refused her something. Some lad had, unbelievably, preferred somebody else to her, admittedly very rare. She had felt terribly alone, exposed and vulnerable the first time she had camped out under the stars on a planet, and various pets had died. But nothing as terrible as this. She raised her tear-marked face up from the sodden pillow and looked again at her reflection in the reverser field on the walk-in across the horribly small cabin. She saw her face again and howled with anguish, burying her head in the pillow once again and bashing her feet up and down on the undercover, which wobbled like a jelly in the AG field, trying to compensate. Her face had been altered. While she'd slept, during the night, one day out from Phage, her face, her beautiful, Heart-shaped, heart-winning, heart-melting, heart-breaking face. The face which she had sat and gazed at in a mirror or a reverser field for hours at a time on occasion, when she'd been old enough for her drug glands to come online and young enough to experiment with them. The face she had gazed at and gazed at, not because she was stoned, but because she was just so damned lovely. Her face had been made to look like somebody else's. And there was worse. It might be hurting a little now if she wasn't keeping the pain turned off, but that wasn't what mattered. What mattered was that her face was, A, puffy, swollen, and discoloured after the nanotechs had done their work, B, not her own any longer, and C, older. The woman she was supposed to look like was older than she. Much older. Sixty years older. People claimed that nobody in the culture really changed much in appearance between about 25 and 250. Then there was a slow but sure ageing to the 350-400 mark, by which time your hair would be white or gone. Your skin would be wrinkled like some basic scrotum, and your tits swinging round your belly button. Ugh! But she had always been able to tell how old people were. She was rarely more than five or ten years out, never more than twenty at any rate. And she could see how old she was now, even beneath the puffiness and shadowy bruising. She was seeing how she would look when she was older, and it didn't matter that it wasn't her own face. It didn't matter that she would probably look much better than this by the time she was in her mid-eighties. She had pictures of 99.9% .9 certain projections prepared for her by the house AI, which showed exactly how she'd look at every decade for two centuries ahead, and they looked great. What mattered was that she looked old and dowdy and that would make her feel old and dowdy, and therefore that would make her behave old and dowdy, and that feeling, and that way of behaving, and therefore that look, might not go away when she was returned to her normal, her natural, her own appearance. This wasn't turning out as she'd hoped at all. No friends, no pets, no fun. And the more she thought about it, the riskier it all might be, the less certain she was what she was getting into. This whole thing was supposed to be an adventure, but this part on the ship was just boring. And so would the return journey be as well, and in the middle lay who knew what. Everybody knew how devious SC was. What were they really up to? What did they really want her to do? Even if it did turn out to be somehow exciting and even fun, she wouldn't be allowed to tell anybody about it. And where was the point in fun if you couldn't talk about it later? Of course, she could tell other people, but then she wouldn't be able to stay in contact. Hell, Chirk was being ambiguous about whether she was in it now or not. Well, was she or wasn't she? Was this a real contact and even SC mission she was engaged in, as she dreamed of, fantasised about since early childhood, or some extracurricular wheeze, even a test of some sort? She bit the pillow, and the particular texture of the fabric in her mouth and between her teeth, and the sensation of her face being puffed up while her eyes stung with tears, 
took her back to childhood again. She raised her head, licking her top lip clear of the salty fluid, and then snorted and sniffed back both the tears and the snot that was filling her nose. She thought about glanding some calm, but decided not to. She did some deep breathing, then swiveled round on the bed and sat up and looked at herself in the reverser, raising her chin at the hideous image it showed and sniffing again, and wiping her face with her hands and swallowing hard, and fluffing out her hair, at least it could stay as it was, sniffing again, and stared herself in the eyes and forbade herself to cry or look away. After a few minutes, her cheeks had dried and her eyes were coming clear again, losing their red puffiness. She was still abhorrently ugly and even disfigured by her own high standards. But she was not a child, and she was still the same person inside. Oh well, she supposed a little suffering might do her some good. She had always been pampered. All her hardships had been self-inflicted and recreational in the past. She had gone hungry and unwashed when hiking somewhere primitive, but there had always been food at the end of the day, and a shower, or at the very least a peel spray to remove the grime and sweat. Even the pain of what had felt on occasion like an irretrievably broken heart had consistently proved less lasting than she'd initially imagined and expected. The revelation that a boy's taste was so grotesquely deficient he could prefer somebody else to her always reduced both the intensity and the duration of the anguish her heart demanded be endured to mark such a loss of regard. She had always known there were too few real challenges in her life, too few genuine risks. It had all been too easy, even by culture standards. While her lifestyle and material circumstances in Phage had been no different from that of any other person her age, it was true that, just because the culture was so determinedly egalitarian, what little hierarchic instinct remained in the population of the rock manifested itself in the ascription of a certain cachet to belonging to one of the founder families. In a society in which it was possible to look however one wanted to look, acquire any talent one wished to acquire, and have access to as much property as one might desire, it was generally accepted that the only attributes which possessed that particular quality of interest, which derived solely from their being difficult to attain, were entry into contact and special circumstances, or having some familial link with the culture's early days. Even the most famous and gifted of artists, whether their talents were congenital or acquired, were not regarded in quite the same hallowed light as contact members, and somewhere really old like Phage, direct descendants of founders. Being a famous artist in the culture meant at best it was accepted you must possess a certain gritty determination. At worst, it was generally seen as pointing to a pitiably archaic form of insecurity and a rather childish desire to show off. When there were almost no distinctions to be drawn between people's social standing, the tiny differences that did exist became all the more important to those who cared. Ulva's feelings about her family's ancient name were mostly negative. Admittedly, possessing an old name meant some people were prepared to make an advance on any respect they might come to feel was rightly your due. But on the other hand, Ulva wanted to be admired, worshipped and lusted after for herself, just her, just this current collection of cells right here, with no reference to the inheritance those cells carried. And what was the point of having what was sometimes insultingly referred to as an advantage in life if it couldn't even smooth your way into contact? If anything, it had been hinted it was a disadvantage. She would have to do better than the average person. She would have to be so completely, utterly, demonstrably perfect for the contact section there could be no question of anybody ever thinking she got in because the people and machines on the admissions board knew the name Seish from their history lessons. Well, Chert had been right. This was her big chance. She had been, and would be, unamendedly beautiful. She was intelligent, charming, and attractive, and she had common sense by the bucket load. But she couldn't expect to breeze this the way she'd breezed everything else in her life so far. She'd work at it. She'd study. She'd be diligent, assiduous, and industrious, and all the other things she'd worked so hard at not being while ensuring that her university results had sparkled as brilliantly as her social life. Maybe she had been a spoiled brat. Maybe she still was a spoiled brat, but she was a ruthlessly determined spoiled brat. And if that ruthless determination dictated ditching spoiled brathood, then out it would go, faster than you could say bye. Ulva dried her eyes, collected herself, still without the help of any glandular secretions, then got up and left the cabin. She would sit in the lounge where there was more space, and there she would find out all she could about Tyr. This man, Gaynar Hafoen, 
and anything else that might be relevant to what they wanted her to do. Chapter 2 Lefid Ispantelli eased himself into the seat beside the vice-consul of the Arthagetic tendency, carefully hooking his wings over the seat-back and smiling at the vice-consul, who regarded him with that particular kind of vacant look people tend to assume when they're communicating by neural lace. Lefid held up his hand. Words, I'm afraid, Lelius, he said. Had my lace removed for the festival. Very primitive, vice-consul Lelius said approvingly nodding gravely and returning his attention to the race. They were sitting in a carousel suspended beneath a vast carbon-tubed structure sculpted in the image of a web tree. The thousands of ewing carousels dangled like fruit from the canopy and were multifariously connected by a secondary web of delicate, swaying cable bridges. The view beneath and to either side was of a series of great steps of stone dotted with vegetation and moving figures. It was very like looking at an ancient amphitheatre which had been lifted from the horizontal to the vertical, and each of whose seat levels was able to rotate independently. The moving figures were yuzna mistratal combinations. The yuznas were the huge, two-legged, flightless and almost brainless birds doing the running, while their thinking was done by the mistratal jockey, each carried on its back. Mistratals were tiny and almost helpless but brainy simians, and the combination of one of them per Yuzna was a naturally occurring one from a planet in the lower leaf spiral. Yuzna mistratal races had been a part of life on Tyr for millennia, and running them on a giant mandala two kilometres across composed of steps or levels, all rotating at different speeds, had been traditional for most of that time. The huge, slowly turning racecourse looked a little like Tyr itself, which took its name from its shape. Tyr was a stepped habitat. Its nine levels all revolved at the same speed, but that meant that the outer tiers possessed greater apparent gravity than those nearer the centre. The levels themselves were sectioned into compartments up to hundreds of kilometres long and filled with atmospheres of different types and held at different temperatures, while a stunningly complicated and dazzlingly beautiful array of mirrors and mirror fields situated within the staggered cone of the world's axis provided amounts of sunlight precisely timed, attenuated and, where necessary, altered in wavelength to mimic the conditions on a hundred different worlds for a hundred different intelligent species. This environmental diversity and the civilizational codependence it implied, and intermingling it encouraged, had been Tyr's raison d'etre, the very foundation of its purpose and fame for the seven thousand years it had existed. Its original builders were perhaps unknown. They were believed to have sublimed shortly after building it, leaving behind a species, or model, depending how you define these things, of biomechanical syntricate, which ran and maintained the place, were individually dull but collectively highly intelligent, took the shape of a small sphere covered with long articulated spines, were between half a metre and two metres in size, and had seemed to have an intense suspicion of anything possessing less of a biological basis than they did themselves. Drones and other AIs were tolerated on Tyr, but very closely watched, followed everywhere, and their every communication and even thought monitored. Minds were immune to this sort of treatment, of course, but their avatars tended to attract a degree of intense physical observation which bordered on harassment, and so they rarely bothered entering the world itself, sticking to the outer docks where they were made perfectly welcome and afforded every hospitality. Tyr, after all, was a statement, a treasure, a symbol, and as such, any small discriminatory foibles it chose to display were considered perfectly tolerable. The Yisna Mistratal racetrack was one level up from the tier where the Hamomdan mission was housed, and three levels down from Lefid's home circumference. Lefid, the vice-consul said. He was a rotund, massy male of apparently indeterminate species, vaguely human in shape, but with a triangular head and an eye at each corner. His skin was bright red. The flowing robes he wore were a vivid but gradually shifting shade of blue. He turned his head slightly so that two of his eyes regarded Lefid, while the third continued to watch the race. Did I hear what the Hamomdan do last night? I can't remember. Briefly, Lefid said. I waved hello, but you were busy with the Ashbatsi delegate. Vice Consul Lelius wheezed with laughter. Trying to hold the blighter down. It was having buoyancy problems inside its new suit. Automatics went really up to the job with the AI removed. 
Terrible thing when one of these gas giant floater beasties suffers from flatulence, you know. Leffid recalled that Lelius had rather looked as though he'd been wrestling with the bow rope for what appeared to be a small airship at the Hamomden Ambassador's party. Not as terrible as it must be for the inhabitant of the suit, I'd guess. Ah, indeed, Lelius chuckled, nodding and wheezing. May I order you some refreshment? No, thank you. Good. I have given up emotic eat foods and drinks for the duration of the festival, and would only be jealous. He shook his head. I thought primitives were supposed to have more fun, but everything I could think of changing the better to partake in the festival spirit seemed to make life less fun, he said, then made a tutting noise at something on the racecourse. Leffid looked to see one of the Yezna Mastratal pairs failing to make a jump, hitting the ramp just behind and falling down to another level. They picked themselves up and ran on, but they need to be very lucky to win now. Lelius shook his head and used the flat end of a stylo to smooth a number off the wood-bordered wax tablet he held in his broad red hand. You winning? Leffid asked him. Lelius shook his head and looked sad. Leffid smiled, then made a show of inspecting the racetrack and the contending Yisnemistratal pairs. They don't look very festive to me, he said. I expected something more. Well, festive, he concluded lamely. I believe the race authorities regard the festival with the same misanthropic dubiety as I, Lelius said. The festival is, what, two days old? Leffid nodded. And already I am tired of it, Lelius said, scratching behind one of his three ears with a wax tablet stylo. I thought of taking a holiday while it was occurring, but I am expected to be here, of course. A month of challenging, groundbreaking art and ruthlessly enforced fun. Lelius shook his head heavily. What a prospect. Leffid put his chin in his cupped hand. You've never really been a natural for the Arthur Gettit tendency, have you, Lelius? I joined, hoping it would make me more. Lelius looked up contemplatively at the broad spread of the tree sculpture hanging above them. Cavort prone he said, and nodded. I wished to be more prone to cavorting, and so I joined the tendency, hoping that the natural hedonism of people like your good self would somehow infect my own more deliberate, phlegmatic soul. He sighed. I still live in hope. Leffid laughed lightly, then looked slowly around. Are you here alone, Lelius? Lelius looked thoughtful. My incomparably efficient clerical assistant number three visits the latrines, I believe, he wheezed. My wastrel son is probably trying to invent new ways of embarrassing me. My mate is half a galaxy away, very nearly enough, and my current darling stays at home indisposed, or rather disposed not to come to what she terms a boring bird and monkey race. He nodded slowly. I could reasonably be said to be alone, I suppose. Why do you ask? Leffid sat a little closer, arms on the carousel's small table. Saw something strange last night, he said. That young thing with the four arms? Lelius asked, at least one eye twinkling. I did wonder if any of her other anatomical features were also doubled up. Your prurience flatters me, Leffid said. Ask her nicely, and she will probably furnish you with a copy of a recording which proves both our relevant bits were quite singular. Lelius chuckled and drank from a strawed flask. Not that, then. What? Are we alone? Leffid asked quietly. Lelius stared blankly at him for a moment. Yes, my lace is now turned off. There is nothing else I know of watching or listening. What is this thing you saw? I'll show you. Leffid took a napkin from the table slot and, from a pocket in his shirt, extracted the terminal he was using instead of the neural lace. He looked at the markings on the instrument as though trying to remember something, then shrugged and said, Um, a terminal. Become a pen, please. Leffid wrote on the napkin, producing a sequence of seven pendant rhombi, each composed of eight dots or tiny circles. When he'd finished, he turned the napkin towards Lelius, who looked carefully down at it, and then equally deliberately up at Leffid. 
Very pretty, he wheezed. What is it? Lefid smiled. He tapped the rightmost symbol. First, it's an alench signal because it's base eight and arranged in that pattern. This first symbol is an emergency distress mark. The other six are probably, almost certainly by convention, a location. Really? Lelius did not sound especially impressed. And the location of this location? About seventy-three years into the upper swirl from here. Ooh, Lelius said, with a sort of rumbling noise that probably meant he was surprised. Just six digits to define such a precise point. Base 256, easy, Leffitt said, shrugging his wings. But what's interesting is where I saw this signal. Uh-huh, Lelius said, momentarily distracted by something happening on the racetrack. He took another drink, then returned his attention to the other man. It was on an affronter light cruiser, Leffitt said quietly, burned into its scar hull, very lightly, very shallowly, at an angle across the blades. Blades? Lelius asked. Leffitt waved one hand. Decoration. But it was there. If I hadn't been very close to the ship, in a yacht, as it was approaching Tyr, I'd never have seen it. And the intriguing possibility exists, of course, that the ship doesn't know it bears this message. Lelius stared at the napkin for a moment. He sat back. Hmm, he said. Mind if I turn on my lace? Not at all, Leffitt said. I already know the ship's call to the Furious Purpose, and it's back here unscheduled, in Dock 807B. If it's a mechanical problem it's got, I can't imagine it's anything to do directly with the scarring. As for the location in the signal, it's about halfway between the stars Cromphalet, one of two, and Esperi, slightly closer to Esperi, and there's nothing there. Nothing that anybody knows about, anyway. Leffid tapped at the pocket terminal, and after some experimentation, got the beam to brighten until it ignited the napkin he'd written on. He let it burn, and was about to sweep the ashes into the table's disposal slot when Lelius, who was slumped back in the seat looking blank, reached out one red hand and absently ground the ashes under his palm before scattering them to the breeze. They fell, floating away from the carousel, in an insubstantial cloud towards the seats and private boxes stacked below. Some minor running gear problem, Lelia said. The affront ship. He was silent a moment longer. The Alench may have had a problem, he said, nodding slowly. A clan fleet, eight ships, left here a hundred days ago to investigate the swirl. I remember, Leffitt said. There have been, Lelius paused, indications, barely even rumours, that not all has been right with them. Well, Leffitt said, placing his palms flat on the table and making to rise from his seat. It may be nothing, but I just thought I'd mention it. Kind, Lelius wheezed, nodding. Not sure what the tendency can do with it. Last ship we had coming here went sabbatical on us, ungrateful cur. But we might be able to trade it to the mainland. Yes, the dear old mainland, Leffitt said. It was the term the Arthurgetta tendency usually employed to refer to the culture proper. He smiled. Whatever. He held his wings away from the seat back as he stood. Sure you won't stay, Lelius said, blinking. We could have a betting competition. Bet you'd win. No, thanks. This evening I'm playing host to a lady who needs two play settings at a time, and I have to go polish my cutlery and make sure my flight feathers are fettled for ruffling. Ah, have armfuls of fun. I suspect I shall. Oh, damn, Lelius said sadly as a great shout went up from below and to most sides. The race was over. Lelius leant over and scratched out another couple of numbers on the wax tablet. Never mind, Leffitt said, patting the vice consul on his ample shoulder as he headed for the swaying cable bridge that would take him back to the main trunk of the huge artificial tree. Yes, Lelius sighed, 
looking at the smudge of ash on his hand. I'm sure there'll be another race starting in a while. Chapter 3 The Black Bird Gravius flew slowly across the recreation of the great sea battle of Octoveline, its shadow falling over the wreckage dotted water, the sails and decks of the long wooden ships, the soldiers who stood massed on the decks of the larger vessels, the sailors who hauled at ropes and sheets, the rocketeers who struggled to rig and fire their charges, and the bodies floating in the water. A brilliant blue-white sun glared from a violet sky. The air was crisscrossed by the smoky trails of the primitive rockets, and the sky seemed supported by the great columns of smoke rising from stricken warships and transports. The water was dark blue, ruffled with waves, spattered with the tall feathery plumes of crashing rockets, creased white at the stem of each ship, and covered in flames where oils had been poured between ships in desperate attempts to prevent boarding. The bird flew over the edge of the sea scene, where the water ended like a still, liquid cliff, and the unadorned floor of the general bay resumed, just five metres below. Its surface also covered with what looked like wreckage, as though the tide had somehow gone out in this part of the bay, but not the other, but which, on closer inspection, proved to be objects, parts of ships, parts of people, which had been in the process of construction. The incomplete sea battle filled less than half of the bay's sixteen square kilometres. This would have been the sleeper service's masterwork, its definitive statement. Now it might never be finished. The black bird flew on, passing a few of the ship's drones on the surface of the bay, gathering the construction debris, and loading it onto an insubstantial conveyor belt, which appeared to consist of a thin line of shady air. It kept beating. Its goal lay on the far end of the doubled general bay, between this internal section and the bay that opened to the rear of the ship. Damn the woman for choosing to stay at the bows, nearest to where the tower had been. Bad luck the place it had to be was so close to the stern. It had already flown through twenty-five kilometres of interior space, down the gigantic dark internal corridor in the centre of the ship, between closed bay doors where a few dim lights glowed and utter silence reigned, a kilometre of air below its gently flapping wings, another above and one to each side. The bird had looked about it, taking in the huge, gloomy volumes and supposing it ought to feel privileged. The ship had kept it out of these places for the last forty years, restricting it to the upper kilometre of its hull, which housed the old accommodation areas and the majority of its storees. Gravius had senses beyond those normally available to an ordinary animal, and it had employed a couple of them in an attempt to probe the bay doors and find out what lay behind them, if anything. As far as it could tell, the thousands of bays were empty. That had only taken it as far as the general bay engineering space, the biggest single volume in the ship with the divisions down, nine thousand metres deep, nearly twice that across, and filled with noise and flickering lights, and blurringly fast motion as the ship created thousands of new machines to do who knew what. Most of the engineering space wasn't even filled with air. The material components machines could move faster that way. Gravius was flying down a transparent travel tube set into the ceiling. Nine kilometres of that took it to a wall which led into the relative serenity, or at least stillness, of the sea battle tableau. It was halfway across that now, just another four thousand metres to go. Its wing muscles ached. It landed on the parapet of a balcony, which looked out into the rear of this set of general bays. Beyond were thirty-two cubic kilometres of empty air, a perfectly empty general bay the sort of place where a normal GSV of this size would be building a smaller GSV, playing host to one which was visiting, housing an alien environment like a gigantic guest's room, turning over to some sports venue or subdividing into smaller storage or manufacturing spaces. Gradius looked back at the modest tableau on the balcony, which, in its previous existence, before the GSV had decided to go eccentric, had been part of a cafe with a fine view of the bay. Here were posed seven humans, all with their backs to the view of the empty bay and facing the hologram of a calm, empty swimming pool. The humans wore trunks. They sat in deck chairs around a couple of low tables full of drinks and snacks. They had been caught in the acts of laughing, talking, blinking, scratching their chin, drinking. Some famous painting, apparently. It didn't look very artistic to Gradius. It supposed you had to see it from the right angle. It lifted one leg up from the parapet and slipped, falling into the air of the general bay. 
It hit something between it and the bay, and fell bouncing off the bay's rear wall, then off the invisible wall, then found its bearings, flat close and parallel to the wall, twisted in the air when it got back to the level of the balcony, and returned to it. Uh-huh, it thought. It risked using again the senses it was not supposed to have. Solidity in the bay. What it had hit was not glass, and not a field between it and the empty bay. The bay was not empty, and what it had hit was the field edge of a projection. On the far side, for at least two kilometres, there was solid matter. Dense solid matter. Partially exotic dense solid matter. Well, there you were. The bird shook itself and preened a little, combing its feathers smooth with its beak. Then it looked around and half hopped, half flew over to one of the posed figures. It inspected each one briefly, staring into an eye here, seemingly looking for a juicy parasite in an ear here, peering at a stray hair here and carefully studying a nostril here. It often did this, studying the next ones to go, the ones who would next be revived and taken away, as though there was something to be learned from their carefully artificial postures. It pecked in a desultory, barely interested sort of way, at a stray hair in one man's armpit, then hopped away, studying the group from a variety of nearby tables and angles, trying to find the correct perspective from which to view the scene, soon to be gone, of course. In fact, they were all going, this lot with the rest, but this lot to reawakening, whereas most of them would just be stored somewhere else. But this lot, when they were woken in a few hours, would be coming back to life somewhere. Funny to think of it. Finally, the bird shook its head stretched its wings, and hopped through the hologram and into the deserted café beyond, ready to begin the first leg of its journey back to its mistress. A few moments later, the avatar Amorphia stepped out of another part of the hologram, turned once to glance back at where the bird had hopped through the projection, then went and squatted before the figure of the man at whose armpit Gravius had pecked. Chapter 4 Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.864.0001. From eccentric shoot them later to GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, the... It was me. Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.864.1971. From GSV anticipation of a new lover's arrival, the... To eccentric shoot them later. What was you? I was the go-between for the information transmitted from the Arfaget tendency to SC. One of our people on Tyr saw the affront light cruiser Furious Purpose as it arrived back there. It had a location in Elench Code burned onto its scar hull. The information was transmitted from the tendency mission on Tyr to me. I passed it on to the different Tan and the Steely Glint, my usual contacts in the group gang. I would guess the signal was then relayed to the GSV Ethics Gradient, home ship of the GCU Fate Amenable to Change, which subsequently discovered the accession. So, in a sense, this is all my fault. I apologise. I had hoped this confession would never be necessary, but having turned this over in my mind, I have concluded that, as was the case concerning the passing on of the original information regarding the Scarhull signal in the first place, I had no choice. Had you guessed? Had you started to? Do you still trust me? It had occurred to me, but I had no access to tendency transmission records and was unwilling to ask the other gang members directly. I trust you no less for what you say. Why are you telling me now? I would like to retain that trust. Have you discovered anything else? Yes. I think there is a link to a man called Gaynor Hafern, a contact representative with the affront on a habitat called God's Hole in the Fern Blade. He left there the day after the accession was discovered. SC has hired three affronter battle cruisers to take him to Tyr. They're due there in fourteen days. His biography, files attached. You see the connection. That ship again. You think it involved beyond what we believe we have agreed to already? Yes. And the grey area. The times look a little unlikely. If it really pushed itself, the GA could reach Tyr in, what, three days or so after this human gets there? 
but that still leaves our other concern two months or more out of touch. I know. Still, I think there is something going on. I am following up all the avenues of investigation I can. I am making further inquiries through the more likely contacts mentioned in his file, but it's all going terribly slowly. Thank you for your candor. I shall remain in touch. You're welcome. Do keep me informed. Stutter type point, M32, tra point at N4.28.865.2203. From eccentric shoot them later to LSV serious callers only. Got fed up waiting. I called it. Signal file attached. Stuttered type point M32 tra point at N4.28.865.2690. From LSV serious callers only to eccentric shoot them later. And now it trusts you no less. Ha! Ah. I remain convinced it was the right thing to do. Whatever it is done. What other ship you asked to head for pittance? On its way. And why pittance? Is it not obvious? Perhaps not. Mayhap the paranoia of the anticipation of a new lover's arrival is contagious, however that may be. Let me make my argument. Pittance houses a veritable cornucopia of weaponry. Indeed, the weapons deployed there just protect the main cache of munitions. That is, the ships alone represents a vast stockpile of potential destruction. Certainly, the store's cost takes it nowhere near the accession, but it has taken it into the general volume within which the affront have some interest. Now, while it has almost certainly gone unnoticed, and even if it is spotted and tracked, it can be of no interest to the affront, and, of course, it is anyway well able to defend itself, and it is not part of the subtle mobilization being organized by the steely glint. It nevertheless represents the greatest concentration of material in the vicinity. I start to wonder when, roughly, did the culture start to have doubts, serious doubts, about the affront? And when was Pittance chosen as one of the ship stores? Around the same time. Indeed, Pittance was chosen, fitted out, and stocked entirely within the timescale of the debate which took place at the end of the Adiran War regarding military intervention against the affront. There are billions of bodies like Pittance. The galaxy is littered with such pieces of wreckage wandering between the stars. Yet Pittance was chosen as one of only eleven such stores, a rock whose slow progress would take it into a front of space within five or six centuries, depending on how fast the affront expanded their sphere of influence, and which might well remain within that sphere for the foreseeable future. Given that a front of influence could easily push its borders out at a greater rate than that of a slowly tumbling rock moving at much less than a percent of light speed, how fortuitous to have such a wealth of weaponry embedded in a front space! Might not this all, in fact, be a setup. Think about this. Is this not just the sort of thing you would be proud to have thought up? Such foresight, such patience, such attention to the long game, such plausible protestations of innocence should the coincidence be remarked upon or revealed. I know I'd be pleased with myself had I been part of such a plan. Lastly, on the Committee of Minds which oversaw the choice of these stores, the names Woitra Different tan and not invented here all sound rather familiar, think ye not. Taken all together, and even recognising that this is almost certainly a blind alley, I thought it irresponsible not to have a sharp eye attached to a sympathetic mind in the vicinity of that precious little rock. All right, point taken. And what of whatever you were backing on? My original idea was to attempt to find someone acceptable on tier who might be persuaded to our purpose. However, this proved impractical. There is considerable contact and SC presence on the habitat, but nobody I think we could risk sharing our apprehensions with. Instead, I have the tentative agreement of an old ally to support our cause, should the occasion arise. It is a month or more from Tyr, and the accession lies beyond there on its orientation, but it has access to a number of warships. The tricky part is that some of them may be called up in the mobilisation, but a few may be put at our disposal. Not as warships, I hasten to add, certainly not against other culture ships, but as counters, as it were, or delivery systems, if and when we find a vulnerable point in the conspiracy we believe might exist. This Gaynar Hoffowen person, 
I may make my own inquiries in that direction, if I can avoid stepping on the metaphorical toes of our co-concernee. The affront angle is the one that worries me. So aggressive. Such drive. For all our oft-repeated horror at their effects on others, there exists, I think, a kind of grudging admiration in many culture folk for the affront's energy, not to mention their apparent freedom from the effects of moral conscience. Such an easy threat to see, and yet so difficult a problem to deal with. I dread to think what awful plan might be hatched with a thoroughly clear conscience by perfectly estimable minds to deal with such a perceived menace. Equally, given the qualitative scale of the opportunity which may be presented by the accession, the affront are just the sort of species, and are precisely the most likely stage in their development, to attempt some sort of mad undertaking which, however likely to fail, if it did succeed, might offer rewards justifying the risk. And who is to say they would be wrong in making such a judgment? Look, the damned accession hasn't done anything yet. All this nuisance has been caused by everybody's reaction to it. Some of us all right if it turned out it is a projection of some sort, some god's jest. I'm growing impatient, I don't mind telling you. The feat amenable to change stands off watching the accession doing nothing and reporting on it every now and again. Various low-level involveds are puffing themselves up and girding their scrawny loins with a view to taking a sightseeing trip to the latest shoe in town and in the vague hope that if there is some sort of action, they'll be able to pick up some of it. And all that the rest of us are doing is sitting around waiting for the big guns to arrive. I wish something would happen. Chapter 5 Go on travelling with your gainer, Huffern, Five Tide boomed. They slapped limbs. The man had already braced one leg and the gelfield suit absorbed the actual impact, so he didn't fall over. They were in the entity control area of the level 8 docks, a fronter section, surrounded by affronters, their slave drones, and other machines, a few members of other species who could tolerate the same conditions as the affront, as well as numerous tier syntricates, floating around like little dark balls of spines, all coming and going, leaving or joining travelators, spin cars, lifts and intersection transport carriages. Not staying for some rest and recreation? Gaynor Huffern asked the affronter. Tyr boasted a notoriously excellent affront hunting reserve section. Ha! On the way back, perhaps, Five Tide said. Duty calls elsewhere in the meantime, he chuckled. Gaynor Huffern got the impression he was missing a joke here. He wondered about this, then shrugged and laughed. Well, I'll see you back on God's Hole, no doubt. Indeed, Five Tide said. Enjoy yourself, human. The affronter turned on his tentacle tips and swept away back to the battle cruiser Kiss the Blade. Gaynor Hafoen watched him go and watched the locked doors close on the transit tunnel with a frown on his face. What's worrying you? asked the suit. The man shook his head. Uh, nothing, he said. He stooped and picked up his hold all. Human male by Arganar Hafoan plus Gelfield suit, said a syndicate, floating up to him. It looked, Gaynor Hafoan thought, like an explosion in a sphere of black ink, frozen an instant after it began. He bowed briefly. Correct. I am to escort you to the entity control, human section. Please follow me. Certainly. They found a spin car, little more than a platform dotted with seats, stanchions and webbing. Gaynor Hafoan hopped on, followed by the syndicate, and the car accelerated smoothly into a transparent tunnel, which ran out along the underside of the habitat's outer skin. They were heading spinward, so that as the car gained speed, they seemed to lose weight. A field shimmered over the car, seeming to mould itself to the curved roof of the tunnel. Gases hissed. They went underneath the huge hanging bulk of one of the other affronter ships, all blades and darkness. He watched as it detached itself from the habitat, falling massively silently away into space and the circling stars. Another ship, then another and another, dropped away after it. They disappeared. What was the fourth ship? the man asked. The comet-class light cruiser Fury's Purpose, the suit said. Hmm, wonder where they're off to. The suit didn't reply. It was getting misty in the car. Gaynor Hafoen listened to the gases hiss around him. The temperature was rising, the atmosphere in the field-shrouded car changing from an affronter atmosphere to a human atmosphere. 
The car zoomed upwards for lower, less gravity-intense levels, and Gaynor Hofoen, used to a front of gravity for these last two years, felt as though he was floating. How long before we rendezvous with the meat fucker? he asked. Three days, the suit told him. Of course, they won't let you into the world proper, will they? the man said, as though realising this for the first time. No, said the suit. What'll you do while I'm off having fun? The same. I've already inquired ahead and come to an arrangement with a visiting contact ship GP drone, so I shall be in thrall. It was Gaynor Hofoen's turn not to say anything. He found the whole idea of drone sex, even if it was entirely of the mind, with no physical component whatsoever, quite entirely bizarre. Oh, well, each to his own, he thought. Mr. Gaynor Hofoen said a stunningly, heart-stoppingly beautiful woman in the post-entity reception area, human. She was tall, perfectly proportioned. Her hair was long and red and extravagantly curled, and her eyes were a luminous green, just the right side of natural. Her loose, plain tabard exposed smoothly muscled, glossily tanned skin. Welcome to Tyr. My name's Verlioff Shung. She held out a hand and shook his firmly. Skin on skin. No suit at last. It was a good feeling. He was dressed in a semi-formal outfit of loose pantaloons and long shirt, and enjoying the lushly sensual sensation of the glidingly smooth materials on his body. Contact sent me to look after you, Verlioff Shung said, with a hint of ruefulness. I'm sure you don't need it, but I'm here if you do. I, uh... I hope you don't mind. Her voice, her voice was something to immerse yourself in. He smiled broadly and bowed. How could I, he said. She laughed, putting one hand over her mouth and, of course, her perfect teeth as she did so. You're very kind. She held out her hand. May I take your bag? No, that's all right. She raised her shoulders and let them drop. Well, she said, you've missed the festival, of course, but there's a whole gang of us who did too, and we've sort of decided to have our own over the next few days, and, well, frankly, we need all the help we can get. All I can promise you is luxurious accommodation, great company, and more delectable preparations than you can shake a principal at, but if you care to make the sacrifice, I promise we'll all try to make it up to you. She flexed her eyebrows and then made a mock-frightened expression, pulling down the corners of her succulently perfect mouth. He let her hold the look for a moment, then patted her on the upper arm. No, thank you, he said sincerely. Her expression became one of hurt sadness. Oh, are you sure? she said in a small, softly vulnerable voice. Afraid so. Made my own arrangements, he said, with genuine but determined regret. But if there was anyone who was likely to tempt me away from them, it would be you. He winked at her. I'm flattered by your generous offer, and do tell SC I appreciate the trouble they've gone to. But this is my chance to cut loose for a few days, you know. He laughed. Don't worry. I'll have some fun, and then I'll be ready to ship on out when the time comes. He fished a small pen terminal out of one pocket and waved it in front of her face. And I'll keep my terminal with me at all times. Promise. He put the terminal back in his pocket. She gazed intently into his eyes for a few moments, then lowered her eyes and then her head and gave a small shrug. She looked back up, expression ironic. When she spoke... Her voice had changed as well, modulating into something deeper and more considered, almost regretful. Well, she sighed. I hope you enjoy yourself, Bayer, she grinned. Our offer stands if you wish to reconsider. Brave smile. My colleagues and I wish you well. She looked furtively round the busy concourse and bit her bottom lip, frowning slightly. Don't suppose you fancy a drink or something anyway, do you? she said, almost plaintively. He laughed, shook his head, and bowed as he backed off, hoisting his hold-all over his shoulder. Gaynor Hafoen had arrived a few days after the end of Tyr's annual festival. 
There was an air of autumnal desuetude mixed with high summer torpor about the place when he arrived. People were cleaning up, calming down, getting back to normal, and generally behaving themselves. He'd signalled ahead and succeeded in booking the services of an Eero troop, as well as reserving a garden penthouse in The View, the best hotel on level three. All in all, entirely worth passing up the rather too obvious advances of his perfect woman for. Well, no, it wasn't. Except it was when your perfect woman was almost certainly a special circumstances agent, altered to look like the creature of your fantasies and sent to look after you, keep you happy and safe, when what you actually wanted was a bit of variety, some excitement, and some unculture-like danger. His perfect partner certainly looked like the very splendid Verli of Shung, but she was even more positively not SC, not contact, and probably not even culture either. It was that desire for strangeness, for apartness, for alienness they probably couldn't understand. He lay in bed, pleasantly exhausted, the odd muscle quivering now and again of its own accord, surrounded by sleeping pulchritude, his head buzzing with the after-effects of some serious glanding, and watched the Tear News, Culture Bias channel, on a screen hanging in the air in front of the nearest tree. An earpip relayed the sound. Still leading with the Blitteringaway Deluge Saga, then came a feature on the increase in fleeting in culture ships. Fleeting was when two or more ship mines decided they were fed up being all by themselves and only being able to exchange the equivalent of letters. Instead, they got together, keeping physically close to each other so that they could converse. Operationally most inefficient. Some older mines were worried it represented their more recently built comrades going soft and wanted the premise states of mines which would be constructed in the future to be altered to deal with this weak, overly chummy decadence. Local news. There was a brief follow-up report basically saying that the mysterious explosion which had happened in Dock 807B on the third day of the festival was still a mystery. The affronta cruiser, Furious Purpose, had been lightly damaged by a small, pure energy detonation which had done nothing more than locally burn off a layer of its scar hull. An over-enthusiastic festival prank was suspected. Not quite so locally. The arguments were still going on about the creation of a new hintersphere, a few kilo years anti-spinward. A hintersphere was a volume of space in which FTL flights were banned except in the direst of emergencies, and life generally moved at a slower pace than elsewhere in the culture. Genar Hafoen shook his head at that one. Pretentious rusticism. Nearer home again, backup craft were only a day away from the location of the possible anomaly near Esperi. The discovering GCU was still reporting no change in the artifact. Despite requests from contact section, various other involved civilizations had sent, or were sending, ships to the general volume, but Tyr itself had forgone dispatching a craft. To the surprise of most observers, the affront had criticized the reaction of those who decided to be nosy and had stayed severely away from the anomaly, though there were unconfirmed reports of increased affront activity in the upper leaf swirl, and just today four ships off, Gaina Hafoen said quietly, and the screen duly vanished. One of the Eero troop stirred against him. He looked at her. The girl's face was the very image of that belonging to Zrain Tramau one-time captain of the good ship Problem Child. Her body was different from the original, altered in the direction of Gaynor Hofoen's tastes, but subtly. There were two like her, and three who looked exactly like famous personalities, an actress, a musician, and a lifestyler. Zrain and Enhoff, Spell, Pai, and Gidinli. They had all been perfectly charming, as well as being quite plausible impersonators, but Gaynor Hafoen thought you had to wonder at the mentality of people who actually chose to alter their appearance and behaviour every few days, just to suit the tastes, usually, though not always sexual, of others. But maybe he was just being a bit fuddy-duddy-ish. Perhaps they were slightly boring people otherwise, or perhaps they just liked to deal more variety in such matters than other people. Whatever their motivations, all five had fallen politely asleep on the AG bed after the fun, which had been preceded by a meal and a party. The troop's exemplary couple, Gakik and Leliril, were asleep too, lying in each other's arms on the carpet-like lawn between the bed platform and the stream which threaded its way from the tinkling waterfall in the pool. Dichumest, the man's prick, was almost normal-looking. Gaynor Hafoen felt slightly sleepy himself, but he was determined to stay awake for the whole holiday. He brushed the sleepiness back under the edges of his mind with a glandular release of gain. Doing this for three days solid would leave him needing lots of sleep, 
but there would be a week on the grey area, meat fucker, plenty of time to recover. The buzz of gain coursed through him, clearing his head and ridding his body of the effects of fatigue. Gradually, a feeling of rested, ready peacefulness washed over and through him. He clasped his hands behind his neck and gazed happily upwards past the fronds of a couple of overhanging trees at the blue, cloud-strewn sky. Just that movement, performed in the gravity of Tyr's standard G-level, gave him a good, light, almost childishly enjoyable sensation. A fronter standard gravity was more than twice the culture-promoted human norm, and he supposed it was a sign of how well and how easily his body had adapted to conditions on God's whole habitat that he had quickly and long since stopped noticing how much heavier he had felt from day to day. A thought occurred to him. He closed his eyes briefly, going quickly into the semi-trance that the average culture adult employed when they needed to and could be bothered to check on their physiological settings. He dug around inside various images of his body until he saw himself standing on a small sphere. The sphere was set at one standard gravity. His subconscious had registered the fact that he had been in a steady, reduced gravity field for longer than a few hours and had reset itself. Left to its own devices, his body would now start to lose bone and muscle mass, thin the walls of his blood vessels, and perform a hundred other tiny but consequential alterations the better to suit his frame, tissues and organs to that reduced severity of weight. Well, his subconscious was only doing its job, and it didn't know he would be back in a front of gravity again in a month or so. He increased the size of the sphere his image stood upon until it was back to the 2.1 gravities his body would have to readjust itself to once he returned to God's hole. There, that should do it. He cast a quick look round his internal states while he was here, not that there ought to be anything amiss. Warning signs made themselves obvious automatically. Sure enough, all was well. Fatigue being dealt with, presence of gain noted, blood sugar returning to normal, hormones generally being gathered back to optimum levels. He came out of the semi-trance, opened his eyes, and looked over at where the pen terminal lay on a sculpted, smoothly varnished tree stump at the bedside. So far, he had mostly used it to check up on the replies from his contact contacts, confirming what they could concerning this, so far, pleasantly undemanding mission. The terminal was supposed to blink a little light if it had a message stored for him. He was still waiting to hear from the GSV not invented here, the incident coordinator for the accession. The terminal lay where he'd left it, dull. No new messages. Oh well. He looked away and watched the clouds move in the sky for a while, then wondered what it looked like turned off. Sky off, he said, keeping his voice low. The sky disappeared, and the true ceiling of the penthouse suite was revealed. A slickly black surface studded with projectors, lights and miscellaneous bumps and indentations. The few gentle animal sounds faded away. In the View Hotel, every suite was a penthouse corner suite. There were four per floor, and the only floor which didn't have four penthouse suites was the very top one, which, so that nobody in the lower floors would feel they were missing out on the real thing when it was available, was restricted to housing some of the hotel's machinery and equipment. Gaynor Hafoens was called a jungle suite though it was entirely the most manicured, pest-free, and temperately temperature-controlled and generally civilized jungle he had ever heard of. Night sky on, he said quietly. The slick black ceiling was replaced by blackness, scattered with sharply bright stars. Some animal noises resumed, sounding different compared to those heard in the daylight. They were real animals, not recordings. Every now and again a bird would fly across the clearing where the bed was situated, or a fish would splash in the bathing pool, or a chattering simian would swing across the forest canopy, or a huge, glittering insect would burr delicately through the air. It was all terribly tasteful and immaculate, and Gaynor Hafoen was already starting to look forward to the evening, when he intended to dress in his best clothes and hit the town, which, in this case, was Night City, located one level almost straight down, where, traditionally, Anything on tier that could breathe a nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere and tolerate one standard gravity and had any sort of taste for diversion and excitement tended to congregate. A night in Night City would be just the thing to complete this first mad rush of fun at the onset of his short holiday. Calling ahead and ordering up a fabulously expensive aerotrope to act out his every sexual fantasy was one thing. One extremely wonderful and deeply satisfying thing beyond all doubt, he told himself, with all due solemnity. 
but the idea of a chance meeting with somebody else, another free, independent soul with their own desires and demands, their own reservations and requirements, that, just because it was all up to chance and up to negotiation, just because it all might end in nothing, in rejection, in the failure to impress and connect, in being found wanting rather than being wanted, that was a more valuable thing. That was an enterprise well worthy of the risk of rebuff. He glanded charge. That ought to do it. Seconds later, filled to bursting with the love of action, movement, and the blessed need to be doing something, he was bouncing out of bed, laughing to himself, and apologising to the sleepily grumbling but still palatably comely cast of the era troop. He skipped to the warm waterfall and stood under it. As he showered, he told a blue-furred, wise-looking little creature, dressed in a dapper waistcoat and sitting on a nearby tree, what clothes he wished prepared for the evening. It nodded and swung off through the branches. Chapter 6 It's nothing to worry about, Gaistra, the drone told him, as he stepped out of the bulky suit in the vestibule beyond the airlocks. Gaistra Ishmetit leant against a maniple field which the drone extended for him. He looked down the corridor to the main part of the accommodation unit, but there was no sign of anybody yet. The ship has come with new codes and updated security procedures, the drone continued. It's some years before these were due to be altered, but there has been some unusual activity in a nearby volume. Nothing threatening as such, but it's always best to be careful. So it's been decided to move things along a bit and perform the update now rather than later. The drone hung the man's suit up near the airlock doors, its surface sparkling with frost. Gaistra rubbed his hands together and accepted the trousers and jacket the drone handed him. He kept glancing down the corridor. The ship has been verified and authenticated by the necessary outside referees, the drone told him. So it's all above board, you see? The machine helped him button up the jacket and smoothed his thin, fair hair. The crew have asked to come inside. Just curious, really. Gaistra stared at the drone, obviously distressed, but the machine patted him on the shoulder with a rosy field and said, It'll be all right, Gaistra. I thought it only polite to grant their request, but you can stay out of their way if you like. Saying hello to them at first would probably go down well, but it isn't compulsory. The mind had its drone study the man for a moment, checking his breathing, heart rate, pupil dilation, skin response, pheromone output and brain waves. I know what, it said soothingly. We'll tell them you've taken a vow of silence. How's that? You can greet them formally, nod or whatever, and I'll do the talking. Would that be all right? Gaistra gulped and said, y -y 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 Yes. Yes, he said, nodding vigorously. That... that would be good. Good idea. Thank you. Right, the machine said, floating at the man's side as they headed down the corridor for the main reception area. They'll displace over in a few minutes. Like I say, just nod to them and let me say whatever has to be said. I'll make your excuses and you can go off to your suite if you like. I'm sure they won't mind being shown round by this drone. Meanwhile, I'll be receiving the new ciphers and routines. There's a lot of multiple checking and bureaucratic bookkeeping sort of stuff to be done, but even so, it should only take an hour or so. We won't offer them a meal or anything. With any luck, they'll take the hint and head off again. Leave us in peace, eh? After a moment, Gaistra nodded at this vigorously. The drone swivelled in the air at the man's side to show him it was looking at him. Does all this sound acceptable? I mean, I could put them off completely, tell them they're just not welcome, but it would be terribly rude, don't you think? Ye yes, Gestra said, frowning and looking distinctly uncertain. Rude. S suppose so. Rude. M mustn't be rude. Probably come a long way, should think. A smile flickered around his lips, like a small flame in a high wind. I think we can be pretty sure of that, the drone said, with a laugh in its voice. It clapped him gently on the back with a field. Gaistra was smiling a little more confidently as he walked into the accommodation unit's main reception area. 
The reception area was a large round room full of couches and chairs. Gaistra usually paid it no attention. It was just a largish space he had to walk through on his way to and back from the airlocks which led to the warship hangars. Now he looked at each of the plumply comfortable-looking seats and sofas as though they represented some terrible threat. He felt his nervousness return. He wiped his brow as the drone stopped by a couch and indicated he might like to sit. Let's have a look, shall we? the drone said as Gaistra sat. A screen appeared in the air on the far side of the room, starting as a bright dot, quickly widening to a line eight metres long, then seeming to unroll so that it filled the four-metre space between floor and ceiling. Blackness. Little lights. Space. Gaistra realised suddenly how long it had been since he'd seen such a view. Then, sweeping slowly into view, came a long, dark grey shape, sleek, symmetrical, double-ended, reminding Gaistra of the axle and hubs of a ship's windlass. The Killer Cast Limited Offensive Unit Attitude Adjuster, the drone said in a matter-of-fact, almost bored-sounding voice. Not a type we have here. Gaistra nodded. N no, he said, then stopped to clear his throat a few times. No pattern. Patterns on it. It's hull. That's right, the drone said. The ship was stopped now, almost filling the screen. The stars wheeled slowly behind it. Well, I... The drone said, then stopped. The screen on the far side of the room flickered. The drone's aura field flicked off. It fell out of the air, bouncing off the seat beside Gaistra and toppling heavily, lifelessly to the floor. Gaistra stared at it. A voice like a sigh said, Save yourself! Then the lights dimmed. There was a buzzing noise from all around Gaistra, and a tiny tendril of smoke leaked out of the top of the drone's casing. Gaistra leapt up out of the seat, staring wildly around, then jumped up on the seat, crouching there and staring at the drone. The little wisp of smoke was dissipating. The buzzing noise faded slowly. Gaistra squatted, hugging his knees with both arms and looking all about. The buzzing noise stopped. The screen collapsed to a line hanging in the air, then shrank to a dot, then winked out. After a moment, Gaistra reached forward with one hand and prodded the drone's casing with one hand. It felt warm and solid. It didn't move. A sequence of thuds from the far side of the room shook the air. Beyond where the screen had hung in the air, four tiny mirror spheres bloated suddenly, growing almost instantly to over three metres in diameter and hovering just above the floor. Gaistra jumped off the seat and started back away from the spheres. He rubbed his hands together and glanced back at the corridor to the airlock. The mirror spheres vanished like exploding balloons to reveal complicated things like tiny spaceships, not much smaller than the mirror spheres themselves. One of them rushed towards Gaistra, who turned and ran. He pelted down the corridor, running as fast as he could, his eyes wide, his face distorted with fear, his fists pumping. Something rushed up behind him, crashed into him and knocked him over, sending him sprawling and tumbling along the carpeted floor. He came to a stop. His face hurt when it had grazed along the carpet. He looked up, his heart twitching madly in his chest, his whole body shaking. Two of the miniature ship things had followed him into the corridor. Each floated a couple of metres away, one on either side of him. There was a strange smell in the air. Frost had formed on various parts of the ship things. The nearer one extended a thing like a long hose and went to take him by the neck. Gaistra ducked down and doubled himself up, lying on his side on the carpet, face tucked into his knees, arms hugging his shins. Something prodded him about the shoulders and rump. He could hear muffled voices coming from the two machines. He whimpered. Then something very hard slammed into his side. He heard a cracking noise and his arm burned with pain. He screamed, still trying to bury his face in his knees. He felt his bowels relax. Warmth flooded his pants. He was aware of something inside his head turning off the searing pain in his arm. But nothing could turn off the heat of shame and embarrassment. Tears filled his eyes. There was a noise like, Kah! 
then a whooshing noise, and a breeze touched his face and hands. After a moment, he looked up and saw that the two machines had gone down to the airlock doors. There was movement in the reception area, and then another one of the machines came down the corridor. It slowed down as it approached him. He ducked his head down again. Another whoosh and another breeze. He looked up again. The three machines were moving around near the airlock doors. Gestra sniffed back his tears. The three machines drew back from the doors, then settled down onto the ground. Gestra waited to see what would happen next. There was a flash and an explosion. The middle set of doors blew out in a burst of smoke that rolled up the corridor and then collapsed backwards, seemingly sucking the whole explosion back into where the doors had been. The doors had gone, leaving a dark hole. A breeze tugged at Gestra. Then the breeze turned to a wind, and the wind became a storm that howled and then screamed past him and then started moving him bodily along the floor. He shouted in fear, trying to grab hold of the carpet with his one good arm. He slid down the corridor in the roar of air, his fingers scrabbling for a grip. His nails dug in, found purchase, and his fingers closed around the fibres, pulling him to a stop. He heard thuds and looked up, gasping, towards the reception area, eyes streaming with tears as the wind whipped by him. Something moved, bouncing in the lighted doorway of the circular lounge. He saw the vague, rounded shape of a couch thudding into the floor twenty metres away and flying towards him on the howling stream of air. He heard himself shout something. The couch thudded into the floor ten metres away, tumbling end over end. He thought it was going to miss him, but one end of it smashed into his dangling feet, tearing him away. The storm of air picked him up bodily and he screamed as he fell with it, past the shapes of the three watching machines. One of his legs hit the jagged edges of the breach in the airlock doors and was torn off at the knee. He flew out into the huge space beyond. The air pulled from his mouth first by his scream and then by the vacuum of the hangar itself. He skidded to a stop on the cold hard floor of the hangar, fifty metres from the wrecked doors, blood oozing then freezing around his wounds. The cold and the utter silence closed in. He felt his lungs collapse, and something bubbled in his throat. His head ached as if his brain were about to burst out of his nose, eyes and ears, and his every tissue and bone seemed to ring with brief, stunning pain before going numb. He looked into the enveloping darkness, and up at the towering, heedless heights of the bizarrely patterned ships. Then the ice crystals forming in his eyes fractured the view, and made it splinter and multiply, as though seen through a prism, before it all went dim and then black. He was trying to shout, to cry out, but there was only a terrible, choking coldness in his throat. In a moment, he couldn't even move, frozen there on the floor of the vast space, immobile in his fear and confusion. The cold killed him, finally, shutting off his brain in concentric stages, freezing the higher functions first, then the lower mammal brain, then finally the primitive near-reptilian centre. His last thoughts were that he would never see his model sea ships again, nor know why the warships in the cold, dark halls were patterned so. Victory Commander Rising Moon Parch Season 4 of the Farsight Tribe nudged the suit forward, floating out through the torn doors of the airlock and into the hangar space. The ships were there. Gangster class. His gaze swept their ranks. Sixty-four of them. He had, privately, thought it might all be a hoax, some culture trick. At his side, his weapons officer steered his suit across the floor, over the body of the human, and up towards the nearest of the ships. The other suited figure, the affronter commander's personal guard, rotated, watching. If you'd waited another minute, the voice of the culture ship said tiredly through the suit's communicator, I could have opened the airlock doors for you. I'm sure you could, the commander said. Is the mind quite under your control? Entirely. Touchingly naive in the end. And the ships? Quiescent and disturbed asleep. They will believe whatever they are told. Good, the commander said. Begin the process of waking them. It is already underway. Nobody else here, his security officer said over the communicator. 
He'd gone on into the rest of the human accommodation section when they had made their way to the airlock doors. Anything of interest? the commander asked, following his weapons officer towards the nearest warship. He had to try to keep the excitement out of his voice. They had them. They had them. He had to break the suit hard. In his enthusiasm, he almost collided with his weapons officer. In the ruined suite that had been the place where the human had lived, the security officer swiveled in the vacuum, surveying the wreckage the evacuating whirlwind of air had left. Human coverings, clothes, items of furniture, some complicated structures, models of some sort. No, he said. Nothing of interest. Hmm, the ship said. Something about the tone communicated unease to the commander. At the same moment, his weapons officer turned his suit to him. Sir, he said. A light flicked on, picking out a metre diameter circle of the ship's hull. Its surface was riotously embellished and marked, covered in strange, sweeping designs. The weapons officer swept the light over nearby sections of the vessel's curved hull. It was all the same, all of it covered with these curious, whirled patterns and motifs. What? the commander said, concerned now. This... complexity, the weapons officer said, sounding perplexed. Internal, too, the culture ship broke in. It... the weapons officer said, spluttering. His suit moved closer to the warship's hull until it was almost touching. This will take forever to scan, he said. It goes down to the atomic level. What does? the commander said sharply. The ships have been barocked, to use the technical term, the culture ship said urbanely. It was always a possibility. It made a sighing noise. The vessels have been fractally inscribed with partially random, non-predictable designs, using up a little less than one percent of the mass of each craft. There is a chance that hidden in amongst that complexity will be independent security nanodevices, which will activate at the same time as each ship's main systems, and which will require some additional coded reassurance that all is well. Otherwise, they will attempt to disable or even destroy the ship. These will have to be looked for. As your weapons officer says, the craft will each have to be scanned at least down to the level of individual atoms. I shall begin this task the instant I have completed the reprogramming of the base's mind. This will delay us, that's all. The ships would have required scanning in any event, and in the meantime, nobody knows we're here. You will have your war fleet in a matter of days rather than hours, Commander, but you will have it. The weapons officer's spacesuit turned to face the commanders. The light illuminating the outlandish design switched off. Somehow, from the way he performed these actions, the weapons officer conveyed a mood of scepticism and perhaps even disgust to the commander. Ka! the commander said contemptuously. Whirling away and heading back towards the airlock doors, he needed to wreck something. The accommodation section ought to provide articles which would be satisfying but unimportant. His personal guard swept after him, weapons ready. Passing over the still-frozen body of the human, even that hadn't provided any sport. Commander Rising Moon Parch Season 4 of the Farsight Tribe and the battleship Xenoclast, on secondment to the alien ship Attitude Adjuster, unholstered one of the external weapons on his own suit and blasted the small figure into a thousand pieces, scattering fragments of frosty pink and white across the cold floor of the hangar, like a small, delicate fall of snow. Part 7 Tear Chapter 1 Such investigations took time. There was the time that even hyperspatially transmitted information took to traverse the significant percentages of the galaxy involved. There were complicated routes to arrange, other minds to talk to, sometimes after setting up appointments because they were absent in infinite fun space for a while. Then the minds had to be casualed up to, or gossip, or jokes, or thoughts on a mutual interest had to be exchanged before a request or a suggestion was put which rerouted and disguised an information search. Sometimes these reroutes took on extra loops, detours, and shuntings, as the minds concerned thought to play down their own involvement or involve somebody else on a whim, so that often wildly indirect paths resulted, 
branching and rebranching, and doubling back on themselves, until eventually the relevant question was asked, and the answer, assuming it was forthcoming, started the equally tortuous route back to the original requester. Frequently, simple seeker-agent programs or entire mind-state abstracts were sent off on even more complicated missions with detailed instructions on what to look for, where to find it, who to ask, and how to keep their tracks covered. Mostly, it was done like that. Through mines, AI core memories, and innumerable public storage systems, information reservoirs and databases containing schedules, itineraries, lists, plans, catalogues, registers, rosters, and agenda. Sometimes, though, when that way, the relatively easy, quick and simple way, was closed to the inquirer for some reason, usually to do with keeping the inquiry secret, things had to be done the slow way, the messy way, the physical way. Sometimes there was no alternative. The vacuum dirigible approached the floating island under a brilliantly clear night sky, awash with moon and starlight. The main body of the airship was a giant fat disc, half a kilometre across, with a finish like brushed aluminium. It glinted in the blue-grey light as if frosted, though the night was warm, balmy, and scented with a heady perfume of wine plant and sierra creeper. The craft's two gondolas, one on top, one suspended underneath, were smaller, thinner discs only three storeys in height, each slowly revolving in different directions, their edges glowing with lights. The sea beneath the airship was mostly black-dark, but in places it glowed dimly in giant, slowly fading Vs, as giant sea creatures surfaced to breathe or to sieve new levels of the waters for their tiny prey, and so disturbed the light-emitting plankton near the surface. The island floated high in the breeze-ruffled waters, its base a steeply fluted pillar that extended a kilometre down into the sea's salty depths, its thin, spire-like mountains thrusting a similar distance into the cloudless air. It, too, was scattered with lights, of small towns, villages, individual houses, lanterns on beaches, and smaller aircraft, most of them come out to welcome the vacuum dirigible. The two slowly revolving gondola sections slid gradually to a halt, preparatory to docking. People in both segments congregated on the sides nearest the island for the view. The airship system registered the imbalance building up and pumped bubble carbon spheres full of vacuum from one lot of tanks to another, so maintaining a suitably even keel. The island's main town drifted slowly closer, the docking tower bright with lights. Lasers, fireworks and searchlights all fought for attention. I really should go, Tish, the drone Gruda Plam said. I didn't promise, but I did kind of say I'd probably stop by. Oh, stop by on the way back, Tishlin said, waving his glass. Let them wait. He stood on the balcony outside one of the lower gondola's mid-level bars. The drone, a very old thing, like two grey-brown rounded cubes one on top of the other, and three-quarters the size of a human, floated beside him. They'd only met that day, four days into the cruise over the orbital's floating islands, and they'd got on famously, quite as though they'd been friends for a century or more. The drone was much older than the man, but they found they had the same attitudes, the same beliefs, and the same sense of humour. They both liked telling stories, too. Tishlin had the impression he hadn't yet scratched the veneer off the old machine's tales of when it had been in contact. A millennium before he had, and goodness knew he was considered an old codger these days. He liked the ancient machine. He'd really come on this cruise looking for romance, and he still hoped to find it. But in the meantime, finding such a perfect companion and raconteur had already made him glad he'd come. The trouble was, the drone was supposed to get off here and go to visit some old drone pals who lived on the island, before resuming its cruise on the next dirigible, due in a few days' time. A month from now, it would be leaving on the GSV that had brought it here. But I feel I'd be letting them down. Look, just stay another day, the man suggested. You never did finish telling me about, what was it, Bugrady? <laughs> yes, Bugrady, the old drone chuckled. Exactly, Bugrady, the sea nukes and the interference effect thing, or whatever it was. Down this way to launch a ship, the old drone agreed, and made a sighing noise. So, what did happen? 
Like I said, it's a long story. So stay tomorrow. Tell me it. You're a drone, for goodness sake. You can float back by yourself. But I said I'd visit them when the airship got here, Tish. Anyway, my AG units are to do a service, and they'd probably fail, and I'd end up at the bottom of the sea having to be rescued. Very embarrassing. Take a flyer back, the man said, watching the island's shore slide underneath. People gathered round fires on the beach, waved up at the craft. He could hear music drifting on the warm breeze. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> They'd probably be upset. Tishlin drank from his glass and frowned down at the waves breaking on the beach, which led towards the lights of the town. A particularly large and vivid firework detonated in the air directly above the bright docking tower. Oohs and ahs duly sounded round the crowded balcony. The man snapped his fingers. I know, he said. Send a mind state abstract. The big drone hesitated, then said, Oh, one of those. Hmm. Well, still not really the same thing, I think. Anyway, I've never done one. I'm not sure I really approve. I mean, it's you, but it's not you, you know. Tishlin nodded. Certainly do know. Can't say I think they're as, you know, benign as they're cracked up to be either. I mean, it's supposed to act sentient without being sentient. So isn't it actually sentient? What happens to it when it's just turned off? I'm not convinced there isn't some sort of iffy morality here either. But uh, I've done it myself. Talked into it. Reservations, like you say, but... He looked round, then leant closer to the machine's dull brown casing. Bit of a contact thing, actually. Really, the old machine said, tipping its whole body away from him for a moment, and tipping it back so that it leant towards him. It extended a field round the two of them. The exterior sounds faded. When it spoke again, it was with a slight echo that indicated the field was keeping whatever they said between the two of them. What was that? Well, wait a moment. If you weren't supposed to tell anybody... Tishlin weaved his hand... Well, not officially, he said, brushing white hair over one ear. But you're a contact veteran, and, and you know how SC always dramatizes things. <laughs> See, the drone said, its voice rising. You didn't say it was them. I'm not sure I want to hear this, it said through a chuckle. Well, they asked a favor, the man said, quietly pleased that he seemed finally to have impressed the old drone. Sort of a family thing. I had to record one of these damn things so it could go and convince a nephew of mine he should do his bit for the great and good cause. Last I heard, the boy had done the decent thing and taken ship for some eccentric GSV. He watched the outskirts of the town slide underneath. A flower-garlanded terrace held groups of people pattern-dancing. He could imagine the hoops and wild whirling music. The scent of roasting meat came curling over the balcony parapet and made it through the hush field. They asked if I wanted it to be reincorporated after it had done its job, he told the drone. They said it could be sent back and sort of put back inside my head, but I said no. Give me a creepy feeling just thinking about it. What if it had changed a lot while it was away? Why, I might end up wanting to join some retreatist order or, or to euthanize or something. He shook his head and drained his glass. No, I said no. No, the damn thing never was really alive, but if it was, or is, then it's not getting back into my head. No, thank you. I'm sorry. Well, if what they told you is true, it's yours to do with as you wish, isn't it? Exactly. Well, I don't think I'll take the same step, the drone said, sounding thoughtful. It swiveled as though to face him. The field around them collapsed. The sound of the fireworks returned. Tell you what, the old drone said. I will get off here and see the guys, but I'll catch up with you in a couple of days, all right? We'll probably fall out in a day or two anyway. They're cantankerous old buggers, frankly. I'll take a flyer or try floating myself if I feel adventurous. Deal? It extended a field. Deal, Tishlin said, slapping the field with his hand. The drone Gruder Aplum had already contacted its old friend, the GCU, its character forming, currently housed in the GSV Zero Gravitas, which was at that point docked under a distant plate of Sedan Orbital. 
the GCU communicated with the orbital hub, Tsikiliepre, which in turn contacted the ulterior entity High Point, which signaled the LSV Mysophist, which passed the message on to the university mind at Oara on Kasli Plate in the Jubawal system, which duly relayed the signal along with an interesting series of rhyme scheme glyphs, ordinary poems and word games, all based on the original signal, to its favoured protégé, the LSV, Serious Callers Only. Stuttered tight point M32 Tra point at N4.28.866.2083 From LSV Serious Callers Only to Eccentric Shoot Them Later It is Gaynor Hoffowin. I'm now convinced. I'm not certain why he may be important to the conspiracy, but he surely is. I've drawn up a plan to intercept him on Tyr. The plan involves Phage Rock. Will you back me up if I request its aid? Stuttered tight point M32 tra point at N4.28.866.2568 From eccentric shoot them later to LSV serious callers only. My dear old friend, of course. Thank you. I shall make the request immediately. We shall be reduced to dealing with amateurs, I'm afraid. However, I hope to find a high-profile amateur. A degree of fame may protect where SC training is not available. What of our fellow counter-conspirator? No word. Perhaps it's spending more time in the land of if. On the ship and pittance, arriving in eleven and a half days' time. Hmm. Four days after the time it will take for us to get somebody to tear. It is within the bounds of possibility the ship will be heading into a threatening situation. Is it able to take care of itself? Oh, I think it's capable of giving a good account of itself. Just because I'm eccentric doesn't mean I don't know some big hitters. Let us hope such throw weight is not required. Absolutely. Chapter 2 On a certain scale, a plate-class general systems vehicle was quite a simple construction. Contained within its wrapping of external fields, its material body was four kilometres thick. The lowest thousand metres was almost all engine. The middle two vertical kilometres were ship space, an enclosed network of dockyards, hangars and bays, like a vast multi-layered cubist cave system. And the topmost thousand metres comprised accommodation, most of it for humans. Using these broad brush figures, it was a simple matter for anybody to work out the craft's approximate maximum speed from the cubic kilometrage of its engines, the number of ships of any given size it could contain, according to the volume given over to the various sizes of bays and engineering space, and the total number of humans it could accommodate by simply adding up how many cubic kilometres were given over to their living space. The sleeper service had retained an almost pristine original specification internally, which was a rare thing in an eccentric vessel. Usually, the first thing they did was drastically reconfigure their physical shape and internal layout according to the dictates of some private aesthetic, driving obsession, or just plain whim. But the fact the sleeper service had stuck to its initial design and merely added its own private ocean and gas giant environment on the outside made it relatively easy to measure its actual behaviour against what it ought to be capable of, and so ensure that it wasn't up to any extra mischief besides being eccentric in the first place. In addition to such simple arithmetical estimates of a ship's capability, it was, of course, always a good idea when dealing with an eccentric craft to have just that little extra bit of an edge. Intelligence, to be specific. An inside view. A spy. As it approached the Dreve system, the plate-class GSV sleeper service was travelling at its usual cruising speed of about 40 kilolites. It had already announced its desire to stop off in the inner system, and so duly started breaking as it passed through the orbit of the system's outermost planet, a light week distance from the sun itself. The yawning angel, the GSV which was shadowing the larger craft, decelerated at the same rate, a few billion kilometres behind. The yawning angel was the latest in a long line of GSVs which had agreed to take a shift as the sleeper service's escort. It wasn't a particularly demanding task, Indeed, no sensible GSV would wish it to be, though there was a small amount of vicarious glamour associated with it, guarding the weirdo, letting it roam wherever it wanted, but maintaining the fraternal vigilance that such an enormously powerful craft, espousing such an eccentric credo, patently merited. The only qualifications for being a sleeper service shadow were that one was regarded as being reliable, and that one was capable of staying with the SS if it ever decided to make a dash for it. 
In other words, one had to be quicker than it. The yawning angel had done the job for the best part of a year and found it undemanding. Naturally, it was somewhat annoying not to be able to draw up one's own course schedule, but providing one took the right attitude and dispensed with the standard mind conviction that held efficiency to the absolute bottom line of everything, it could be an oddly enhancing, even liberating experience. GSVs were always wanted in many more places at the same time than it was possible to be, and it was something of a relief to be able to blame somebody else when one had to frustrate people's and other ships' wishes and requests. This stop at Dreve had not been anticipated, for example. The SS's course had seemed set on a reasonably predictable path which would take it through the next month. But now it was here, the Yawning Angel would be able to drop off a few ships, take another couple on and swap some personnel. There should be time. The SS had never acknowledged the presence of any of the vessels tailing it, and it hadn't posted a course schedule since it had turned eccentric forty years earlier. But it had certain obligations in terms of setting reawakened people back in the land of the living again, and it always announced how long it would be staying in the systems it visited. It would be here in Dreve for a week. An unusually long time. It had never stayed anywhere for longer than three days before. The implication, according to the group of ships considered experts on the behaviour of the sleeper service, and given what the GSV itself had been saying in its increasingly rare communications, was that it was about to offload all its charges, all the stories and all the big sea, air and gas giant dwelling creatures it had collected over the decades would be moved, physically presumably rather than displaced, to compatible habitats. Dreve would be an ideal system to do this in. It had been a culture system for 4,000 years, comprising nine more or less wilderness worlds and three orbitals. Hoops, giant bracelets of living space only a few thousand kilometres across, but ten million kilometres in diameter calmly gyrating in their own carefully aligned orbits and housing nearly 70 billion souls. Some of those souls were far from human. One third of each of the system's orbitals was given over to ecosystems designed for quite different creatures. Gas giant dwellers on one, methane atmospherians on another, and high temperature silicon creatures on another. The fauna the SS had picked up from other gas giant planets would all fit comfortably into a subsection of the orbital designed with such animals in mind and the sea and air creatures ought to be able to find homes on that or either of the other worlds. A week to hang around. The Yawning Angel thought that would go down particularly well with its human crew. One of the many tiny but significant and painful ways a GSV could lose face amongst its peers was through a higher-than-average crew turnover rate. And while it had been expecting it, the Yawning Angel had found the experience most distressing when people had announced they were fed up not being able to have any reliable advance notice of where they were going from week to week and month to month, and so had decided to live elsewhere. All its protestations had been to no avail. What would, in effect, be a week's leave in such a cosmopolitan, sophisticated and welcoming system really should convince a whole load of those currently wavering between loyalty and ship-jumping that it was worth staying on with the good old Yawning Angel, it was sure. The sleeper service came to an orbit relative stop a quarter turn in advance along the path of the middle orbital, the most efficient position to assume to distribute its cargo of people and animals evenly amongst all three worlds. Permission to do so was finally received from the last of the orbital's hub mines, and the sleeper service duly began getting ready to unload. The yawning angel watched from afar as the larger craft detached its traction fields from the energy grid beneath real space, closed down its primary and ahead scan fields, dropped its curtain shields, and generally made the many great and small adjustments a ship normally made when one was intending to stick around somewhere for a while. The sleeper service's external appearance remained the same as ever. A silvery ellipsoid, 90 kilometres long, 60 across the beam, and 20 in height. After a few minutes, however, Smaller craft began to appear from that reflective barrier of fields, speeding towards the three orbitals with their cargoes of stored people and sedated animals. All this matched with the intelligence the Yawning Angel had already received regarding the setup and intentions of the eccentric GSV. So far, so good, then. Content that all was well, the Yawning Angel drifted in to match velocities with Terioka, the middle orbital, and the one with the gas-giant environments.
It docked underneath the orbital's most popular section and drew up a variety of travel and leave arrangements for its own inhabitants, while setting up a schedule of visits, events and parties aboard to thank its hosts for their hospitality. Everything went swimmingly, until the second day. Then, without warning, just after dawn had broken over the part of the orbital the yawning angel had docked beneath, stored bodies and giant animals started popping into existence all over Terioka. Posed people, some still in the clothes or uniforms of the tableau they'd been part of on board the sleeper service, suddenly appeared inside sports halls, on beaches, terraces, boardwalks and pavements, in parks, plazas, deserted stadia, and every other sort of public space the orbital had to offer. To the few people who witnessed these events, it was obvious the bodies had been displaced. The appearance of each was signalled by a tiny point of light blinking into existence just above waist level. This expanded rapidly to a two-metre grey sphere, which promptly popped and disappeared, leaving behind the immobile story. Unmoving people were left lying on dewy grass or sitting on park benches, or scattered by the hundred across the patterned mosaic of squares and piazzas, as though after some terrible disaster or a particularly assertive public sculpture exhibition. Dim cleaning machines spiralling methodically within such spaces were left bemused, picking erratic courses amongst the rash of new and unexpected obstructions. In the seas, the surface swelled and bulged in hundreds of different places, as whole globes of water were carefully displaced just beneath the surface. The sea creatures contained within were still gently sedated, and moved sluggishly in their giant fishbowls, each of which retained its separation from the surrounding water for a few hours, osmosing fields gradually adjusting the conditions within to those in the sea outside. In the air, similar gauzy fields surrounded whole flocks of buoyant atmosphere fauna, bobbing groggily in the breeze. Further along the vast shallow sweep of the orbital, the gas giant environments were witness to equivalent scenes of near-instant immigration, followed by gradual integration. The Yawning Angel's own drones, its ambassadors on the orbital, were witness to a handful of these sudden manifestations. After a nanosecond's delay to ask permission, the GSV clicked into the orbital's own monitoring systems, and so watched with growing horror as hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands more stored bodies and animals came thumping into existence all over the surface and all through the air, water and gas ecologies of Terioka. The Yawning Angel flashwoke all its systems and switched its attention to the sleeper service. The big GSV was already moving rolling and twisting to a point directly upwards out of the system. Its engine fields reconnected with the energy grid, its scanners were all already back online, and the rest of its multi-layered field complex was rapidly configuring itself for sustained deep space travel. It moved off, not especially quickly. Its displacers had switched to pick rather than put now. In a matter of seconds, they had snapped almost its entire fleet of smaller ships out of the system, their genuine yet deceptive delivery missions completed. Only the furthest, most massive vessels were left behind. The Yawning Angel was already frantically making its own preparations to depart in pursuit, closing off most of its transit corridors, snap displacing drones from the orbital, hurrying through a permission to depart request to the world's hub and drawing up schedules for ferrying people back to the orbital on smaller craft once it had got underway, while at the same time bringing other personnel back before its own velocity grew too great. It knew it was wasting its energy, but it signalled the sleeper service anyway. Meanwhile, it watched intently as the departing ship accelerated away. The yawning angel was gauging, judging, calibrating. It was looking for a figure, comparing an aspect of the reality that was the absconding craft with the abstraction that was a simple but crucial equation. If the sleeper service's velocity could at any point over time be described by a value greater than 0.54 times ns squared, the yawning angel might be in trouble. It might be in trouble anyway, but if the larger vessel was accelerating significantly quicker than its normal design parameters implied, allowing for the extra mass of the craft's extraneous environments, then that trouble started right now. As it was, the yawning angel was relieved to see the sleeper service was moving away at exactly that rate. The ship was still perfectly apprehendable, and even if the yawning angel waited for another day without doing anything, it would still be able to track the larger craft with ease and catch up with it within two days. Still suspecting some sort of trick, the Yawning Angel started an observation routine throughout the system for unexpected displacings of gigatons of water and gas giant atmosphere. 
Suddenly dumping all that extra volume and mass now would be one way the sleeper service could put on an extra burst of speed, even if it would still be significantly slower than the Yawning Angel. The smaller GSV retransmitted its polite but insistent signal. Still no reply from the sleeper service. No surprise there, then. The Yawning Angel signaled to tell other contact craft what was happening and sent one of its fastest ships, a cliff-class superlifter stationed in space outside the GSV zone fields for exactly this sort of eventuality, in pursuit of the escaping GSV, just so it would know this precocious, irksome action was being taken seriously. Probably the sleeper service was simply being awkward rather than up to something more momentous, but the Yawning Angel couldn't ignore the fact the larger craft was abandoning a significant proportion of its smaller ships and had resorted to displacing people and animals. Displacing was, especially at such speed, inherently and unfinessably dangerous. The risk of something going horribly, terminally wrong was only about one in eighty million for any single displacement event. But that was still enough to put the average, fussily perfectionist ship mind off using the process for anything alive except in the direst of emergencies. And the sleeper service, assuming it had rid itself of its entire complement of souls, must have carried out 30,000-plus displacements in a minute or less, nudging the odds up well into the sort of likelihood of fuck-up range any sane mind would normally recoil from in utter horror. Even allowing for the sleeper service's eccentricity, that did tend to indicate that there was something more than usually urgent or significant about its current actions. The Yawning Angel looked up what was in effect an annoyance chart. It could leave right now, within a hundred seconds, and aggravate lots of people because they were on board itself instead of the orbital, or vice versa. Or it could depart within twenty hours and leave everybody back where they ought to be, even if they were irritated at their plans being upset. Compromise. It set an eight-hour departure time. Terminals in the shape of rings, pens, earrings, brooches, articles of clothing, and the inbuilt versions, neural laces, woke startled culture personnel all over the orbital and the wider system, insisting on relaying their urgent message. So much for keeping everybody happy with a week's leave. The sleeper service accelerated smoothly away into the darkness, already well clear of the system. It began to induct, flittering between inferior and superior hyperspace, its apparent real space velocity jumped almost instantly by a factor of exactly twenty-three. Again, the yawning angel was comforted to see spot on. No unpleasant surprises. The superlifter Charitable View raced after the fleeing craft, its engines unstressed, energy expenditure throttled well back, also threading its way between the layers of four-dimensional space. The process had been compared to a flying fish zipping from water to air and back again, except that every second air jump was into a layer of air beneath the water, not above it, which was where the analogy did rather break down. The Yawning Angel was quickly customising thousands of carefully composed, exquisitely phrased apologies to its personnel and hosts. Its schedule of ship returns varied to reflect the different courses the sleeper service might take if it didn't remain on its present heading didn't look too problematic. It had delayed letting people venture far away until the sleeper service had sent most of its own fleet out, an action even it had thought overcautious at the time, but which now seemed almost prescient. It delegated part of its intellectual resources to drawing up a list of treats and blandishments with which to mollify its own people when they returned, and planned for a two-week return to Dreve, packed with festivities and celebrations, to say sorry when it was free of the obligation to follow this accursed machine, and was able to draw up its own course schedule again. The charitable view reported that the sleeper service was still proceeding as could be expected. The situation, it appeared, was in hand. The Yawning Angel reviewed its own actions so far and found them exemplary. This was all very vexing, but it was responding well, playing it by the book where possible, and extemporising sensibly, but with all due urgency where it had to. Good. Good. It could well come out of this shining. Three hours, twenty-six minutes and seventeen seconds after setting off, the General Systems Vehicle Sleeper Service reached its nominal terminal acceleration point. This was where it ought to stop gaining speed, plump for one of the two hyperspatial volumes, and just cruise along at a nice, steady velocity. It didn't. Instead, it accelerated harder. That point fifty-four figure zoomed quickly to point seventy-two, the plate class's normal design maximum. The charitable view communicated this turn of events back to the Yawning Angel, 
which went into shock for about a millisecond. It rechecked all its in-system ships, drones, sensors, and external reports. There was no sign that the sleeper service had dumped its extra mass anywhere within range of the Yawning Angel's sensors. Yet it was behaving as though it had. Where had it done it? Could it have secretly built longer-range displacers? No. Half its mass would have been required to construct a displacer capable of dumping so much volume beyond the range of the Yawning Angel sensors, and that included all the extra mass it had taken on board over the years in the form of the extraneous environments in the first place. Though, now that it was thinking in such outrageous terms, there was another associated possibility that just might... But no, that couldn't be. There had been no intelligence, no hint. No, it didn't even want to think about that. The Yawning Angel rescheduled everything it had already arranged in a flurry of redrafted apologies, pleas for understanding, and truncated journeys. It halved the departure warning time it had given. Thirty-three minutes to departure now. The situation, it tried to explain to everybody, was becoming more urgent. The sleeper service's acceleration figures remained steady at their design maxima for another twenty minutes, though the charitable view, keeping a careful watch on every aspect of the GSV's performance from its station a few real space light days behind, reported some odd events at the junctions of the sleeper service's traction fields with the energy grid. By now, the yawning angel was existing in a state of quiveringly ghastly tension. It was thinking at maximum capacity, worrying at full speed, suddenly and appallingly aware how long things took to happen. A human in the same state would have been clutching a churning stomach, tearing their hair out and gibbering incoherently. Look at these humans. How could such glacial slowness even be called life? An age could pass. Virtual empires rise and fall in the time they took to open their mouths to utter some new inanity. Ships. Even ships. They were restricted to speeds below the speed of sound in the bubble of air around the ship and the docks it was joined to. It reviewed how practicable it would be to just let the air go and move everything in vacuum. It made sense. Thankfully, it had already shifted all vulnerable pleasure craft out of the way and sealed and secured its unconnected hull apertures. It told the hub what it was doing. The hub objected because it was losing some of its air. The GSV dumped the air anyway. Everything started moving a little faster. The hub screamed in protest, but it ignored it. Calm. Calm. It had to remain calm. Stay focused. Keep the most important objectives in mind. A wave of what would have been nausea in a human swept through the yawning angel's mind as a signal came in from the charitable view. Now what? Whatever it might have feared, this was worse. The sleeper service's acceleration factor had started to increase. Almost at the same time, it had exceeded its normal maximum sustainable velocity. Fascinated, appalled, terrified, the yawning angel listened to a running commentary on the other GSV's progress from its increasingly distant child, even as it started the sequence of actions and commands that would lead to its own near-instant departure. Twelve minutes early, but that couldn't be helped, and if people were pissed off, too bad. Still increasing. Time to go. Disconnect. There. The charitable view signalled that the sleeper service's outermost field extent had shrunk to within a kilometre of naked hull minima. The yawning angel dropped away from the orbital, twisting and aiming and punching away into hyperspace, only a few kilometres away from the world's undersurface. Ignoring incandescent howls of protest from the hub over such impolite and feasibly dangerous behaviour, and the astonished, but slow, so slow, yelps from people who an instant earlier had been walking down a transit corridor towards a welcoming foyer in the GSV, and now found themselves bumping into emergency seal fields and staring at nothing but blackness and stars. The superlifter's continuous report went on. The sleeper service's acceleration kept on increasing slowly but steadily. Then it paused, dropping to zero. The craft's velocity remained constant. Could that be it? It was still catchable. Panic over? Then the fleeing ship's velocity increased again, as did its rate of acceleration. Impossible! The horrific thought, which briefly crossed the yawning angel's mind moments earlier, settled down to stay with all the gruesome deliberation of a self-invited houseguest. It did the arithmetic. 
Take a plate class GSV's locomotive power, output per cubic kilometre of engine, add on 16 cubic clicks of extra drive at that push per cube value, make that 32 at a time, and it matched the step in the sleeper service's acceleration it had just witnessed. General bays. Great grief. It had filled its general bays with engine. The charitable view reported another smooth increase in the sleeper service's rate of progress, leading to another step, another pause. It was increasing its own acceleration to match. The yawning angel sped after the two of them, already fearing the worst. Do the sums, do the sums. The sleeper service had filled at least four of its general bays with extra engine, bringing them online two at a time, balancing the additional impetus. Another increase. Six. Probably all eight, then. What about the engineering space behind? Had that gone too? Sums, sums. How much mass had there been aboard the damn thing? Water, gas giant atmosphere, highly pressurised. About 4,000 cubic kilometres of water alone. Four gigatons. Compress it, alter it, transmute it, convert it into the ultra-dense exotic materials that comprise an engine capable of reaching out and down to the energy grid that underlay the universe and pushing against it. Ample. Ample. More than enough. It would take months, even years, to build that sort of extra engine capacity. Or only days, if you'd spent, say, the last few decades preparing the ground. Dear, holy shit! If it was all engine, even the superlifter wouldn't be able to keep up with it. The average plate class could sustain about 104 kilolites, more or less, indefinitely. A good range class, which is what the Yawning Angel had always been proud to count itself as, could easily beat that by 40 kilolites. A cliff-class superlifter was 90% engine, faster even than a rapid offensive unit in short bursts. The charitable view could hit 221 flat out, but that was only supposed to be for an hour or two at a time. That was chase speed, catch-up speed, not something it could maintain for long. The figure the Yawning Angel was looking at was the thick end of 233, if the sleeper service's engineering space had been packed with Engine 2. The charitable view's tone had already turned from one of amusement to amazement, then bewilderment. Now it was plain peevish. The sleeper service was topping the 215 mark and showing no signs of slowing down. The superlifter would have to break away within minutes if it didn't top out soon. It asked for instructions. The yawning angel, still accelerating for all it's worth, determined to track and follow for as long as it could, or until it was asked to give up the chase, told its offspring craft not to exceed its design parameters, not to risk damage. The sleeper service went on accelerating. The superlifter, Charitable View, gave up the chase at 220. It settled back to a less frenetic 200, dropping back all the time. Even so, it was still not a speed it could maintain for more than a few hours. The Yawning Angel topped out at 146. The sleeper service finally hit cruise at around 233 and a half, disappearing ahead into the depths of galactic space. The superlifter reported this, but sounded like it couldn't believe it. The Yawning Angel watched the other GSV race away into the everlasting night between the stars, a sense of hopelessness, of defeat settling over it. Now it knew it had shaken off its pursuers, the sleeper service's course was starting to curve gently, no doubt the first of many ducks and weaves it would carry out, if it was trying to conceal its eventual goal, and assuming that it had a goal, other than simply giving the slip to its minders. Somehow, the yawning angel suspected its eccentric charge, or X-charge, did have a definite goal. A place, a location it was headed for. 233,000 times the speed of light? Dear, holy fucking shit! The Yawning Angel thought there was something almost vulgar about such a velocity. Where the hell was it heading for? Andromeda? The Yawning Angel drew a coarse probability cone through the galactic model it kept in its mind. It supposed it all depended how devious the sleeper service was being but it looked like it might be headed for the upper leaf swirl. If it was, it would be there within three weeks. The yawning angel signalled ahead. Look on the bright side. At least the problem was out of its fields now.
The avatar Amorphia stood, arms crossed, thin, black-gloved hands grasping at bony elbows, gaze fastened intently upon the screen on the far side of the lounge. It showed a compensated view of hyperspace, vastly magnified. Looking into the screen was like peering into some vast planetary airscape. Far below was a layer of glowing mist, representing the energy grid. Above was an identical layer of bright cloud. The skein of real space lay in between both of these. A two-dimensional layer, a simple transparent plane which the GSV went flickering through, like a weaving shuttle across an infinite loom. Far, far behind it, the tiny dot that was the superlifter shrank still further. It, too, had been bobbing up and down through the skein on a sine wave whose length was measured in light minutes, but now it had stopped oscillating, settling into the lower level of hyperspace. The magnification jumped. The superlifter was a larger dot now, but still dropping back all the time. A light point, tracing its own once wavy, now straight course even further behind, was the pursuing GSV. The star of the Dreve system was a bright spot back beyond that, stationary in the skein. The sleeper service reached its maximum velocity and also ceased to oscillate between the two regions of hyperspace, settling into the larger of the two infinities that was ultraspace. The two following ships did the same, increasing their speed fractionally but briefly. A purist would call the place where they now existed ultraspace one positive, though as nobody had ever had access to ultraspace one negative, or infraspace one positive, for that matter, it was a redundant, even pedantic distinction or it had been until now. That might be about to change if the accession could deliver what it appeared to promise. Amorphia took a deep breath and then let it go. The view clicked off and the screen disappeared. The avatar turned to look at the woman, Dajil Gillian, and the black bird, Gradius. They were in a recreation area on the Ridge-class GCU, Jaundiced Outlook, housed in a bay in one of the sleeper service's mid-top strakes. The lounge was pretty well standard contact issue, deceptively spacious, stylishly comfortable, punctuated by plants and subdued lighting. This ship was to be the woman's home for the rest of the journey, a lifeboat ready to quit the larger craft at a moment's notice and take her to safety if anything went wrong. She sat on a white recliner chair, dressed in a long red dress, calm but wide-eyed, one hand cupped upon her swollen belly. The black bird perched on one arm of the seat near her hand. The avatar smiled down at the woman. There, it said. It made a show of looking around. Alone at last. It laughed lightly, then looked down at the black bird, its smile disappearing. Whereas you, it said, will not be again. Gravius jerked upright. Neck stretching. What? it asked. Gillian looked surprised, then concerned. Amorphia glanced to one side. A small device like a stubby pen floated out of the shadows cast by a small tree. It coasted up to the bird, which shrank back and back from the small silent missile, until it almost fell off the arm of the chair, its blue-black beak centimetres from the nose cone of the tiny, intricate machine. This is a scout missile, bird, Amorphia told it. Do not be deceived by its innocent title. If you so much as think of committing another act of treachery, it will happily reduce you to hot gas. It is going to follow you everywhere. Don't do as I have done. Do as I say. And don't try to shake it off. There is a tracer nanotech on you, in you, which will make it a simple matter to follow you. It should be correctly embedded by now, replacing the original tissue. What? the bird screeched again, head jerking up and back. If you want to remove it, Amorphia continued smoothly, you may, of course. You'll find it in your heart, primary aortic valve. The bird made a screaming noise and thrashed vertically into the air. Dajil flinched, covering her face with her hands. Gravius wheeled in the air and beat hard for the nearest corridor. Amorphia watched it go from beneath cold, lid-hooded eyes. Dajil put both her hands on her abdomen. She swallowed. Something black drifted down past her face, and she picked it out of the air. A feather. Sorry about that, Amorphia said. What? 
What was all that about? Gideon asked. Amorphia shrugged. The bird is a spy, it said flatly. Has been from the first. It got its reports to the outside by encoding them on a bacterium and depositing them on the bodies of people about to be returned for reawakening. I knew about it twenty years ago, but let it pass after checking each signal. It was never allowed to know anything the disclosure of which could pose a threat. Its last message was the only one I ever altered. It helped facilitate our escape from the attentions of the yawning angel. Amorphia grinned almost childishly. There is nothing further it can do. I set the scout missile on it to punish it, really. If it distresses you, I'll call it off. Dajil Jelian looked up into the steady grey eyes of the cadaverous, dark-clad creature for some time, quite as if she hadn't even heard the question. Amorphia, she said, please, what is going on? What is really going on? The ship's avatar looked pained for a moment. It looked away towards the plant the scout missile had been hiding underneath. Whatever else, it said awkwardly, formally, Always remember that you are free to leave me at any time. This GCU is entirely at your disposal, and no order or request of mine will affect its actions. It looked back at her. It shook its head, but its voice sounded kinder when it spoke again. I'm sorry, Gillian. I still can't tell you very much. We are going to a place near a star called Esperi. The creature hesitated, as though unsure gaze roaming the floor and the nearby seats. Because I want to, it said eventually, as though only realizing this itself for the first time. Because there may be something I can do there. It raised its arms out from its body, let them fall again. And in the meantime, we await a guest. Or at any rate, I await a guest. You may not care to. Who? the woman asked. Haven't you guessed? The avatar said softly. Bayer Gaynar Hofoen. The woman looked down then, and her brows slowly creased, and the dark feather she had caught fell from her fingers. Chapter 3 Stuttered Tight Point M32, tra point at N4.28.867.4406. From Serious Callers Only to Eccentric Shoot Them Later. Have you heard? Was I not right about Gaynor Hofowen? Do the times not now start to tally? Stuttered tight point. M32, tra point at N4.28.868.4886. From Eccentric Shoot Them Later to LSV Serious Callers Only. Yes. Two, three, three. What's it doing? Going for some kind of record? Yes, 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 all right, you were correct about the human. But why didn't you have any warning of this? I don't know. Two decades of reliable but totally boring reports, and then just when it might have been handy to know what the big bug was really up to, the intelligence conduit caves in. All I can think of is that our mutual friend, your oh, hell, might as well call it by its real name now, I suppose, is that the sleeper service discovered the link. We don't know when, and waited until it had something to hide before it started messing with our intelligence. Yes, but what's it doing? We thought it was just being invited to join the group out of politeness, didn't we? Suddenly it's acting like a fucking missile. What's it up to? This may seem rather obvious, but we could always just ask it. Tried that, still waiting. Well, you could have said. I beg your pardon, so now what? Now I get a load of bullshit from the steely glint. Excuse me. Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.868.8243. From LSV serious callers only to GCV steely glint. Our mutual friend with the velocity obsession... This wouldn't be what we really expected, would it? Some private deal, by any chance. Tight beam M32, tra point at N4.28.868.8499. From GCV Steely Glint to LSV Serious Callers Only. No, it isn't. I'm getting fed up repeating this. I should have posted a general notice. No, we wanted the damn thing's view, some sort of entirely outside viewpoint, not it tearing off to anywhere near the accession itself. 
It was part of the gang before, you know. We owed it that, no matter that it is now eccentric. Would that we had known how much. Now we've got another horrendous variable screwing up our plans. If you have any helpful suggestions, I'd be pleased to hear them. If all you can do is make snide insinuations, then it would probably benefit all concerned if you bestowed the fruits of your prodigious wit on someone with a spare time to give them the consideration they doubtless deserve. Stuttered type point, M32, tra point at N4.28.868.8978. From LSV serious callers only to eccentric shoot them later. Signal file attached. What did I tell you? I don't know about this. Looks suspicious to me. Hmm, and I don't know either. I hate to say it, but it sounds genuine. Of course, if I prove to be wrong, you will never confront me with this ever, all right? If, after all this is over, we are both still in a position for me to confer and you to benefit from such leniency, I shall be infinitely glad to extend such forbearance. Well, that could have been expressed more graciously, but I accept this moral blank check with all the deference it merits. I'm going to call the sleeper service. It won't take any notice of me, but I'm going to call the meat worm anyway. Chapter 4 Gaynor Hafoen didn't take his pen terminal with him when he went out that evening, and the first place he visited in Night City was a tier syndicate Ishlosinami tech store. The woman was small for an Ishi, thought Gaynor Hafoen. Still, she towered over him. She wore the usual long black robes, and she smelled... musty. They sat on plain, narrow seats in a bubble of blackness. The woman was bent over a tiny fold-away screen balanced on her knees. She nodded and craned her body over towards him. Her hand extended close to his left ear. A sequence of shining telescoping rods extended from her fingers. She closed her eyes. In the dimness, Gaynor Hafoen could see tiny lights flickering on the inside of her eyelids. Her hand touched his ear, tickling slightly. He felt his face twitch. Don't move, she said. He tried to stay still. The woman withdrew her hand. She opened her eyes and peered at the point where the tips of three of the delicate rods met. She nodded and said, Hmm. Gaynor Hafoen bent forward and looked too. He couldn't see anything. The woman closed her eyes again. Her lid screens glowed again. Very sophisticated, she said. Could have missed it. Gaynor Hafoen looked at his right palm. Sure there's nothing on this hand? he asked recalling Veli of Shung's firm handshake. As sure as I can be, the woman said, withdrawing a small transparent container from her robe and dropping whatever she had taken out of his ear into it. He still couldn't see anything there. And the suit? he asked, fingering one lapel of his jacket. Clean, the woman said. So that's it? he asked. That is all, she told him. The black bubble disappeared, and they were sitting in a small room whose walls were lined with shelves overflowing with impenetrably technical-looking gear. Well, thanks. That will be eight hundred tier centricate hour equivalents. Oh, call it around thousand. He walked along Street Six in the heart of Night City tier. There were night cities throughout the developed galaxy. It was a kind of condominium franchise, though nobody seemed to know to whom the franchise belonged. Night cities varied a lot from place to place. The only certain things about them was that it would always be night when you got there, and you'd have no excuse for not having fun. Night City Tier was situated on the middle level of the world, on a small island in a shallow sea. The island was entirely covered by a shallow dome ten kilometres across and two in height. Internally, the city tended to take its cue from each year's festival. The last time Gaynor Hafoen had been here, the place had taken on the appearance of a magnified oceanscape. All its buildings turned into waves between one and two hundred metres tall. The theme that year had been the sea. Street Six had existed in the long trough between two exponentially swept surges. Ripples on the towering curves of the wave's surfaces had been balconies, burning with lights. Luminous foam at each wave's looming, overhanging crest had cast a pallid, sepulchral light over the winding street beneath. At either end of the street, the Broadway had risen to meet crisscrossing wave fronts and connect, through oceanically inauthentic tunnels, with other highways. The theme this year was the primitive, 
that the city had chosen to interpret this as a gigantic early electronic circuit board. The network of silvery streets formed an almost perfectly flat cityscape, studded with enormous resistors, dense-looking centipedally-legged flat-topped chips, spindly diodes, and huge semi-transparent valves with complicated internal structures, each standing on groups of shining metal legs embedded in the network of the printed circuit. Those were the bits that Gaynor Hafoen sort of half-recognised from his History of Technical Stuff course, or whatever it had been called when he'd been a student. There were lots of other jagged, knobbly, smooth, brightly coloured, matte black, shiny, veined, crinkled bits he didn't know the purpose or the name of. Street 6 this year was a 15-metre-wide stream of quickly flowing mercury, covered with etched diamond sheeting. Every now and again, large, coherent blobs of sparkling blue gold went speeding along the mercury stream underfoot. Apparently, these were symbolised electrons or something. The original idea had been to incorporate the mercury channels into the city transport system, but this had proved impractical, and so they were there just for effect. The city tube system ran deep underground as usual. Gaynar Hafoen had jumped on and off a few of the underground cars on his way to the city, and on and off a couple more once he'd arrived, hoping to give the slip to anybody following. Having done this, and had the tracer in his ear removed, he was happy he'd done the best he could to ensure that his evening's fun would take place unobserved by SC, though he wasn't particularly bothered if they were still watching him. It was more the principle of the thing, no point getting obsessive about it. Street 6 itself was packed with people, walking, talking, staggering, strolling, rolling along within bubble spheres, riding on exotically accoutred animals, riding in small carriages drawn by Yisner Mistretel pairs, and floating along under small vacuum balloons or in force field harnesses. Above, in the eternal night sky beneath the city's vast dome, this part of the evening's entertainment was being provided by a city-wide hologram of an ancient bomber raid. The sky was filled with hundreds and hundreds of winged aircraft, with four or six piston engines each, many of them picked out by searchlights. Spasms of light, leaving black-on-black -black clouds and blossoming spheres of dimming red sparks, were supposed to be anti-aircraft fire, whilst in amongst the bombers, smaller single- and twin-engined aircraft whizzed. The two sorts of aircraft were shooting at each other, the large planes from turrets, and the smaller ones from their wings and noses. Gently curving lines of white, yellow and red tracer moved slowly across the sky, and every now and again an aircraft seemed to catch fire and start to fall out of the sky. Occasionally one would explode in mid-air. All the time the dark shapes of bombs could be glimpsed, falling to explode with bright flashes and vivid gouts of flame on parts of the city, seemingly always just a little way off. Gaynor Hafoen thought it all looked a little contrived, and he doubted there'd ever been such a concentrated air battle, or one in which the ground fire kept up while interceptor planes did their intercepting, but as a show it was undeniably impressive. Explosions, gunfire and sirens sounded above the chatter of people filling the street, and were sporadically submerged by the music spilling from the hundreds of bars and multifarious entertainment venues lining the street. The air was full of half-strange, half-familiar, entirely enticing smells, and wild pheromonic effects understandably banned everywhere else on tier. Gaynor Hafoen strolled down the middle of the street, a large glass of tier 9050 in one hand, a cloud cane in the other, and a small puff creant nestling on one shoulder of his immaculately presented own skin jacket. The 9050 was a cocktail which notoriously involved about 300 separate processes to make, many of them involving unlikely and even unpleasant combinations of plants, animals, and substances. The end result was an acceptable, if strong-tasting, drink composed largely of alcohol, no more. But you didn't really drink it for the internal effect. You drank it to show you could afford to. They put it in a special crystal field goblet so you could show that you could. The name was meant to imply that after sinking a few, you were 90% certain to get laid and 50% assured of ending up in legal trouble. Or it may have been the other way round. Again, her phone could never remember. The cloud cane was a walking stick burning compressed pellets of a mildly and brief-acting psychotropic mixture. Taking a suck on its pierced top cap was like sliding two distorting lenses in front of your eyes, sticking your head underwater and shoving a chemical factory up your nose while standing in a shifting gravity field. The puff creant was a small symbiont, half animal, half vegetable, which you paid to squat on your shoulder and cough up your nose every time you turned your face towards it. 
The cough contained spores that could do any one of about thirty different and interesting things to your perceptions and moods. Gaynor Hafoan was particularly pleased with his new suit. It was made of his own skin, genetically altered in various subtle ways, specially vat-grown and carefully tailored to his exact specifications. He donated a few skin cells to, and left the order and payment with, a gene tailor here on Tyr two and a half years earlier, when he was on his way to God's Hole Habitat. It had been a whim after a drinking session, as had an animated obscene tattoo he'd removed a month later. He hadn't really expected to pick the suit up for a while. Fortunately, long-term fashions hadn't changed too much in the interim. The suit and its accompanying cloak looked terrific. He felt great. Spadassins degladiate. Zifidae and Zemex contend. Goliard dunking. Slogans, signs, announcements, odors and personal greeters vied for attention, advertising emporia and venues. Stunning scapes and scenes played out in sensorium bubbles, bulging out into the centre of the street, putting you instantly into bedrooms, feast halls, arenae, harems, sea ships, fair rides, space battles, states of temporary ecstasy. Tempting, prompting, suggesting, offering, providing entrance, stimulating appetites, prompting desires, suggesting, propositioning, pandering. Riperography, colloidal anemnesis, ivresse. Gaynar Hafoan walked through it all, soaking it all in, refusing all the offers and suggestions, politely turning down the overtures and come-ons, the recommendations and invitations. Zuffalos, Orpharions, Rastre, Naumachia, Auli. For now, he was content just to be here, walking, promenading, watching and being watched, sizing up, and with any luck, being sized up. It was evening. Real evening, in this level of tear. The time when Night City started to become busy. Everywhere was open, nowhere was full, everybody wanted your custom, but nobody was really settling on a venue yet. Just cruising, grazing, petting. Gaynor Hofoen was happy to be part of that general drift. He loved this. He gloried in it. This was where he felt most himself. For now, there was simply no better place to be and he believed in entering into the experience with all due and respectful intensity. These were his sort of people. Here was where his sort of thing happened, and this was his sort of place. Pilius Omidons invite Russia, like ophthalmicity guaranteed when you see the gystacores and loricas of your marticarastic minikins. He saw her outside a sublime asekos, set under the rotundly swollen bulk of a building shaped like a giant resistor. The entrance to the cult's sacred place was a brightly shining loop, like a thick but tiny rainbow layered in different shades of white. Young sublimers stood outside the enclosure, clad in glowing white robes. The sublimers, each tall and thin, glowed too. Their skin glowed gently, pallid to the point of unhealthy-looking bloodlessness. Their eyes shone soft light spilling from the wide, open whites, while the same half-silvery light was projected from their teeth when they smiled. They smiled all the time, even when they were talking. The woman was standing looking at the pair of enthusiastically gesticulating sublimers with an expression of amused disdain. She was tall, tawny-skinned. Her face was broad, her nose thin and almost parallel with the planes of her cheeks. Her arms were crossed, her body tilted back from the two young people, her weight taken on one black-booted heel as she looked down that long nose at the shining sublimers. Her eyes and her hair looked as dark as the featureless shadow robe which hid the rest of her frame. He stopped in the middle of the street and watched her arguing with the two sublimers for a few moments. Her gestures and the way she held her body were different, but the face was very similar to the way he remembered her looking, forty years ago. Just a little older, perhaps. He had always wondered how much she'd changed. But it couldn't be her. Tishlin had said she was still on board the sleeper. They'd have mentioned if she'd left, wouldn't they? He let a group of squatly chortling Bistlians pass him, then sauntered a little way back at the street, studying the architecture of the giant valve bulging over it from the opposite pavement, and sniffing from his cloud cane in a vague, bored manner while watching a line of dark bombs flit out of the darkness above, to fall and detonate somewhere beyond the line of barrel-like resistors that formed the other side of the street. 
Bright yellow-orange explosions lit up the sky, and debris rose slowly and fell. Further up the avenue, some sort of commotion surrounded a large animal. He turned and looked back down the crowded street. At that moment, a giant blue-gold shape slid under his feet, rushing silently along within the mercury stream beneath the diamond plate. The girl, arguing with the sublimers, turned, glancing at the street as the blob went gliding past. As she looked back to the two young glowing people, she caught sight of him watching her. Her gaze settled on him for a moment, and the flicker of an expression, a glimmer of recognition, passed briefly over her face before she started talking to the sublimers again. He hadn't had time to look away, even if he'd wanted to. He was wondering whether he ought to go over to her now, wait and see if she stepped back into the thoroughfare, and maybe approach her then, or just walk away, when a tall girl in a glowing gown stepped up to him and said, May I help you, sir? You seem taken with our place of exaltation. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask? Is there anything I can do to enlighten you? He turned to the sublimer. She was almost as tall as he. Her face was pretty but somehow vacuous, though he knew that might have been prejudice on his part. Sublimers had turned what was a normal but generally optional part of a species' choice of fate into a religion. Sublimers believed that everybody ought to sublime, that every human, every animal, every machine and mind ought to head straight for ultimate transcendence, leaving the mundane life behind and setting as direct a course as possible for nirvana. People who joined the cult spent a year trying to persuade others of this before they sublimed themselves, joining one of the sect's group minds to contemplate irreality. The few drones, other AIs and minds that became persuaded of the merit of this course of action through the arguments of the sublimers tended to do what any other machine did on such occasions and disappear in the direction of the nearest sublimed entity, though one or two stuck around in a pre-sublimed state long enough to help the cause. In general, though, the cult was regarded as rather a pointless one. Subliming was seen as something that usually happened to entire societies and more as a practical lifestyle alteration than a religious commitment more like moving house than entering a sacred order. Well, I don't know, Gaynor Hofoen said, sounding wary. What exactly do you people believe in again? The sublimer looked up the street behind him. Oh, we believe in the power of the sublime, she said. Let me tell you more. She glanced at the avenue again. Oh, perhaps we ought to get off the street, don't you think? She held out her hand and took a step back towards the pavement. Gaynor Hafoen looked back to where things were getting noisy. The giant animal he'd noticed earlier, a sexapedal pondrosaur, was advancing slowly down the avenue in the midst of a retinue and a crowd of spectators. The shaggy brown-furred animal was six metres tall, splendidly liveried with long gaudy banners and ribbons, and commanded by a garishly uniformed mahout brandishing a fiery mace. The beast was surmounted by a glitteringly black and silver cupola, whose bulbously filigreed windows gave no hint of who or what might be inside. Similarly ornamented bowls covered the great animal's eyes. It was attended by five loping cleestrithrals, each black-tusked creature pawing at the street surface and snorting and held on a tight lead by a burly hire guard. A knot of people held the procession up, the pondrosaur paused, and put its long head back to let out a surprisingly soft, subdued roar. Then it adjusted its eye cups with its two leg-thick forelimbs and bobbed its head to either side. The gaggle of promenaders began to disperse, and the great beast and its escorts moved forward again. Hmm, yes, Gaynor phone said. Perhaps we'd better move out of the way. He finished the 9050 and looked round for a place to deposit the empty container. Please, allow me. The sublimer girl took the field goblet from him as though it was some sort of holy object. Gaynar Hafoen followed her onto the sidewalk. She put an arm through his, and they proceeded slowly towards the entrance to the Seikos, where the woman was still standing talking to the other two sublimers with her look of ironic curiosity. Have you heard of sublimers before? the girl in his arm asked. Oh, yes, he said, watching the other woman's face as they approached. They stopped on the pavement outside the sublimer building, entering a hush field in which the only sound was gently tinkling music and a background of waves on a beach. You believe everybody should just sort of disappear up their own asses, don't you? He asked, with every appearance of innocence. He was only a few metres from the woman in the shadow robe, though the compartmented hush field meant he couldn't hear what she was saying. Her face was much like he remembered it. 
the eyes and mouth were the same. She had never worn her hair up like that, but even its shade of black blue was the same. Oh, no, the sublime girl said, her expression terribly serious. What we believe in takes one completely away from such bodily concerns. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see up the street where the pondrosaur was shuffling forwards through a thick crowd of admirers. He smiled at the sublime girl as she talked on. He shifted a little so that he could see the other woman better. No, it wasn't her. Of course it wasn't. She'd have recognized him. She'd have reacted by now. Even if she'd been trying to pretend she hadn't seen him, he'd have been able to tell. She'd never been very good at hiding her feelings from anybody, least of all from him. She glanced at him again, then quickly away. He felt a sudden unbidden sensation of fearful pleasure, a jolt of excitement which left his skin tingling. Highest expression of our quintessential urge to be greater than we— he nodded and looked at the sublime girl, who was still babbling away. He frowned a little and stroked his chin with his free hand, still nodding. He kept watching the other woman. Out on the street, the pondrosaur and its retinue had come to a stop almost alongside them. A tear syntricate was hovering level with the giant animal's mahout, who seemed to be arguing angrily with it. The woman was smiling at the other two sublimers with what appeared to be an expression of tolerant ridicule. She kept her eyes on the sublimer fellow doing the talking at that point, but took a long, deep breath and, just as she let it out, glanced at Gaynor her phone again with the briefest of smiles and a flick of her eyebrows before looking back at the sublimers and tipping her head just a little to one side. He wondered, would S.C. really go this far to keep him under their control, or at least under their eye? How likely was it that he should find somebody who looked so much like her? He supposed there must be hundreds of people who bore a passing resemblance to Dajil Gillian. Perhaps there were even a few who had heard something about her, and deliberately assumed her appearance. That happened all the time with genuinely famous people, and just because he'd never heard of anybody taking on Dajil's looks didn't mean nobody had ever done so. If this person was one of them, it was just possible he would have to be on his guard. Personal ambition, or the desire to better oneself, or to provide opportunities for one's children, is but a pale reflection of, compared to the ultimate transcendence which true subliming offers, for, as it is written. Gaynor Hofoen leant closer to the girl talking to him, and tapped her lightly on the shoulder. I'm sure, he said quietly. Would you excuse me for just a moment? He took the two steps over to the woman in the shadow robe. She turned her head from the two sublimers and smiled politely at him. Excuse me, he asked. Don't I know you from somewhere? He grinned as he said it, acknowledging both the well-worn nature of the line and the fact that neither he nor she was really interested in what the sublimers had to say. She nodded her head politely to him. I don't think so, she said. Her voice was higher than Dajil's, more girlish and with a quite different accent. Though... If we had met, and you hadn't altered in some way and I'd forgotten, certainly I'd be far too ashamed to admit it. She smiled. He did the same. She frowned. Unless... Do you live on Tyr? Just passing through, he told her. A bomber in flames tore past just overhead and exploded in a burst of light behind the sublimer building. On the street, the argument around the pondrosaur seemed to be getting more heated, the animal itself was staring intently at the syntricate, and its mahout was standing up on its neck, pointing the flaming mace at the darkly spiny being to emphasize whatever points he was making. But I've been this way before, Gaynor Hathorne said. Perhaps we bumped into each other then. She nodded thoughtfully. Perhaps, she conceded. Oh, you two know each other, said the young sublimer man she'd been talking to. Well... Many people find that subliming in the company of a loved one, or just somebody they know, is... Do you play calisthenic crisis? she asked, cutting across the young sublimer. You may have seen me at a game here. She put her head back, looking down that long nose at him. If so, I'm disappointed you left it till now to say hello. Ah, the sublimer lad said. Games, an expression of the urge to enter in worlds beyond ourselves. Another... I've never even heard of the game, he confessed. Do you recommend it? Oh, yes, she said, and sounded ironic. It benefits all who play. Well, I'm always willing to entertain some new experience. Perhaps you could teach me.
Ah, oh, now, the ultimate new experience, began the sublime lad. Gaynor Hafoen turned to him and said, Oh, shut up! It had been an instinctive reaction, and for a moment he was worried he might have said the wrong thing. But she didn't seem to be regarding the young sublimer's hurt look with any great degree of sympathy. She looked back to him. All right, she said. You stand me my stake, and I'll teach you crassis. He smiled, wondering if that had been too easy. It's a deal, he said. He waved the cloud cane under his nose and took a deep breath and bowed. My name's Bayer. Pleased to meet you. She nodded again. Call me Flynn, she said, and taking hold of the cane, waved it under her own nose. Shall we, Flynn? he said, and indicated the street beyond, where the pondosaur had sunk to its belly, its four legs doubled up underneath it, and both forelimbs folded beneath its chin as though bored. Two syndicates were shouting at the enraged Mahout, who was shaking the flaming mace at them. The higher guards were looking nervous and patting the restless Cleestrithralls. Certainly. Remember where you met? The Sublimer called after them. Subliming is the ultimate meeting of souls, the pinnacle of— They left the hush field. His voice was drowned out by the thudding of projected anti-aircraft fire as they walked along the pavement. So, where are we going? He asked her. Well, you can take me for a drink, and then we'll hit a crisis bar, I know. Sound all right? Sounds fine. Shall we take a trap? He said pointing a little way up the street to a two-wheeled open vehicle waiting by the curb. A Yuzna mistratal pair were harnessed between the traces, the Yuzna craning its long neck down to peck at a feed bag in the gutter, the small, smartly uniformed mistratal on its back, looking around alertly and tapping its thumbs together. Good idea, she said. They walked up to the trap and climbed aboard. The collyrium lounge, the woman said to the mistratal, as they sat in the rear of the small vehicle. It saluted and pulled a whip out from its fancy jerkin. The yizna made a sighing noise. The trap shook suddenly. A great, deep burst of noise came from the street behind them. They all looked round. The pondrosaur was rearing up, bellowing. Its mahout nearly fell off its neck. His mace tumbled from his grasp and bounced on the street. Two of the cleestrithralls jumped up and leapt into the crowd, snarling and dragging their handlers with them. The two syndicates who'd been arguing with the Mahout rose quickly into the air out of the way. People in float harnesses took avoiding action through the confusion of searchlight beams and anti-aircraft fire. Flynn and Gena Hofoen watched people scatter in all directions as the Pondrosaur leapt forward with surprising agility and started charging down the street towards them. The Mahout clung desperately to the beast's ears, screeching at it to stop. The stabilised black and silver cupola on the animal's back seemed to float along above it until the animal's increasing speed forced it to oscillate from side to side. At Gaynor Hofoen's side, Flynn seemed frozen. Gaynor Hofoen glanced round at the mistretal. Well, he said, let's get going. The little mistretal blinked quickly, still staring at the street. Another bellow echoed off the surrounding buildings. Gaynor Hofoen looked back again. The charging pondrosaur reached up with one forelimb and ripped its eye cups off to reveal huge, faceted blue eyes like chunks of ancient ice. With its other limb, it gripped the mahout by one shoulder and wrenched him off its neck. He wriggled and flailed, but it brushed him to one side and onto the pavement. He landed running, fell and rolled. The pondrosaur itself thundered on down the street. People threw themselves out of its way. Somebody in a bubble sphere didn't move fast enough. The giant transparent ball was kicked to the side, smashing into a hot food stall. Flames leapt from the wreckage. Shit, Gaynor Hafoen said, as the giant bore down upon them. He turned to the mistratal driver again. He could see the face of the Yuzna turn back to look up the street behind too, its big face expressing only mild surprise. Move, he shouted. The mistratal nodded. Oh, ah, yeah, it chirped. It reached behind to slip a knot on the rear of the Yuzna and jabbed its boot heels into the animal's lower neck. The startled Yuzna took off, leaving the trap behind. The vehicle tipped forward as the Yuzna mistratal pair disappeared down the rapidly clearing street. Gaina, Hafoen, and Flynn were thrown forward in a tangle of harnesses. He heard her shout, Fuck! and then go, Oof! as they hit the street. Something hit him hard on the head. He blacked out for a moment, then came to, looking up at a huge face.
a monstrous face gazing down at him with huge prismed blue eyes. Then he saw the woman's face, the face of Dajil Gillian. She had blood on her top lip. She looked groggily at him and then turned to gaze up at the huge animal face looking down at them. There was a sort of buzzing sensation from somewhere. Gaynor Hofoen felt his legs go numb. The woman collapsed over his legs. He felt sick. Lines of red dots crossing the sky floated behind his eyelids when they closed. When he forced his eyes open again, she was there again. Somebody looking like Dajil Gillian, who wasn't her. Except it wasn't Flynn either. She was dressed differently. She was taller, and her expression was not the same. And anyway, Flynn was still draped unconscious over his legs. He really didn't understand what was going on. He shook his head. This hurt. The girl, who wasn't Dajil or Flynn, stopped quickly, looked into his eyes, whirled the cloak off her shoulders and onto the street beside him in one movement, then rolled him over onto it, heaving Flynn's immobile body out of the way as she did so. He tried waving his arms around, but it didn't do much good. The cloak went rigid underneath him and floated into the air, wrapping round him. He cried out and tried to fight against its enclosing black folds, but the buzzing came again, and his vision faded, even before the cloak finished wrapping itself round him. Part 8 Killing Time Chapter 1 The usual way to explain it was by analogy. This was how the idea was introduced to you as a child. Imagine you were travelling through space and you came to this planet which was very big and almost perfectly smooth, and on which there lived creatures who were composed of one layer of atoms, in effect two-dimensional. These creatures would be born, live and die like us, and they might well possess genuine intelligence. They would, initially, have no idea or grasp of the third dimension, but they would be able to live perfectly well in their two dimensions. To them, a line would be like a wall across their world, or... From the end, it would look like a point. An unbroken circle would be like a locked room. Perhaps, if they were able to build machines which allowed them to journey at great speed along the surface of their planet, which to them would be their universe, they would go right round the planet and come back to where they had started from. More likely, they would be able to work this out from theory. Either way, they would realise that their universe was both closed and curved, and that there was, in fact, a third dimension even if they had no practical access to it. Being familiar with the idea of circles, they would probably christen the shape of their universe a hypercircle, rather than inventing a new word. The three-dimensional people would, of course, call it a sphere. The situation was similar for people living in three dimensions. At some point in any civilization starting to become advanced, it was realized that if you set off into space in what appeared to be a perfectly straight line, Eventually, you would arrive back at where you started, because your three-dimensional universe was really a four-dimensional shape. Being familiar with the idea of spheres, people tended to christen this shape a hypersphere. Usually around the same point in a society's development, it was understood that, unlike the planet where the two-dimensional creatures lived, space was not simply curved into a hypersphere, it was also expanding, gradually increasing in size like a soap bubble on the end of a straw which somebody was blowing into. To a four-dimensional being looking from far enough away, the three-dimensional galaxies would look like tiny designs imprinted onto the surface of that expanding bubble, each of them, generally, heading away from all the others because of the hypersphere's general expansion. But, like the shifting whirls and loops of colour visible on the skin of a soap bubble, able to slide and move around on that surface. Of course, the four-dimensional hypersphere had no equivalent of the straw blowing air in from outside. The hypersphere was expanding all by itself, like a four-dimensional explosion, with the implication that, once, it had been simply a point, a tiny seed which had indeed exploded. That detonation had created, or at least had produced, matter and energy, time and the physical laws themselves. Later, cooling, coalescing and changing over immense amounts of time and expansion, it had given rise to the cool, ordered, three-dimensional universe which people could see around them. 
Eventually, in the progress of a technologically advanced society, occasionally, after some sort of limited access to hyperspace, more usually after theoretical work, it was realized that the soap bubble was not alone. The expanding universe lay inside a larger one, which in turn was entirely enclosed by a bubble of space-time with a still greater diameter. The same applied within the universe you happened to find yourself on, in. There were smaller, younger universes inside it, nested within like layers of paper round a much-wrapped spherical present. In the very centre of all the concentric, inflating universes lay the place they had each originated from, where, every now and again, a cosmic fireball blinked into existence, detonating once more to produce another universe, its successive outpourings of creation like the explosions of some vast combustion engine, and the universes its pulsing exhaust. There was more. Complications in seven dimensions and beyond that involved a giant torus on which the 3D universe could be described as a circle, contained and containing other nested tori, with further implications of whole populations of such meta-realities. But the implications of multiple, concentric, sequential universes was generally considered enough to be going on with for the moment. What everybody wanted to know was whether there was any way of travelling from one universe to another. Between any pair of universes, there was more than just empty hyperspace. There was a thing called an energy grid. It was useful. Strands of it could help power ships, and it had been used as a weapon. But it was also an obstacle, and, by all accounts so far, one which had proved impenetrable to intelligent investigation. Certain black holes appeared to be linked to the grid, and perhaps, therefore, to the universe beyond— but nobody had ever made it intact into one, or ever reappeared in any recognisable form. There were white holes, too, ferociously violent sources spraying torrents of energy into the universe with the power of a million suns, and which also seemed to be linked to the grid. But no body, no ship, or even information had ever been observed appearing from their tumultuous mouths. No equivalent of an airborne bacteria, no word, no language— just that incoherent scream of cascading energies and super-energetic particles. The dream that every involved had, which virtually every technologically advanced civilization clove to with almost religious faith, was that one day it would be possible to travel from one universe to another, to step up or down through those expanding bubbles, so that, apart from anything else, one need never suffer the final fate of one's own universe. To achieve that would surely be to sublime, truly to transcend, to consummate the ultimate surpassing and accomplish the ultimate empowerment. The river-class general contact unit, fate amenable to change, lay in space. It was locally stationary, taking its reference from the accession. The accession was equally static, taking its reference from the star Esperi. The entity sat there, a few light minutes away, a featureless dot on the skein of real space, with a single, equally dull-looking strand of twisted, compressed space-time fabric leading down to the lower layer of energy grid, and a second leading upwards to the higher layer. The accession was doing exactly what it had been doing for the past two weeks. Nothing. The fate amenable to change had carried out all the standard initial measurements and observations of the entity, but had been very forcefully advised indeed not to do any more. No direct contact was to be attempted, not even by probes, smaller craft, or drones. In theory, it could disobey. It was its own ship. It could make up its own mind. But in practice, it had to heed the advice of those who knew, if not more than it, better than it. Collective Responsibility, also known as Sharing the Blame so, all it had done, after the first exciting bit, when it had been the centre of attention, and everybody had wanted to know all it could tell them about the thing it had found, had been to hang around here, still at the focus of events, in a sense, but also feeling somehow ignored. Reports. It filed reports. It had long since stopped trying to make them different or original. The ship was bored. It was also aware of a continuing undercurrent of fear, a real emotion that it was by turns annoyed at, ashamed of, and indifferent to, according to its mood. It waited. It watched. Beyond it, around it, most of its small fleet of modules and satellites. A few of its most space-capable drones 
and a variety of specialist devices it had constructed specifically for the purpose also floated, watching and waiting. Inside the vessel, its human crew discussed the situation, monitored the data coming in from the ship's own sensors and those coming in from the small cloud of dispersed machines. The ship passed some of the time by making up elaborate games for the humans to play. Meanwhile, it kept up its observation of the accession and scanned the space around, waiting for the first of the other ships to arrive. Sixteen days after the culture craft had stumbled upon the accession, and six days after the discovery had been made public, the first ship appeared, its presence noted initially within the fate amenable to change's main sensor array. The GCU moved one state of readiness higher, signalled what was happening to the ethics gradient and the not invented here, fastened its track scanner on the incoming signal, began a tentative reconfiguration of its remote sensor platforms, and started to move towards the newcomer round the perimeter of the accession safe limit at a speed it hoped was pitched nicely between polite deliberation and alarm-raising urgency. It sent a standard interrogatory signal burst to the approaching craft. The vessel was the Sober Council, an explorer ship of the Zetetic Alentius Stargazer Clan's Fifth Fleet. The fate amenable to change felt relief. The Alench were friends. Identifications completed, the two ships rendezvoused, locally stationary, just a few tens of kilometres apart, on the outskirts of the safe limit from the accession the culture vessel had set. Welcome. Thank you. Dear holy stasis. Is that thing attached to the grid, or is it my sensors? If it's your sensors, it's mine too. Impressive, isn't it? Becomes greatly less so once you sat looking at it for a week or two, take my word for it. I hope you're here just to observe, that's all I'm doing. Waiting on the big guns? That's right. When do they arrive? That's restricted. Promise this won't go outside the lunch? Promise? A medium SV gets here in twelve days, the first general SV in fourteen, then one every few days for a week, then one a day, then several a day, by which time I expect a few other involves will probably have started to show. Don't ask me what the GSVs will consider a quorum before they act. How about you? Can we talk off the record, just the two of us? All right. We have another ship heading here, two days away still. The rest of the fleet are still undecided, though they have stopped drawing further away. We lost a ship somewhere around here. The peace makes plenty. Ah, did you indeed? How about when? Sometime between 28.789 and 8.05. This is still confidential within the Alench, then? Yes. We searched this volume as best we could for two weeks, but found nothing. What brought you here? Suggestion by my home GSV, the Ethics Gradient. That was in 8.41, Wanted me to look in the upper leaf swirl, cloud top. No reason given. Bumped into this on the way there. That's all I know. And the fate amenable to change thought coldly about that suggestion. The cloud top volume was a long way from here, but that meant nothing. What mattered was that it had been given a relatively precise location within the cloud top to head for, and been given the subtlest of hints to watch out for anything interesting while en route. Given where it had been when it had received the suggestion from its home GSV, its route had inevitably taken it near the accession. Thirty-six days had elapsed between the date the Alench knew they might have lost a ship and the time when it had been dispatched and what was starting to look a little like a setup. It wondered what had taken place in between. Could some Alench ship have leaked word to the culture? But then how had such a leak apparently produced such accuracy, given that it, a single ship, had practically run straight into the damn accession, while the Lench had spent two weeks here with seven-eighths of a full fleet and spotted nothing? Feel free to ask the ethics gradient what prompted its suggestion, it added. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to try contacting the accession. This might be where our comrade disappeared. At the least, it might have some information. At most, and for all we know... Our ship is still in there. I want to talk to it. Maybe send a drone ship in if it doesn't reply. Madness. This thing is welded into the grids, both directions. Know anything that can do that? Me neither. I'm not even going to start feeling safe until there's a fleet of GSVs around here. Heck, I was pleased to see you there. Company at last, I thought. Somebody to pass the time with while I sit out my lonely vigil. Now you want to start poking this thing with a stick. Are you crazy? No. 
But we might have a ship in distress in there. I can't just sit here doing nothing. Have you attempted to contact the entity? No, I sent back a pro forma to its initial hello, but... Uh, wait a moment. Look at the signal it sent. Signal enclosed. There. You see? I told you. That was probably an alench sourced handshake burst. Meat shit. Yes, I see. Well, maybe your pal did find the damn thing first, but if it did, it probably did exactly what you're proposing to do, and it's gone. Disappeared. You seeing where this is leading? I intend to be careful. Uh huh. Was your comrade vessel notoriously careless? Indeed not. Well then, I appreciate your concern. Was there any sign of contention in the volume when you got here? Emergency or distress signals? Voyage event record ejectiles? There was this, here. Material analysis location enclosed. But if you want to mention any of this stuff on record, you'd better make it look like you just stumbled across the debris, all right? Thank you. Yes, of course. Looks like one of our little drones was caught up in something. Hmm. Sort of smell subsidiary somehow, don't you think? Possibly. I know what you mean. It's untidy. Back on record? Okay. I hereby give notice. I intend to attempt to contact the entity. I beg you not to. Let me make a request that you be allowed to take part in the culture investigation when it takes place. I'm sure there is every chance you'll be welcome to share in the relevant data. I'm sorry. I have my own reasons for considering the matter urgent. Off record again? All right. My records show you to be, to all intents and purposes, identical to the piece makes plenty. Yes. Go on. Don't you see? Look, if this thing jeopardized your comrade with no more fuss than an escaped little drone, what's it going to be able to do now that it's had a chance to pick up the structure and mindset of your sister craft for at least sixty-six days? I have the benefit of being forewarned, and the entity may not have been able entirely to take over the Peacemakes Plenty yet. The ship might be inside there, under siege. Perhaps all the entity's intellectual energies are being absorbed in the maintenance of that blockade. That being the case, my intervention may lift the siege and free my comrade. Cousin, this is self-delusion. We have already dealt with the issue of the minimal extra safeguarding provided by you having been alerted to the entity's potential danger. The peace makes plenty could hardly have been less prepared. I appreciate your feelings towards your fellow craft and fleetmate, but it rends the bounds of possibility to believe that something capable of perpetuating e-grid links in both directions is going to be substantially troubled by craft with the capabilities of ourselves. The accession has not troubled me, but then I did not trouble it. We have exchanged greetings, no more. What you propose might be construed as interference or even as a hostile act. I have accepted a duty to observe and won't be able to help you if you get into trouble. Please, please reconsider. I take your point. I still intend to attempt communication with the entity, but I shall not recommend that a drone approach be made. I have to put all this to my humans, of course, but they usually concur. Naturally. I urge you to argue strongly against sending any object towards the accession, should your human crew suggest this. I'll see which way they germ. This could take a while. They'll like arguing. Don't be in any rush on my account. Chapter 2 The Torturer class, rapid offensive unit Killing Time, swung out of the darkness between the stars and braked hard, scrubbing velocity off in a wild, extravagant flare of energies, which briefly left a livid line of disturbance across the surface of the energy grid. It came to a local relative stop a light month out from the cold, dark, slowly tumbling body that was the ship store, Pittance, somewhere beyond the outside edge of the tiny world's spherical cloud of defense attack mechanisms. It flashed a permission-to-approach signal at the rock. The reply took longer than it would have expected. Tight beam, M16, Trapoint, at N4.28.882.1398. From Pittance Store to R.O.U. Killing Time. Permission withheld. What is your business here? Tight beam M16, tra point at N4.28.882.1399. From R.O.U. 
killing time to pittance store. Just stop him by to make sure you're all right. What's the problem? PTA burst. Permission withheld. Who sent you? What makes you think I had to be sent? PTA burst. Permission withheld. I am a restricted entity. I have no duty or obligation to permit any other craft to approach my vicinity. Traditionally, stores are only approached on a need-to basis. What is your need? There is some activity in the volume which includes your current location. People are concerned. An able checkup seemed timely. PTA burst. Permission withheld. Such concern would be better expressed by leaving me alone. Your visit might even attract attention, all of which I find intrinsically unwelcome. Please leave immediately and kindly create less of a display on departure than you made on your arrival. I consider it my duty to assess your current state of integrity. I regret to say I have not been reassured by your recalcitrant attitude. You will do me the minimally polite honour of allowing me to interface with your independent external event monitoring systems. PTA burst. Permission withheld. No, I shall not. I am perfectly able to take care of myself, and there is nothing of interest contained within my associated independent security systems. Any attempt to access them without my permission would be treated as an act of aggression. This is your last chance to quit my jurisdiction before I emit a protest registering signal concerning your unreasonable and boorish behaviour. I have already composed my own report detailing your bizarre and uncooperative attitude and copying this signal exchange. I shall release the compact immediately if a satisfactory reply is not received to this message. PTA burst. Acknowledge signal. Acknowledge signal. I repeat. I have already composed my own report detailing your bizarre and uncooperative attitude. I shall release the compact immediately if a satisfactory reply is not received to this message. I shall not warn you again. PTA burst. Permission granted. Purely in the interests of a quiet life, only on condition that my associate security monitoring systems remain untouched and under protest. Thank you. Of course. Underway. Leaving two at two kilometres from your rotational envelope in thirty minutes. Thanks to your delaying tactics, Commander, it probably already suspects something and may well have signalled back to whoever sent it already. Think yourself lucky we have as much as half an hour to prepare. It is being cautious. They had resealed the airlocks from the accommodation section and pumped in some real atmosphere. Commander Rising Moon, part season four of the Farsight Tribe, had been able to shed his spacesuit some days earlier. The gravity was still far too mild, but it was better than floating. The commander clicked his beak at the image on the screen presented by the mobile command center that set up in what had been the humans' pool growing unit. A lieutenant at the commander's side spoke quietly but urgently to the twenty other affronters distributed throughout the base's caverns, letting them know what was going on. The commander looked back impatiently, waiting for the servant who'd been sent to fetch his suit the instant the culture warship had appeared on the other craft's sensors. On secondary screens, he could see suited affronter technicians, their machines and some slaved drones, working on the exteriors of the stored ships. They had about half of them ready to get out and go. A decent fleet, but they needed the rest, and preferably all at once, and as a complete surprise to the culture and everybody else. Can't you destroy it? the commander asked the traitor culture vessel. He glanced at the status of the nearest affront vessels, far too far away. They had avoided approaching pittance in case they could be monitored by the other culture craft. The attitude adjuster didn't like vocalizing. It preferred to print out its side of a conversation. If it gets to within a few minutes, yes, perhaps. It might have been relatively easy if I could have caught it completely unawares. However, I doubt that was ever very likely, given that it must have been suspicious to come here in the first place, and is almost certainly completely out of the question now. What about the ships we've cleared? Commander, they haven't been woken up yet. Until I've done that, they're useless. And if we wake half of them now, they'll have too long to think, too much time to do their own checking around before we need them for the main action. Our project must all happen in a rush, in a state of perceived chaos, panic and urgency, or it cannot happen effectively at all. There was a pause while the message scrolled along and off the screen, then... Commander, I suspect this will be a formality, but I have to ask... Do you wish to admit to what has happened here?
and turn your command over without a fight to the ROU killing time. This will probably be our last opportunity to avoid hostilities. Don't be ridiculous, the commander said sourly. I thought not. Very well, I shall vector away in the skein shadow of the rock and try to loop round behind the ROU. Let it enter the defence system. Wait until it's a week inside, no more, and then set everything you have upon it. I urge you again, Commander. Turn over the tactical command apparatus to me. No, the Commander said. Leave and do whatever you think will best jeopardise the culture vessel. I shall allow it to arrive at a point three weeks in and then attack. I am on my way. Do not let the ship come within a light week of the store itself, Commander. I know how it will think if it is attacked. This is not some genteel orbital mind or a nicely timorous general contact unit. This is a culture warship showing every sign of being fully armed and ready to press matters. What? Creeping in as it is? The commander sneered. Commander, you would be amazed and appalled at how few bright sides there are concerning the appearance and behaviour of a warship like this. The fact it's not charging in through the defence screen and metaphorically skidding to a stop is almost certainly a bad sign. It probably means it's one of the wily ones. I repeat, do not wait until it's most of the way into the defence system before opening fire. Assaulted so far inside the defensive field, it may well figure that it has no chance of escape, and so might as well continue towards you at attack. And at that sort of range, it would stand a decent chance of being able to obliterate the entire store and all the ships within it. The commander felt almost annoyed that the ship hadn't appealed to his own personal sense of self-preservation. Very well, he snapped. Halfway in, two weeks. Commander, no. That is still too close. If we cannot destroy the ship in the first instant of the engagement, it must be presented with a reasonable opportunity to escape. Otherwise, it may go for glory rather than attempt to extricate itself. But if it escapes, it can alert the culture. If our attack is not immediately successful, it will signal elsewhere anyway, assuming it has not already done so. We shall not be able to stop it. In that case, we shall have been discovered, though, with any luck, that will only put our plans out by a few days. Believe me, the craft's physical escape will not bring the culture here any quicker than a signal would. You will be putting this entire mission in jeopardy if you allow the vessel to come within more than three light weeks of the store. All right, the commander spat. He flicked a tentacle over the glowing board of the command desk. The communication link was cut. The attitude adjuster did not attempt to re-establish it. Your suit, sir, said a voice from behind. The commander whirled round to find the gelding midshipman, uniformed but not suited, with his spacesuit in his limbs. Oh, at last, the commander screamed. He flicked a tentacle at the creature's eye stalks. The blow bounced them back off its casing. The gelding whimpered and fell back, gas sack deflating. The commander grabbed his suit and pulled himself inside it. The midshipman staggered along the floor, half-blinded. The commander ordered his lieutenant to reconfigure the command desk. From here, they could personally control all the systems that had been entrusted by the culture to the mind which the traitor ship had killed. The command desk was like an ultimate instrument of destruction, a giant keyboard to play death tunes on. Some of the keys, admittedly, had to be left to trigger themselves once set, but these controls really did control. The hollow screen projected a sphere out towards the commander, the globe displayed the volume of real space around pittance, with tiny green, white and gold flecks representing major components of the defence system. A dull blue dot represented the approaching warship, coasting in towards them. Another dot, bright red, on the directly opposite side of the ship's store from the blue dot, and much closer, though drawing quickly away, was the traitor ship, attitude adjuster. Another screen alongside showed an abstracted hyperspatial view of the same situation, indicating the two ships on different surfaces of the skein. A third screen showed a transparent abstract of pittance itself, detailing its ship-filled caverns and surface and internal defence systems. The commander finished getting into his spacesuit and powering it up. He settled back into position. He reviewed the situation. He knew better than to try to conduct matters at a tactical level, but he appreciated the strategic influence he could wield here. He was dreadfully tempted, all the same, to take personal control and fire all the defence systems himself, but he was aware of the enormous responsibility he had been given in this mission, and was equally conscious that he had been carefully selected for this task. He had been chosen because he knew when not to... 
What had the traitor ship called it? Go for glory? He knew when not to go for glory. He knew when to back off, when to take advice, when to retreat and regroup. He flicked open the communicator channel to the traitor ship. Did the warship stop exactly a light month out? he asked. Yes. That's thirty-two standard culture days. Correct. Thank you. He closed the channel. He looked at the lieutenant at his side. Set everything within range to open fire on the warship the instant it crosses the 8.1 days limit. He sat back as the lieutenant's limbs flickered over the hollow displays, putting his command into effect, only just in time, the commander noted. He'd been longer getting into his suit than he'd thought. Forty seconds, sir, the lieutenant said. Give it just enough time to relax, the commander said, more to himself than to anybody else, if that is how these things work. Exactly eight and a tenth light days in from the position the rapid offensive unit, Killing Time, had held while negotiating its permission to approach, space all around the blue dot on the screen scintillated abruptly, as a thousand hidden devices of a dozen different types suddenly erupted into life in a precisely ordered sequence of destruction. In the real space holosphere, it looked like a miniaturized stellar cluster suddenly bursting into existence all around the blue dot. The trace disappeared instantly inside a brilliant sphere of light. In the hyperspace holosphere, the dot lasted a little longer. Slowed down, it could be seen firing some munitions back for a microsecond or so. Then it too disappeared in the wash of energies bursting out of the real space skein and into hyperspace in twin bulging plumes. The lights in the accommodation space flickered and dimmed as monumental amounts of power suddenly diverted to the rock's own long-range weaponry. The commander left the comm channel to the traitor ship open. Its own course had altered the instant the defense weaponry had been unleashed. Now its course was hooked, changing color from red to blue, and curving up and round and vectoring in hyperspace too, looping round to the point where the slowly fading and dissipating radiation shells marked the focus of the system's annihilatory power. A flat screen to the commander's left wavered, as if some still greater power surge had sucked energy even from its protected circuits. A message flashed up on it. Missed, you fuckers, the legend read. What? the commander said. The display flashed once and came clear again. Commander, the attitude adjuster here again. As you may have gathered, we have failed. What? But keep all defense and sensory systems at maximum readiness. Ramp the sensor arrays up to significant degradation point in a week. We shall not need them beyond then. But what happened? We got it. I shall move to plug the gap the attack left in our defenses. Ready all the cleared ships for immediate awakening. I may have to rouse them within a day or two. Complete the tests on the displacers. Use a real ship if you have to. And run a total level zero systems check of your own equipment. If the ship was able to insert a message into your command desk, it may have been able to carry out more pertinent mischief therein. The commander slammed a limb end down on the desk. What is going on? he roared. We got the bastard, didn't we? No, commander. We got some sort of shuttle or module, somewhat faster and better equipped than the average example such a ship would normally carry, but possibly constructed en route with such a ruse in mind. Now we know why its approach appeared so politely leisurely. The commander peered into the hollow spheres, juggling with magnifications and field depths. Then where the hell is it?